Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Is the audio coming through? Yeah. It is not. Okay. Oh, I just hit the button on here. Okay, that's fine. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Thank you, man. Testing, testing. Check, check. Check, check, check.
Test one, two. Test one, two. Test, test one, two, test one, two. Test one, two, test one, two, test one, two. Test one, two, test one, two, test one, two, test one, two. Thank you. 
Can I ask you all to take your seats? Uh, since I think we have some people waiting on a live stream for us. Uh, morning, you don't have to stop talking and just take your seats. It's totally fine. Uh, we'll start in like a minute or two. Thank <laughs> you. 
Uh, I'm Colleen Parsons. If you don't know me, I teach in the English department here and I direct the um, Global Irish Studies Initiative. And it is my, I think I would say, to welcome you this morning. It is just, you are a sight for sore eyes uh, or else I need new glasses. You, it is so nice to see you all. It's such a pleasure to have you here. Um, both those of you who are in the room and those of you who are joining us by uh, live stream this morning. Um, uh, so I, I especially want to welcome our Georgetown students, our staff, faculty, and alumni. It is, uh, it is nice to see you here. We have a very exciting, and um, I, think I, I think it's reasonable to say we have a very full day ahead of us, um, a very full day of talks and conversations. And I hope you can stay with us for the whole day. If you're in the room with us, there is tea and coffee and pastries and lunch and whatnot, and a promise of a hint of a glass of wine at the end of the day. If you've stamped your card for the whole day, we'll give you a glass of wine. Um, uh, for those of you who are in the room with us, if you don't have programs, you'll find georgetown.edu and that will give you a full um, schedule and the bios of speakers as well um, and uh, please if you're in this room um, and I'm struggling with it myself because I'm wearing my glasses today please to wear a mask for the whole day masks are mandatory uh, on campus in Georgetown in rooms this is a very densely packed highly residential campus um, so please help us uh, keep our students and everybody uh, safe a symposium like today's obviously doesn't come together without a whole lot of help. Uh, and I want to say a few quick words of thanks first to our speakers and chairs. Re you are giving generously of your time and your intellect. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to hearing everything you have to, uh, to say today. Uh, our meeting is substantially made possible by a grant from the Emigrant Support Program of the Government of Ireland through the Department of Foreign Affairs. And with the support of of Ireland. I'm delighted that we have Ambassador Geraldine Byrne Nason with us this morning. Thank you very much and welcome. Um, and, uh, and I really want to say thanks to the staff at the also former Ambassador Mull Hall, to uh, Nick Quaif, who's here, but all of the staff to Lork Lorcan Ryan and Geraldine Pierce Irwin in particular, and to Cahill McMorrow. Um, we couldn't do this without the support that we get from just down the road uh, at the embassy. Uh, we're also supported by the Department of English. Uh, thank you, uh, not here, but Karen Lautman and Patty Guzman, who have saved us many times uh, in the course of planning uh, by Georgetown College, the Office of the Provost. And also, um, we want to thank the DuPont Circle Hotel for being very generously helping us put everybody up, all our speakers up. Uh, I'm also grateful to Miranda Driscoll and to Solis Nua. Uh, is Miranda here? Yep, yeah, there you are. Miranda, um, thanks for being our arts partner, our supporter, and for bringing Liz Roach and the Liz Roach Dance Company to DC and allowing us all to go there last night. It was uh, really fantastic. It's good to work with you. Um, and, uh, and thanks also to those who've so effortlessly and efficiently put everything together, the catering staff, the people doing the live. amazing you I don't know how you are still on your feet um we just have about eight hours to go right um but I really appreciate your help so one day one city one book 16th of June 1904 Dublin Ulysses well maybe not one day it does bleed into the 17th of June. And the last line of the book reads 1914 to 1921, uh, as if to say that the time of writing is also important for the sort of setting of the book. And is 1921 really accurate since he was working on it right up until the very end of 1922, up until the end of January 1922, uh, just before it was published? And Bloom and Stevens and Molly's thoughts wander in rapid succession through past and present and future. We're going to hear today about um, Ulysses in 16th century China. Um, so let's just say maybe not one day. All right. One city. Well, the last words are Trieste, Paris. 
um, which is of course, which are of course the places where he had, where he wrote the book, names of the city where it was composed over the course of those seven and a bit years. And while the feet of the characters never leave the pavements and pubs or indeed sometimes the beds of Dublin, we spend a good deal of time dreaming of Palestine, of Gibraltar, of Hungary, New York City, South Africa, County Clare also is in there, uh, the Ascot race course, and countless other places. And I was writing, thinking about, writing about that yesterday. I was thinking, I'm sure somebody has counted them. So my apologies if, uh, if I haven't actually read that. Surely we can hold fast to the idea that it's not right? We are all here because of one book. That tome printed in Dijon, handed over to Joyce on his 40th birthday, uh, on the railway um, platform, brought into life by a series of brilliant women in Paris who made this publication po possible and wrapped in that handsome Greek blue cover. That we can agree on. Except, of course, that it had begun to be serialized many years earlier right? uh, in the Egoist and the Little Review and had begun its conceptual life as, in fact, part of Dubliners as early as 1906. It would go undergo a series of emendations, corrections, or abominations, depending on your particular creed, over the next decades. Not only that, but Ulysses would enjoy an afterlife of republications and translations, variously dubious and unauthorized at times, of adoration and criticism, of trials and smuggling, of adaptations and homages from China to Chile, of bloomsdays upon bloomsdays upon bloomsdays upon bloomsdays. Podcasts, dramatizations, dance performances like last night's, but also mugs and tea towels. They're all Ulysses now. The novel resonates and reverberates, both a central object to be emulated and a point of origin that has long left behind. So let's say many times, many places, many cities, many books. We're here today to talk about, in a way, that proliferation of the life of the novel, to hear from the range of artists and scholars about how and where Ulysses has traveled in its first century since February 1922, and how it's been used and abused and read and talked about and reread and studied about how it has made its own world and by doing so has made our world too. And how it made its way in the world in its first century. And I say, I say first century as if somehow like I'm taking for granted that there will be another whole century of Ulysses. And I suppose we're already you know, a few months in to the second century of Ulysses. So there is another century coming. And by virtue of gathering here to mark its centenary, we're in some way re-consecrating the novel as people have been doing all over uh, Ireland and the world in the last year. As some kind of, so re-consecrating as some kind of historical, uh, trans-historical wunderkind. Right? The insistence that Ulysses somehow continues to speak to our present. And its trans-historical life is pretty hard to ignore. We'll hear a whole lot about it today, where it has traveled, where it has moved, how it continues in our world. What are the conditions under which Ulysses is read and consumed and mobilized and used now? And how do we speak of its continuing relevance in its new century without thereby making a false claim to universalism? For in a world in which we are, I think, more profoundly aware than ever of the epistemic violence of canonization and distinction of the shifting power uh, uh, away from Euro-America, we can no longer take for granted the idea that Joyce can or should be a guiding spirit for an disposition. So how then do we speak of Ulysses? How then do we speak of its continued life under these conditions, insisting on its brilliance? I will continue to insist on its brilliance. I imagine everybody who's here will continue to insist on its brilliance, its sui generis qualities, but also searching for a different shade of canonization that doesn't center the Irish or the European experience at the turn of the last century as a guide to our collective like, planetary future. Another way of putting this, I was thinking about this this morning, is how do we think of Ulysses as a monument, but the kind of monument that Nelson's pillar is in Ulysses itself, where Stephen Dedalus um, does with the pillar, he marks it, he notes it, he talks about it, and he mocks it. 
He doesn't, however, blow it up. It took another few decades for Nelson Miller to be blown up. And I, I, we can blow it up today. Um, but if you think about this, this thing as a monument and how we might actually now in a world in which we think a lot about monuments and how we can imagine a new space for monumentalization in our society, how does Ulysses work in that same way? Those, I, I have to admit, those are a lot of questions. And um, by the way, speakers, if you don't answer them today, um, uh, I don't think we'll get to all of them, nor, nor are they necessarily your questions. They're my questions, right? But they are the guiding questions of today's, uh, today's symposium. Um, across conversations, discussions, panel papers, and our keynote, we'll get to put together an understanding of the novel's first century that places it squarely in its world, tracing its peripatetic life. And with John McCourt's keynote at the end of the day, uh, to wrap up, we'll get to hear about the, perhaps the most neglected story of all, which is Ulysses's life in Ireland over the last century. Um, it will be, I promise you, a stimulating day again. And if it's not stimulating, there's coffee. Um, uh, please get up and use it. And something that's unusual in academic events, I think at least a joyous day. It is such a pleasure to see you all here and to have uh, this room full and to have you, all of you joining us on live stream as well um, to celebrate and perhaps blow up uh, Ulysses. I don't, I don't advocate that. Um, uh, I'm going to hand you over now to Nick Quaith. Uh, it's a great pleasure um, to hand over the podium for a few minutes to Nick. Uh, to say words, Nick is the head of cultural affairs at the Irish Consulate in New York and with Culture Ireland, and he has many of years of experience working with and promoting Irish arts and culture organizations in the U.S., and he's also a committed supporter of Irish studies programs uh, across the country, and his work with the Consulate and with Culture Ireland has transformed, I think, Nick, uh, I think we can say this without embarrassing you, has transformed the landscape, I think, um, for those who work in the area and helped really to bring, under difficult conditions in the last couple of years, to bring the best of contemporary Irish work in all kinds of way, virtually and in person, to the U.S. Obviously, there's a huge team, but, um, but we're glad that you're here um, to, uh, to, to, to support that team. So, Nick, we're honored to have you speak and introduce our first panel of the day. We'll move straight from you into, um, into the first panel. All right, thanks. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you, Colleen, for that lovely introduction. Um, it's great to be here today on a beautiful campus, first time here at Georgetown, stunning, and what a beautiful day. So great to see all of you and so many of you that I saw last night at Liz's show, and um, more about that in a moment. So I kind of wonder what Joyce would make of me standing here today, uh, funded by two government departments, the Department of Foreign Affairs and the Department of Culture, as a cultural officer, as a head of cultural affairs, responsible for promoting and supporting Irish artists in their endeavors around the US. As I'm here talking to you today, um, kind of as a result of Brexit. Um, in 2016, just after our British friends decided to Brexit, the Irish government unveiled its global Ireland strategy, realizing it was the last sort of remaining English speaking country in the European Union. One of the many objectives and goals they set was to double down on its culture, investing in artists and cultural officers like myself to promote and, uh, and spread through soft power, um, the values of Ireland. And so since 2016, there's now been seven of us appointed across the world, two of us here in the US, me in New York and Schieffer in LA. And our job um, is actually made quite easy in some ways because we have phenomenal artists across all our forms, um, sort of uh, creating great work that then Culture Ireland and the DFA can support and bring here. So that's how I was appointed here in the US. And as our recently arrived um, ambassador to the US, Geraldine Bernays, and nice to see you Geraldine said last night, I'm really honored to work for a government and a country that not only believes in and honors its artists, but supports them with concrete investments like these roles. I can't think of a better story for a new Ireland embarking on its second century. And as I stand here in front of a room of Joyce scholars, writers, and artists, I do wonder what he himself would make of it. Or the fact that this week, the Irish government recently implemented a basic weekly income for 2000 artists, um, which I think is really, really salutary. Since starting the job, James Joyce has kind of been with me the whole time because uh, his centenary this year, the centenary of Ulysses, and we've been planning for it for a long time. And I've had the privilege of seeing and promoting so much work that's been inspired by or is in response to his epic novel. There's been film, theater, podcasts, book groups, including a great book by our former ambassador, Dan Mulhall, who's here today. Um, you name it, podcasts, exhibitions. And 2022 has seen Irish studies programs like this and conferences and symposiums across the world. It truly is a global monument, as you say, Colleen. Um, and it's quite amazing that in this role, I get to work with so many people, so many artists who've been inspired by this work of fiction. 
but out of the hundreds of Ulysses 100 events, and there really are hundreds, and I encourage you to check the Ulysses 100 website where every event is listed, I don't think I'd come across a dance piece. And I think maybe this might be one of the first dance pieces in response to Ulysses. So what I saw last night and what the Irish choreographer Liz Roach and her cast and company have created in response to that text was quite simply exquisite, compelling, bold, ambitious, 70 minutes of pure beauty. And I wish that really, really well as it goes tonight, it's last night in DC, then goes to Villanova before touring in Ireland and hopefully coming back here. So it's great honor as head of cultural affairs to now introduce a panel with Liz and the Ireland-based filmmaker and dance historian and longtime contact Deirdre Mulrooney. Great to see you again. And to tell you more about that panel, please let me now introduce you to Michelle Clayton, who not only is an associate professor at Brown, but as she revealed, perhaps regrettingly last night to me, she was also a dancer in Liz's company many, many years ago. So please join me in welcoming Michelle in today's first panel. Thank you. Okay, can I, um, is this, it's on, okay. Everybody can hear me? Okay, that's great. Um, it's such a pleasure uh, to be here uh, for this wonderful conference to see so many great Joycean, so many different kinds of responses to this work. Um, as Nick was uh, introducing us uh, now, uh, for me too, this is the first time that I have encountered a dance response to Ulysses. And I think we're gonna have a fabulous conversation about this really extraordinary piece that we saw last night and we've all been thinking and, and talking about since. I just correct one thing. I wish I'd been a member of Liz's dance company back <laughs> in the 90s, but Liz and myself were actually in dance classes together from I think the tender age of seven or eight or thereabouts um, in Dublin and I had after I left Ireland I had completely lost track of what she was doing and something prompted me at some point to kind of look back into dance in Ireland to see what had happened um, since the early 90s and I came upon Deirdre's extraordinary book uh, Irish Moves and I encountered so many figures I knew and read about Liz and what she's been doing so this is just such a beautiful convergence uh, and a roundabout a circle and to be here today to discuss her work uh, and to discuss Deirdre's work um, in the context of this broader um, a conversation about Ulysses in the world is, is, is just such a pleasure um, so I will introduce um, both of um, our uh, conversants uh, here today. So Deirdre Mulroney, who is uh, beside me, is a writer, filmmaker, radio documentarian and dance historian. Uh, she's the author of Irish Moves, um, the book I was just mentioning, an illustrated history of dance and physical theatre in Ireland, and also Orientalism, Orientation and the Nomadic Work of Pina Bausch, which was based on her PhD thesis at uh, UCD, University College Dublin. Um, she has a wonderful essay, incredibly probing and wide ranging essay on Lucia, Lucia Joyce uh, titled Fail Better, Lucia Joyce and the Abbey Theatre Ballets in the current issue of Joyce Studies Annual. I really, really recommend this. She also has a beautiful short film um, about Lucia, uh, which is called um, Full Capacity. Um, and she is planning an interdisciplinary St. Lucia's Day event at Dublin's James Joyce Centre this December to mark 40 years uh, since Lucia Joyce's uh, 1982 death. Um, so Deirdre will talk to us a little bit uh, today about um, Joyce's relationship to dance, a relationship that is probably kind of unsuspected for most of us, and also uh, about her work with uh, Lucia Joyce. She has many, many more films of dance, different kinds of recovery. She's doing extraordinary work in reclaiming figures. Uh, so I hope she'll talk to us a little bit about that as well. Uh, and then um, for Liz, and I apologize for pulling this up on my phone, but Liz uh, Roach is artistic director and choreographer of Dublin-based dance company, Liz Roach Company. Uh, since 1999, her company has produced and toured her works throughout Ireland and internationally. Uh, she's uh, performed her stage works at the Barishna Club Arts Centre in New York, the Abbey Theatre in Dublin, the South Bank Centre in London, Festival of Irish Arts in Beijing, the Festival de la Nouvelle Danse in Ouse, and Powerhouse Brisbane. 
Um, her work's been commissioned by a variety of uh, different uh, institutions, and she's currently company in residence, her company, company in residence at the Irish World Academy of Music and Dance at the University of Limerick. Uh, throughout 2023, she'll also be developing new work in Luxembourg in partnership with Dublin Dance Festival. Um, so as a dancer, she's worked with many renowned Irish uh, and international uh, choreographers, such as Rosemary Butcher, John Jasper's company, um, and she has also choreographed extensively in theatre and opera. At the Abbey Theatre in the Gate, uh, Landmark Productions, Lyric Theatre Belfast, uh, and a variety of other really too many fabulous institutions to, to talk about here, but I hope you will talk about them uh, a little bit. And finally, in, 2000, in 2020, she was elected to Eostolna in recognition of her outstanding contribution to the creative arts in Ireland. So it's such a delight to have Liz here today to talk about her work with uh, Ulysses and for us to be able to talk about her work with Ulysses that we all experienced yesterday. So thanks so much. So uh, we'll start with uh, Deirdre will talk to us. Okay, thanks a million. Thanks, uh, it's, it's amazing. It's an honor to be here with you all today. And um, you know, in, in the day after we saw the premiere, the world premiere of Liz's incredible visceral embodied piece, yes and yes. And um, as far as I know, the first, the only piece I know of, you know, that has um, stood up to the challenge <laughs> Uh, of engaging with Ulysses and uh, responding um, through the body and through dance. And um, as we know, Ulysses is the epic of the body. Each episode has its own organ. And, um, uh, you know, I can't help thinking that if Joyce, um, Joyce somewhere in the great beyond is, is uh, dancing a jig <laughs> today uh, or his own spider dance uh, in response to um, you know, what you created uh, last night. So I just want to, first of all, um, give you a bit of context about Joyce and dance. Um, so I've been working on his daughter, uh, Lucia Joyce, who was a pioneering modern dancer in 1920s Paris, and, um, you know, very much examining archives and texts about her. And whenever I encounter, you know, any of Joyce's comments, like that he wrote on her program, you know, 1927 in April 1927, her, her um, performance of Pretres Primitive, and he wrote on it 10, 20, 30, you know, um, some colors on it. I, like, I, dis I dismiss it. I go, who, who cares about that? You know, I'm just really interested in reclaiming Lucia Joyce. But actually, when you look at Joyce and dance, um, he, he himself was... Um, famed for his spider dance in the beer halls of Zurich. And I've also found some great descriptions of his own, uh, the shapes that he would throw himself. Um, so Stuart Gilbert, right, he often danced at his birthday parties. He, he loved celebrating uh, his birthday on February the 2nd. And so on his 1930 birthday party, Stuart Gilbert described him, he is a nimble dancer. If Joyce had not been a writer, he'd have been a meister singer, if not a singer, a ballerino. Um, his 1928 birthday party, Adrienne Monnier described him dancing, imitating Lucia's dancing, a la Raymond Duncan. Um, but I think the best description of him comes from his first biographer, Herbert Gorman, who says of his 1939 birthday party, no one who has not seen Joyce dance can have any idea from a brief description what his terpsichorean talents are like. To enlivening music, he breaks into a high, fantastic dance all by himself, a dance that is full of quaint antics, high kicks, and astonishing figures. He dances with all his body, head, hands, and feet, and the evolutions through which he goes, eccentric, but never losing the beat of the music, are calculated to arouse a suspicion in the beholder that he has no bones at all. Others join in the dances and he weaves wild and original patterns with them. When the music stops, he sinks contentedly into his chair. The festival has been a success. So this sounds very like, <laughs> sounds very familiar, doesn't it? After, you know, 
uh, what we saw, the creation that we saw last night. And as it happens, James Joyce himself was very into modern dance. And um, the first recording that we have of him attending a modern dance show was in May 1922. So shortly after the um, publication of Ulysses, um, when he went to see the Ballet Russe Renard in Paris and um, in, the, in the fine company of uh, Marcel Proust, um, among others. Um, and then when we go on, we see this fantastic American composer, uh, the bad boy of American music, the uh, George Anthile, um, who then brought Joyce to see uh, the Ballet Suédois in 1923. And the whole family are recorded at, uh, attending his Ballet Mécanique. Um, and then they attended, uh, Joyce attended this very, he was in this surrealist world, this incredible world of 1920s Paris avant-garde. Um, he attended Relâche, an instantaneous ballet in two acts and a cinematographic entr'acte and a dog's tale and uh, La Création du Monde with Ballet Suédois. And then we see um, Lucia really bringing him into her world of modern dance in Paris. And this was uh, Margaret Morris's uh, dance group, her own group, Rhythm et Couleur, and um, her own um, work with Raymond Duncan, who himself in his had a academy, Raymond Duncan in Neuilly in Paris, where he himself was, you know, living the life of an ancient Greek person. Um, so as Karolib Schloss, um, Lucia's biographer says, you know, that we, we really owe a lot and Joyce owes a lot to um, Lucia Joyce uh, for, you know, bringing him into this uh, embodied um, avant-garde world. And indeed, you know, he described her as an innovator not yet understood. And he also said of her that she speaks in an innovative language and an anticipation of a new literature. So in this, you know, I think like seeing Liz's uh, work uh, last night, that it's very much in, in that realm. And um, I think, of course, so we look at Lucia Joyce and she was at the beginning of the 20th century and she was an Irish diaspora artist and a dance artist and she was erased and until very lately um we we didn't have this information about her you know that um she was a, a dance artist of great prowess and um it, you know in in my own research i've connected her with wb yates and the abbey theater ballet and wb yates was actually considering using her in his Abbey Theatre Ballet. So, and now on the other side of the 20th century, we have Liz Roach. And I, I do view Liz really as a descendant of Lucia Joyce, you know, and of, as um, Ambassador um, Byrne Nason was saying last night, you know, we're, we're very lucky to be alive now. You know, when Ireland, we're so enlightened, we've come through those, dark ages of the 20th century, you know, where the body was repressed in Ireland. And I, I don't need to outline it, you know, the, the Magdalene laundries, the mother and baby's homes. And here we are like in, in the 21st century, you know, with um, Liz Roach and, you know, um, Ireland presenting this wonderful embodied visceral um, show last night with the articulate body at the forefront. Um, and, uh, and, and of course, Liz was elected to Aestana in 2020. And actually the first Irish dance artist to be elected to Aestana was in 2010. So it seems like, you know, it's all, you know, as we were saying, this great 21st century bodily enlightenment. Um, so um, Liz, just to um, start in the first question now, I know like a lot of you, it's your introduction to contemporary dance, um, this show that we saw last night. And um, I, I think about, you know, the great theater director, uh, Peter Brook, and he talked about when you, you know, when you look at a show and it's more true for dance than anything, it's the next day, the residue 
that's in your head when you woke up this morning, the people who saw the show, what remained in your head? What image, you know, what um, visceral feeling did you wake up with this morning? Well, I actually woke up with a very, very, you know, when you come out, it's like, there's so much going on, you know, it's like, it's really, it's hard to, to make sense. And also I think of Roland Barth as well, because when he talks about the book, you don't read the book, the book reads you. Well, this is more true of dance than anything, isn't it? You know, because it really is about your subjective visceral response as well. Well, I was left, Liz, thinking of, your opening image of Sarah Sereno, beautiful dancer, um, upright, quirky, playing, playful. And you know, you brought us on a journey, but the journey that that she was brought on through the the production, you know, to the end. And we think of like the show was called Yes and Yes. Sounds very affirmative doesn't it you know so you're going to expect some kind of you know river dance moment at the end <laughs> percussive <yeah. laughs> affirmation you know like you really didn't give us that you know no but I mean it's very very profound you know because I I think you know um for example, uh, Catherine Flynn, who edited uh, the centenary edition of Ulysses, she writes about Penelope. And, you know, Penelope, like, is it feminist? Is it sexist? You know, it's what what is it? Is it like the female voice or is it a man getting trying to get into, you know, get into the head of a female and, to, you know, like it's very complicated, you know. So, um, you know, and Catherine talks about it's the predicament, Molly in her predicament and how she deals with that and manages. And, and I feel like, correct me if I'm wrong, is that something that you were very sensitive to? The, the, the plight, the plight of the female uh, throughout this journey of Ulysses. Um. Thanks, Tina. Um, it was interesting. Um, when, when we decided to go ahead with the piece, uh, I went and I went for a walk in the Phoenix Park with uh, a musician composer called Nick Roth. Um, and uh, because somebody told me that Nick was really into it and he knew the book backwards and he had read it like he reads it every year. And so we went for a walk. And I had the, we, I was saying, I don't know, like, is it like the whole book is so, like, so huge. And, and he was like, yeah, you either go for something really tiny and explore that or just, I don't know. He was like, or else just go so far away from the book that like, it doesn't matter anymore. So we were having these kind of, you know, do we go for epic or we, something really small? So when I left that conversation, I went back and I thought maybe it's just Penelope. So I just spent like a month rereading and yeah, sort of trying to invest in what if the piece was just that chapter and just looking at it. Um, and it was, it was interesting because I just couldn't get behind it. And I was really frustrated with myself for ages. And I was like, come on, just, this, is, this makes sense. This is a good idea for a piece. But then I just, I, I couldn't get behind it. Um, and then when we, went, when we went into the studio, so I, I was like, okay, let's just try and deal very lightly with the whole thing. You know, let's just try and manage the whole thing as and fail at it, but we'll just give it a go. Um, and when we went into the studio, the first couple of days of rehearsal were, were with Sarah. Uh, and because, yeah. Um, and we started to work on this idea of an improvisation. Um, and I said, I want to make this yes solo. So we need, we need a big yes at the beginning and a big yes at the end. Big yes. Yeah. Um, and we went through it and we were talking about like what that is, you know, like what the yes could be. So it was like, I had this improvisation where, you know, which I actually had worked with somebody else on through another choreographer. And it's an improvisation where the dancer would say, just say yes to everything that's arising. So 
like and when you say yes to everything you don't edit nothing gets cut because so, you know as a dancer when you're improvising with movement you're also kind of making plans and saying oh that works I'll go that direction but this is just yes to everything um so we tried that for a while created lots of movement uh, but it was a bit I don't know it didn't really work great um and then we tried this other idea so uh, I asked Sarah to improvise to La Chi de Ren La Mano. So I was like, just improvise to this, but only improvise to the female voice. Let's see if that works. So that's actually where all those stops come is because she's actually singing that in her head when she's dancing. So she's waiting for the man to stop singing and then she moves on. Um, so that was good. And we did that around the idea of yes. Um, and then still the movement wasn't working. So then we were kind of looking at the, we were looking at within that song, of course, he's pursuing her in the opera. And she's like, no, 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 I can't, I can't, I can't. And then it's like, yes, 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 I can. So we kind of, Sarah tried this idea of saying no. So actually that solo is a no. They're all just no's all the time. Because in a weird way, the no was much more creative than the yes. But so we kept that like I still feel that it's I still feel like it captures and then, you know, at the end, it's a different type of yes. She's just kind of in the throes of something. But um, but yeah, it was just I suppose that's the journey of that. They were originally meant to be yeses, but they always end up as something else. So yeah, yeah. yeah it felt like watching it that like she wasn't allowed to say no, like she wanted to say no. But, you know, yeah, she wasn't allowed by whatever. You, you know patriarchy mm. whatever yeah, yeah 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 and and like in 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 your work um liz like you did a fantastic piece as well feminist like a uh, wrong-headed as well where you collaborated so liz has collaborated with a poet irish poet elaine feeney um on uh this piece wrong-headed around um uh, women but women's rights you know right mm. right right to choose really wasn't it so um this is a big theme with you the you know you yeah you are female <laughs> yeah. <laughs> from that point of view yeah and I think I think that there's I think these things rise up in you you know it's I wouldn't see myself as political or but when we made wrong-headed that was in response to all the repeal of the eighth amendment in Dublin and that was very you know, that that was something that just sort of came up and had to be met. And it was one of those moments also where a load of people gathered at a particular time. And so and I and I feel quite similar, actually, about this piece, that it was this sense of. Because I suppose so many things are being explored. In the book, uh, that it also at a certain point, you kind of just have to take agency or something and say, well, look, I'm just going to. I'm just going to deal with that. That's what speaks to me. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe that, of course, like I am a woman and that that kind of, so then there is that perspective. And, and I suppose like, yeah, like I, I was also interested in the way that I, I was slightly uncomfortable sometimes about the way he writes about women. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I feel bad saying that. Because it's also, and then, and I also realized that I was in this weird relationship with the writing throughout because I would fall into these places of really getting into it. And then it's like, bam, just mm. stops you or mm. cuts you. And, and Norsega was one of those yeah. places. Could you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, they, I just was really affected by her in Norsega. Like when he calls her the girl woman at the beginning, I was just like, oh my God. And the fact that she, the fact that she's like just senses him and it's like that's it i'll give up everything and i'll go now with you i i almost feel like i might have felt that in my own life so i was like i was completely into that and then i was also devastated after they have this moment together just just how everything stops like the lights went on and i, I really hated him like we were saying at a talk we were doing this i fell out of love with him completely um but yeah, like I, I sort of felt like that callousness and that coldness and it still it still really affects me really deeply. Um, yeah, so so that was a, like a big moment. I really wanted to try and 
portray that in some way. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you went into film on that. So could you tell us a bit about your choices in, you know, when you went into film for certain episodes like Nausicaa? Yeah, well, we, we just thought, um, we just thought maybe not everything can be said in movement. Um, and with Nausicaa, I don't know, I just felt like it had to, we had to go to Sandy Mount. We had to sort of be on the beach and we just went out one day. We actually had a series of filming days scheduled that just kept getting cancelled and everything fell apart. And then we just caught this one day, which was really sunny and lovely um, and just floated around and, and was kind of like, yeah, here, we just do it here. And this makes sense here. And it's also like, you know, the, the backdrop is, is so amazing there. But it was also wanting to have this. Um, I, I myself and Jose, Jose Miguel Jimenez is the videographer. Uh, I really wanted this moment for Grace to manage this moment after, like when he's gone and what to do. Um, And of course, I'm not really a director in that way. So I was a bit like, okay, Grace, we're just now out here. We can do this twice, but I want you to just manage that kind of feeling of like total abandonment and someone like you think something's going somewhere and someone just cuts it. And and so Grace was like, okay, so that's the story of my life kind of thing. So and then yeah. it was really it, it was. Yeah, she just went into this place, this kind of place of how could I have been so stupid? You know, how could I have at the end of the film? She's just like um, and herself and Jose went into this really quiet place where he was just circling her. And I had to stay behind him with the camera because, of course, not to be seen because it was, you know, there was, but it was like we just went into this little whirlpool of space and got caught in it for about 20 minutes. And it was just this really special moment. And that happened a lot on this piece. Like it was like disaster, 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 and then really special. You know, it was, it, it's been the pattern for this. Mm-hmm. And that that's very much like a Joycean serendipity. I think that, you know, it, you know, it, it does, we all, we all experience it, but it's like these moments of grace, of Joycean grace. And you, um, Liz, like your work is, um, famously you know embodied and abstract and you know you don't usually incorporate text or a narrative into your work um could you tell us a little bit about um you know your encounter with the stream of Joyce's stream of consciousness and his text I, like I loved at the end the way you know you had text going across uh, very pointedly and then at the end it was like this just jumble it was almost like we were landing in Finnegan's wake or something again at the end could you tell us about how you feel like as a choreographer and dancer um, engaging with Joyce's technique of stream of consciousness um yeah I it's true. I'm not mad about text. So it's kind of, it, it was a bit of a, a jumble. But then I suppose the kind of the nature of this text and just the way it kind of trickles along and and it's so much fun in places and it's so irreverent in places. Um, I felt that that really was inspiring and just the way that he messes with words and he just doesn't care. In, uh, I don't know, but, you know, it just seems it's like, that's how it feels and then that's how it appears and so the the gap between like the gap between this text and and the movement wasn't as difficult as any time I've tried to do it in the past mm. um so I I yeah and I think that also we had generated like you know every time when I was reading I you know, I would underline things and write down quotes and I'd bring it into the studio and we're like, let's try something with this and let's try something with this. And and then by the time we got to kind of putting the show together, we were like, what are we going to do with all the text? Because it has to be there. You know, we have to get it in. Like, we can't just not have it there. So then we were like, we'll just dump it all in one moment. And yeah. so that's that's how that came about. We just, um, But also... It, it, I also wanted to, I suppose that's feeling of overwhelm, you know, because mm. the book is overwhelming. It's overwhelming for anyone to read as well. Like, yeah. 
can I yeah. actually ask just on, on that point? Because I think, you know, watching it as uh, Joyceans or Ulysseans, they were watching it looking for how you're responding to the text. I love what you're saying about a yes turning into a no, right? And a negative, like stepping away from something is itself a reaction to the, to the text. But we're, you know, probably inevitably looking for the same things that you're probably grappling with as you're beginning to think about choreographing this, which is, do I use the structure? Do I use the overall structure? How much do I signal to the audience this is going on? And I loved what you were doing with the kind of chapter headings that came up sometimes, and sometimes in Joyce in Forum and sometimes not. Um, and But then also picking up on little kind of particles, like moments that are in the text that we probably have a kind of aha moment. And I talked to somebody about this last night after the performance. There was um, there are moments where you have like the milk bottle that seems to come up in several scenes and it knits them together. And we're watching as joy scenes, we see these symbols or these objects uh, migrating from place to place, or we see gestures migrating from place to place and from body to body. Um, so there are these moments where you suddenly click with watching, you see like a sudden kind of match between the an epiphany. And dance. Yeah, an epiphany. Um, there was one moment um, where at the end of a kind of a convolution of bodies, right, moving around, and I wasn't quite sure what it seemed to be both sirens and wandering rocks. And at some point, somebody picked something off a skirt, or at least that's what it looks like towards the end. And I wasn't sure at that point whether it was wandering rocks or sirens, but then I realized the same gestures in both. And I loved that, the way that you were finding gestures that were in the text or creating gestures to evoke the text uh, for us. So I wanted to ask you about that, actually, reading the book. Um, how much were you looking for particular gestures associated with certain characters or looking for the choreographic in the book? Um, so partly, you know, the choreographic of multiple bodies, which you do so beautifully and so interestingly here, where you multiply characters. Um, but then also certain characters who have little dances. You know, I always think of the kind of dance of shame that Bloom does when he's on his way to the National Library and he begins to cross paths with Lady <coughs> Boylan and he starts to pat himself down, right? And that dance of like panic that we all do, we all recognize that kind of bodily series of gestures. And I was wondering how much you were looking for those in the text and, and working them into what you were doing or coming up with different gestures that would evoke the characters or a setting differently. Um. Yeah, so sometimes I try to use the book as stage directions. So like it, it would set up a situation. And then sometimes like when when she goes down and picks that up, that is from Wandering Rocks with the, the girl detaching the twig from her skirt. Um, and we would have tried lots of we would have tried like, what does this sentence look like in movement? And that was one of the ones that stuck. So we we, we kept that. But then it's also um, like in Wandering Rocks, the screen, it says this is a rehearsal. And and because I was, I, I was stuck on that chapter and I was like, okay, so there's 19 meetings. So then basically when they're counting to each other, they're just counting each meeting. It's like, there we are, you know, like I did this too, you know. So it was like something to just try and link back to it. But yeah, the those gestures, those gestures emerge all the time, and I just stole as many as I could. I took as many as I could, and um, and and tried to bring them in. But then also, it's interesting what you're saying because I didn't think about the dances. That you know, I didn't think so much about the dances within the actual text, but they somehow made it into the, like Junior does this or Mufatau does this in the piece a lot, and they somehow get there. And I think it's because it's just it's people. You know, it's like, yeah, we kind of keep this, this is what people do. And I'm not sure, yeah, the dance doesn't go much far beyond just what people do. Um, so that was, it's, yeah, it's, it's really interesting that, it's, that you say that because maybe it all just arrives or what's meant to arrive, arrives. Yeah. And there are actual allusions to dance in, in the text, like in Sirens and in... Um, um, Cersei as yeah. well. So did you um, think about 
responding to those? I, I thought about it more overall. Like I was a bit, no, like I didn't really. I kind of, I thought more like the style of each chapter. Like the first part of the piece, this yes happens with Sarah and then they walk around. It's not really connected to a chapter, but somehow I feel when Dermot does his solo, it's like somewhere. I think he's a bit like Stephen Dedalus sometimes. Um, but then when it goes into the boys and the milkwoman and it's into Telemachus, it kind of just sort of starts there. I, I, I tried to do like when when a chapter was quite narrative and understandable, that we would try and make the dance quite narrative and understandable. So, um, but then of course, when, when it just goes into free fall, the dance kind of just goes into free fall as well. So like in a way, when they're all in those suits and they're in Cersei and like, it, it probably could have been clearer, but uh, you know, they kind of arrive in positions and that was just to somehow try and mark the rhythm of this kind of like little play, you know, that kind of like scene after scene after scene after scene. Um, like, I think you could just like, I think you could spend years and really do it, you know, but uh, I suppose, yeah, in this period of time, it was always just like, you know, light connections to all of these ideas. But I don't know, like, yeah, I didn't really connect to the dance within the book that much it was really just the people or something yeah the the pedestrian gestures and uh, yeah yeah and 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 i suppose just the that internal um you know the stream of consciousness and that thought and you know and that's very present when you're dancing all the time so it was just trying to replace replace that process that happens in a dance you know like certainly my experience of performing and dancing I, I would never get lost you know mm. like I'm always like organized there make sure there that light is there like there's a there's a full-on conversation that's going and then a few other things going on in my head I know some people can get lost but I that was never my experience so mm. we we just tried to um yeah magnify that mm -hmm. you know and bring all of those little thoughts then into what the dancers were doing mm -hmm. and like and and in the book it's like ge geographically almost like um james joyce is moving people around and choreographing people through the streets of dublin mm -hmm. and um you know and, and you have those references as well mm -hmm. in in your piece mm. and it's also there's this kind of there are these structures um like when I've danced in the work of other people, you know, lots of people work with scores, choreographic scores, you know, like numerical choreographic scores. And and when I was reading um, the book, I was I was like, oh, God, there it is, because that sentence randomly turns up and looking at the schema and all of that, like it is hugely choreographic, like and in a and in a very experimental way, like I feel like people are still um, those structures that I recognized in there, like that's very much you know, a choreographic structure. And those are the tasks that we would be asked, you know, reintroduce this five times, you know, in terms of movement. And so it, it was just, it was actually read, that was really pleasurable, you know, to be part, to be in, in that process. Can I ask actually something about that with regard to uh, the dancers themselves? I mean, I, a couple of questions, I guess, about the dancers. Um, have the dancers read the book? How were you talking to them about the different episodes? And then are there, particular episodes that they really, that they love, uh, that they really enjoyed kind of working through performing. Um, how do they feel about Cersei in particular, which I think that had a really visceral impact on many of us in the audience, because you have the images of flowers, right, that have started to bloom in other, blossom in other, uh, in other sections, and then suddenly come in here and take over and um, put a skin over something that is beautiful, but also grotesque, right? And, and then you really plunge us into that world mm -hmm. for a long time. So it's such a relief when you come out the other side and have what I think for many of us is a, it's a gorgeous moment, right? In chapters 16 and 17, where suddenly bloom and Stephen start to find a different kind of equilibrium. And you did that beautiful kind of pas de deux between mm -hmm. them where 
they keep knocking the other one off their own axis and then kind of recovering. Mm-hmm. And it was just gorgeous oh, uh, to have that. So I wanted to ask just about the dancer's experience mm-hmm. of this. How did they, for, did they read the book? How were they reacting then to the choreographies as you were putting mm-hmm. them together? Um, I think Grace made, I think Grace and Sarah made a really fair attempt at the book. I think Grace maybe went further. Um, but I'm not sure the guys did. <laughs> um, and there was that, yeah, there was that uh, sense of like, I would come in with, so we're in the middle of this chapter and then this is going to happen. And it was, they were just like, yeah, so just give us the thing that we need to explore and we'll, we'll do it. And so there was that sense. And like, to be honest, before the show last night, there was one I was like, you do know what's happening in this moment. And they were all like, yeah, no, it's fine. You know, it's fine. We, we, have, a, we have a skim on what, where, we're at, where we're at, you know? So that was kind of, because actually sometimes it's better. There's a distillation that occurs, you know, when they're, when they're not forcing anything too real out there. They're just engaging with an idea. And so that kind of lets me off the hook. But, um, but then, yeah, like when it got into Cersei, that was a bit like I was like so there's this like I, I suppose I was really upfront about the book I said you know there's places in the book that are pretty tough going and you know um we're gonna have to go there a bit uh, and it took a while but it's like also um like the cast are quite different age groups um like Sarah is in her 40s and Junior and then you know Dermot and Grace are younger and so and I suppose like that experience they sort of you know people understand then how to manage around it and there is a certain amount of we just have to try it and see how how it happens um but then it was also interesting because in one of the weeks of rehearsal uh, Dermot and Sarah had to go they were on they were on other jobs um and two uh replacement dancers just came in for the week to learn a few things and um and actually, because they were a bit, because they didn't really know what was going on, they kind of threw themselves in. They weren't going to be there for five days. They had no connection to the piece. And in that time, we worked on some of that section. So they were a bit like, oh, let's try that. And who cares? And they, they actually brought this kind of freedom into it. So then by the time the guys came back, I was like, this is set. So they kind of just had to learn things. And But yeah, no, I, I, think, I think there is... Um, it was a little it was a little complicated sometimes but i had great support from the team like wayne jordan uh worked with worked as dramaturg on the piece and um he's a a, a director in dublin a theater director in dublin and wayne is also great support in those moments when you're like oh is it a bit much or should i do and he's just like no it's definitely not too much just keep going cuz i'd say i would have yeah you know, because I suppose, yeah, I would have probably come back from it or served some very narrative things around. Yeah. I probably would have come back. And it was, it's bold like the text, you yeah. know, it's bold like Ulysses is bold. I yeah, think, and you have to meet you know? it. Yeah, you yeah. have to meet it. Um, we can, I, can I just ask one quote before sure. we open? Um, just um, Liz um, actually was the first choreographer um, to be invited by the Abbey Theatre to create a choreography on the main stage of the Abbey. And she did that in 2015. And interestingly, it was in response to Yates. Uh, it was called Bastard Amber. And you were looking at sailing to Byzantium. And we also did some work on Dreaming of yeah. the Bones um in a, in, a, in a workshop so so you know so though you're text shy you have engaged with the you know the big uh, Irish writers so in terms of that experience at Yates and Joyce have you had any time to reflect on the difference or which you preferred or yeah like my my aunt um w- was a an English and classics teacher um and she hated Joyce she just really thought he was awful and uh, and she loved Yates. So um, I, I so there was always that sense of and I and I. I yeah, I suppose I 
I did go through this time where I, I loved that sort of romantic time and and poetry and it's also aspirational and and in a way yes I love that um, and I'm glad that I made those pieces in response to those things or to, or to those poets um, but I was quite surprised like when I then when I when I read Ulysses yeah, like I was, I, I was really surprised also, like just with that energy, because there's an energy in it. There's a di a dynamic in it. Yeah, yeah. That that um. No, there's. I feel that. Well, I, you're always wherever you are in your life. You're always like this is it. No, but uh, like I feel that there's the kind of the transformative possibilities and that that this experience has brought about it feels like it will resonate um what can i say it's been a nice journey and i'm glad it happened and even though i totally respect how my aunt used to feel about it she could have she could have given it another go so. <laughs> <laughs> okay i think we can uh, open up uh to questions from the audience do we need to circulate oh there's a microphone um, at the back <laughs> Um, what is the state of dance in Ireland uh, as Joyce's being raised in his youth? What was dance like in Ireland then, particularly in Dublin? Um, yeah, so this was like um, before, like in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, yeah, that, I mean, there was mostly, I think, either um, sort of waltzing, you know, coupled social dancing and, and Irish dancing. And, and of course, um, uh, you know, we did have with the foundation, of course, and Joyce would have been very plugged into this and sent this up a lot and the foundation of the Gaelic League and, you know, that people could were only allowed to dance Irish dances and you were penalized or excommunicated <laughs> if you dance foreign dances you know and, and obviously this um you know informs his uh you know his work Ulysses as well so um you know and then then with with um when W.B. Yeats came along um with the Abbey uh School of Ballet uh in the 1920s which he founded with uh Ninette de Valois who actually is another Irish woman from Blessington, County Wicklow, um, who danced with the Ballet Russe. So she would have trained in England and with Cicchetti. And, um, and then she eventually went on to found uh, the Royal British Ballet. Um, so, you know, Yates would have been bringing in, you know, but he wanted it to be a ballet russe for Ireland. So he had that vision uh, for dance at that point. And um, as I saw, like Lucia Joyce was, you know, at the height of her dancing prowess in Paris at that point. And, um, you know, he and Yates was actually considering um, Lucia Joyce as a dancer in his ballet to bring all those wonderful you know, avant-garde international uh, influences into Ireland. So, um, you know, that's where I think Joyce would have been, you know, as he grew up. Yeah. Do we have um, other questions? <coughs> yeah, Kasia. Um, I wanted to ask about the screen um, during the performance last night in that when we arrived, we could see the text on the screen. And I was sort of thinking of it as like the kind of screen that you have for subtitles in the opera, right? Where it's it's sort of there, but it's meant to be unobtrusive. And, and you notice the text a bit, but then you're supposed to be focused on the dancing. But then it, sort of images started appearing and then the film and then you know you had all these kind of visual effects with the words and I was kind of amazed at just how much you could do with a screen of that size in that it's actually comparatively small right and I it's maybe a strange question but I wonder if you put a lot of thought into actually the size of the screen and if you considered having a full backdrop or 
you know, if you've played with different versions of that. Uh, yeah, I'm working with a designer, uh, Katie Davenport. And Katie was like, it needs to be anamorphic. Like we just have a letterbox. We would have liked a bigger one, but they're very expensive. So it was like, we'd have a little letterbox. Um, but it does, um, yeah, it carries. And it's exactly that. Like it's, it's meant to feel like a surtitle screen that then develops and uh, turns into yeah different types of information. But yeah, no, that's very much Katie's design. And to, uh, she re there was really this sense of, she wanted, it was lovely actually. She sort of, she said, I kind of want to make a Dublin, like the kind of the dullness of Dublin, the grayness of Dublin, and that the people are the color. So that's why everything sort of went into the costume. So this very simple setting and, and then, yeah, that the people are the color and they're the life. Because I think sometimes, Dublin can feel a bit like that you know it's it's just the people that you meet like in in terms of um yeah bringing the life into that so yeah no that was very much her decision and her 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 vision on that yeah um can I jump in with one more question which is occurring to me um uh, just to interrupt, in terms of uh, the number, uh, because obviously this is a touring production or it was conceived of as a production that could tour. Um, I was wondering how you decide, like the, I'm working a little bit off Cash's question, how you decide the limits of what you're doing and then how you maximize what you can get out of that. So when you came up with the number of dancers and the particular dancers that you were using and how you were going to use recorded sound in that space as well and lighting effects um how do you how do you do this when it's a touring production how do you think about the different spaces that you'll be in for two nights i assume mm -hmm. as you move around yeah i suppose those conversations start very early and you know and all of the the technical specifications from the theaters can come at quite an early stage so there's a certain amount of, yeah, you put a restriction on your thinking quite early on. Um, but it was also this sense of, actually, when I first thought about the piece, I thought three dancers. Um, and, I, and I was in a space of three dancers for a good while, but then, then it kind of grew to four. It, it sort of felt like it needed that. Sometimes I don't really like making a piece with an even number of people. To know so it can balance a piece out a bit too much so i like it to be an uneven number but um yeah no i just felt like i suppose also the nice thing with with four is it can be three and one that i i, I always love three and one um so yeah i suppose those 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 ideas just i don't really know how to make those decisions anymore i just feel like i'm old and i and it's just like you know, all of the things, the restrictions are there for years. So it's kind of like, I know what I can do there and I know what I can do there. But, um, but yeah, I also have to say, like, I have been making quite big pieces for the last couple of years. And, um, and we, we kept working a lot through COVID on quite big pieces. So part of this, part of this piece, I really did want to strip it really far back and just try and see how simple could it be and still deliver. Um, and it was great that that, like, that was even before I knew I was making this piece. Like when I left the last piece, I was like, no, there's too much going on. It has to be just more specific from now on. And then of course, when this opportunity came up, it was, it was, a, it was a good moment to try that. Yeah, it does seem also, I mean, watching this in the after with the aftermath of COVID, however much we're in the aftermath, but um, the, the focus or the, the, um, the ways in which you, you milk those interpersonal relations in um, such interesting and surprising ways in some ways, uh, you know, to, to Joycean's, right, who are used precisely to thinking of the book in terms of three. But you're right, there are all of these other ones, right, who appear at different times. And I think you really brought that out beautifully in the choreography. Um, but it is striking to see those bodies moving together that sometimes you have, and I told you a little bit about this last night, sometimes you have the four dancers performing the same choreography in the space. 
and sometimes then entering into conflict or working against one another. But even when they're presenting the same choreography, there are differences. There are differences in the way that they signal how much they're looking at one another, mm. right? Which is really surprising. It's not even a difference in style. It's actually like a visual. I am checking you. I am not. Mm. <laughs> I'm going elsewhere. So there's something else that comes out in the identical choreographies that are being performed by these four, which almost takes us into kind of Beckett territory. Mm. Like it feels a little bit like um, his dance plays, right? His later grid movements. Um, which go back to Thomas McGreevy, right, yeah. and Lucia Joyce. Um, so yeah, yeah they, they were all in, interconnected, you know, because obviously, you know, Beckett, um, his favorite uh, play, he said he longed for a uh, sup at the Hawks Well, which was W. B. Yeats's um, dance play at, at the Hawks Well. So incredibly, like you know, Beckett, Joyce, Yeats, three of them, like embodied writers and very much in the world you know I, I sometimes look at Beckett as a choreographer <laughs> you know and also then the connection with Lucia you know so um yeah and and of course just to remind you of that um description of Lucia in 1928 by the Paris Times uh where they said when she reaches her full capacity for rhythmic dancing James Joyce may yet be known as his daughter's father um so yeah. And of course, Liz as a kind of descendant of Lucia Joyce, you know, and, and like, and I mean, and it, it's never too late to um, incorporate those lost figures, you know, Erin Brady, Lucia Joyce, in terms of, you know, identity of where we are as a country on our body journey. Mm -hmm. I think these lost figures are, are really important. And like, sometimes I even think about like in, kind of like almost family constellations therapy you know that like it's the lost people who aren't mentioned who actually um have great unconscious impact on the current generation whether they know it or not and i think it's because like when you're talking there i'm actually thinking of of the visual artist brian o'doherty because where i met miranda was this uh when miranda was in serious art center in coven they were restoring um, his murals and Cork Opera House and Sirius commissioned me to make a piece in response to the murals. But just when you were talking about the grid work and in Beckett and, and he also explored, I think he also explored some of, uh, yeah, the, these ideas and this kind of sense of, yeah, the numerical connections and, and in a way there's quite a lot of connections with him. I've actually been thinking a lot about him and his work over the last few days. Like, it's almost like maybe this is, yeah, like just the way that it connects through so many different types of work. And um, yeah, just, uh, yeah, like maybe, maybe that's, maybe it's, it's almost like this kind of, you know, practical approach, you know, which, which I feel is, is throughout a lot of that, of, of that work, but then this real heart, in the, in the center of it, like the heart or the longing or the home or the missing or something. The flesh and blood, yeah. like you had last night in, yeah, in your yeah. piece, you know, with your heart, your yeah. the actual heart on stage. No, cause it, and it's funny, cause I remember my my uncle, talking about my uncles and my aunts today. Anyway, I just think of them when I read the book. I feel like I'm back in the room, chatting away to everybody. It's lovely. Um, but my uncle was a doctor and I made a piece in 2004 called Resuscitate. Um, which was just uh, like how to resuscitate a moment. I don't know, I was being very abstract at the time. And, um, and he was saying to me, you know, the heart muscle only pumps. And I was like, yeah, of course that's obvious, but there's something really beautiful. He said, like, if you put an electrical charge, it can't do it. Like it, it, it either pumps or it does nothing. Um, so that, like, I, I think of him all the time. And when, when, the, when, the, when I read the text about rusty old pumps and, mm -hmm. And then at the, after he says the resurrection, the life, I think he says, and when you're dead, you're dead. But I, we didn't choose that in the show. But yeah, it's just that, that feeling of maybe it's just, yeah, like there's ghosts in the piece. I feel like everywhere. I, yeah, this And religion. You've got a lot of religious yeah, <laughs> imagery Jose, as well. That Jose was really like, I think we should go religious on this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he was like running around, you know, different churches, stealing imagery. <laughs> 
I think we're actually out of time. Um, it has been such a pleasure uh, listening to the two of you talk about, uh, about this piece about dance and joys. I think we'll continue to be haunted by a lot of these <laughs> images and keep coming back. And what Deirdre was saying about residues, I think it's really going to hold. So we hope we'll be able to see this again, but it will continue mm. to, to move around. So see it in Dublin. So yeah, in Dublin. Great. it's going to be a project theatre in November. Tell your friends. <laughs> thank, thank, you so thank you very much. Thank you. Just a quick note on embodiment. Um, I think we all know H.G. Uh, Wells said that uh, we're going to take a five bathroom break or a coffee break. Uh, there will be a break between each of the panels. We'll see you back here in five minutes. Those who are online, please you know, take, a, take a minute. Thanks again. to. Um, it was a really fascinating conversation. Thanks a lot. Actually, you know what? All of this stuff is now wireless. Let's see. Um, yeah. Yeah, that is. Right. So this is me here. 
there. Uh, please, please say something about Wittgenstein being on the notes. <laughs> Hello? Hello? Hi, everyone. If you can take your seats again, we're going to restart just to keep ourselves on time. Um, there's no order here. Can I ask you to take your seats? <laughs> All in this way, but I'm just going to um, uh, hand over to our great friend and neighbor, uh, Joe Hassett. Joe is the least of Joe's accomplishments is that he is a lawyer here in DC. But more importantly, he is a Joyce scholar and a Yates scholar and uh, has a PhD in Anglo-Irish literature from University College Dublin and is our neighbor and friend and anybody who does anything in the world of literature and the arts in Dublin, we'll know and we'll have met and we'll have enjoyed. Um, thanks, Joe. Thanks, Dan. Colleen, thank you very much and what a pleasure to be here. And Dan, welcome back. You've been gone a month now. Yeah, it's been a long time, yeah. <laughs> well, we have met for at least a month, I think. <laughs> great, great to have you back here. It's good that they have us on the early session, isn't it? While everyone's still awake and we're still awake too. <laughs> 
Well, it's a great a kind of conjunction, I think, actually, to have you at this conference, the conference theme being uh, Ulysses in the world. And uh, it's hard to believe, but for 40% of uh, Ulysses' lifetime in the world, uh, you, Dan, have been uh, Ireland's representative to some of the great nations of the world. And uh, at the same time, a, a very serious reader uh, of Ulysses and an explicator of Ulysses. So it, it's a great kind of conjunction and I'm delighted to be a, a part of it. Just to give a little kind of context from which we might take off, it occurs to me that uh, in the 100 years plus of Ulysses' lifetime, um, Ireland's notion <clears throat> of its place in the world has undergone a sea change. And that, that's no uh, shocking uh, statement to any of you. And much of you have a better appreciation of it, perhaps, than I do. But uh, certainly, <clears throat> Ireland <clears throat> went from disowning Ulysses um, to owning it in the most enthusiastic way um, over that course of Ulysses' lifetime. And John McCourt will give us some detail on that. And Dan, of course, has a unique perspective on that. But it's it's certainly true i'm sure that nobody in 1922 in ireland would have foreseen uh what's happening here today and the ireland's cultural representative uh embracing ulysses uh dan of course uh has embraced ulysses uh, uh, i know uh, geraldine and i had the great pleasure of uh, of uh, seeing the paul muldoon gene corlett's uh, immersive uh experience of the dead so there's been a sea change in the way Ireland thinks of itself in relation to Ulysses. And in that same 100 plus year period, uh, there's been a sea change in the way uh, Ireland uh, sees itself in relation to the world. Um, I think it would be fair to say, and others uh, may elaborate on this or contradict it, but uh, when Ulysses was born, uh, Ireland saw itself, I think, as a protector of a distinct, some might even <clears throat> have said pure, a national character or ethos. Uh, and uh, there was a threat to Ireland from ideas from the outside world. And perhaps some of those ideas uh, were expressed in Ulysses. So uh, there's been an interesting change in many respects uh, relating to Ulysses and Ireland over the course of the lifetime of Ulysses. And I wonder, Dan, whether you might have any thought on the degree to which or the manner in which uh, Ulysses has affected uh, Ireland's notion of its own identity. Um, do you have any thoughts on yeah, that? Well, look, I, I certainly do, Joe. And uh, first of all, um, I'm delighted to be sharing this um, platform with Joe because when I was um, involved in the lonely task of uh, writing this book, and Joe's happily brought a copy along. Thank you, Joe. I, I, I wasn't going to. I wasn't going to do that, but uh, I, I'm not an academic, so I didn't have um, a community of scholars to kind of plug into. I was kind of hunkered down on S Street uh, during the uh, during the height of the pandemic, and um, I did send one chapter uh, to Colleen who happily um sort of you know gave it gave it a green light and told me it was it, it was it was good and it should be published and but i i joe is the one that i i use most often i sent a lot of quite a few chapters uh, to joe for comment and he always came back with uh, helpful comments all of which i'm happy to say uh, well i know he's a lawyer so i decided it was better to, it's always better to to, to uh, take the advice of your lawyer no matter what no matter what the circumstances might be so thank you joe for that but no look um i i was involved at the very beginning of the Irish state's embrace of Ulysses. Because if you read the documents in Irish foreign policy, um, there's a document there from the 30s when Eamon de Valera just become um, Taoiseach in 1932, three, and he was on his way to a, a League of Nations meeting, or on his way back, and he was passing through Paris. And the then representative in Paris suggested to him that it might be a good thing to meet James Joyce. Now, de Valera, by the way, is an exact contemporary of Joyce's. He was born in, in May 
of 1882. So he was three months younger than James Joyce, but they were exact contemporaries. And de Valera's response was no, he didn't want to meet Joyce. Okay. So turn the clock forward 50 years. I was in New Delhi, 1982, the centenary of the birth of James Joyce. And the Department of Foreign Affairs sent out a small exhibition of pop ups, I think we call them now, about 20, on the life and work of James Joyce. Now, the focus was more on the portrait of the artist as a young man and Dubliners. Ulysses was still, was only maybe one or two panels of what Ulysses. So we still weren't maybe 100% embracing Ulysses. But for the first time, the state was trying to, you know, um, jump on the bandwagon, you know, the James Joyce bandwagon. And nothing wrong with that, by the way. Um, so I, at that stage, um, I remember being invited uh, to the All India English Teachers uh, Conference um, in New Delhi that year by a, a wonderful Indian novelist, Shaman Nahal, who wrote a great book about the partition of India called The Zadi. And he asked me to give a talk. And I gave a talk on, on James Joyce and the Ireland of his time. And, and that was the first time that I can recall. I mean, I was, I was a young diplomat at the time. I was only been four years in the Department of Foreign Affairs. But I remember, um, you know, getting a response from an audience in New Delhi to the work and life of James Joyce. And that sort of convinced me, and it's become a lifelong uh, understanding of the value to Ireland of our literature. And, you know, I have studied the period between 1890 and 1930 would be my kind of focal point for my study of Irish history. And, um, I now call that the Gilded Age, Ireland's Gilded Age. The Gilded Age in America involved huge economic expansion. The, uh, you know, the Belle Epoque in Europe was the age of imperialism. It was the apogee of British and French imperialism, German imperialism. Uh, in Ireland, it wasn't either prosperity or, um, or, um, or, or imperial achievement. It was more political achievement in the creation of an independent Irish state in 1922, which I've been proud to represent for 44 of 100 years. Uh, and secondly, huge literary achievement. And I think that by the 1980s, we were willing, the state was willing to embrace that literary achievement, perhaps even more than the political achievement, because the political achievement was still a subject of debate because of the impact of the troubles in Northern Ireland. But the literary achievement became a mainstay of the way Ireland celebrated itself and its achievements in, in the wider world. And I remember the last time I was in Dublin uh, before the, well, I, the last time I, 2019 I was in Dublin and I was already working on the book. And I wandered into the church on Western Row, um, which is the set, one of the settings for, for, for episode five, for, for, um, um, for the Lotus Eaters. And in that church, there's a plaque noting the fact that James Joyce's Ulysses was set partly in the church. Now, if you, now, if you, if you, if you read the Lotus Eaters, uh, it's not exactly a, a pain of praise to Irish Catholicism. It's a bloom in very skeptical uh, mood about the... Uh, you know, the doctrines and the practices of, of the Catholic Church, of which he was nominally a member, although obviously not a very observant one. So that to me was a kind of a, you know, was a penny drop moment where I sort of realized that even, you know, a Catholic Church in, in, in Dublin today is actually proud of the fact that it's associated with the work and, and the life of James Joyce. I wonder, do you have any sense, Dan, or, uh, or in that sense, but do you have a sense as to whether and to what extent the very existence of Joyce's novel uh, contributed to that change um, in the attitude of the Irish people to the world, to the church, to the idea of Irish nationality. Well, I don't, I don't know about that, but I, it was actually in this university um, a few years ago when I was giving a talk at Colleen's uh, class, um, where he was teaching Ulysses, and I, I gave a talk on the novel. And at the end of the talk, um, one of the students asked me a question. And the question was, what would James Joyce have made of Brexit? And my answer was, well, if you look at the last three words of Ulysses, we were reminded today 
that the last three words are not, I will, yes, but Trieste, Zurich, and Paris, which means that Joyce was purposely highlighting the fact that he was, he had written this book in three European cities at a time when Europe was going through enormous turmoil between 1914 and 1921. So, and I think that was significant. And it's also, so I went on in that answer to say that Joyce left Ireland because, as he expresses it in a portrait, he, he wanted to escape the nets of language, nationality, and religion, which were all powerful at that time uh, in the Ireland that James Joyce left. And he purposely fled to almost as far away in Europe as you could realistically go uh, to Trieste on the edge of the Austro-Hungarian Empire in order to be able to view Ireland from a distance and not to be hemmed in by the nets of language, nationality, and religion, but rather to be able to see those things more clearly from afar. And that, I think, is James Joyce's great gift to Ireland, that he left us a forensic portrait of the Ireland that he left, which also happened to be, by coincidence, an Ireland on the cusp of dramatic political change. And I make the point in the book, and I've made it in talks and, and, and essays since then, that 1904 is positioned halfway between the death of Parnell and the Easter Rising. And that's not the reason why Joyce set the book in 1904. We know that that was a more personal thing. It was the, you know, the day he, he had his first, um, he first walked out, uh, as you put it to me once, uh, with, uh, with Nora Barnacle. Um, um, and that's, of course, that's a translation of, of the Irish, because the Irish for, for going out with somebody is to, uh, they're walking out together. And in fact, my mother used to say if someone dwelled too long before popping the question, he's going to walk the feet off her. <laughs> so, but, but the point is that, that, that it is the case, 1904 is at that cusp where, and I, and I also said that I think this one way of looking at Ulysses is it's an energy for the dying world of parliamentary nationalism and partner like nationalism. And there's not much of a, a nod towards the new world of a more advanced nationalism, which you got when Joyce was actually writing the novel and doesn't seem to have taken much interest in what was going on around at that time because he had other things on his mind. He was writing Ulysses. You, have, you, uh, you can't blame him for not following daily developments in the Irish Revolution. But the fact is that, that 1904 was the year when Arthur Griffith published The Resurrection of Hungary. And the ideas in that book, which at the time were kind of far out and uh, you know, could be, could be um, deprecated by people like D.P. Moran in The Leader, who referred to uh, you know, the, the, the then Sinn Féin party of Arthur Griffith as the Green Hungarian Band, he called it, because of, um, because of the, the effort that, that Griffith made to conjure up an image of Ireland's future using the example of how Hungary had managed to achieve a, um, a, a dual monarchy within the Austro-Hungarian Empire back in the 1860s. So, so it seems to me that, 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 that Ireland has, has grown in a way that we now recognize ourselves in Ulysses the way we would have been offended 100 years ago to be told, or even 50 years ago to be told that, yeah, that's Ireland. We would have said, no, 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 no. Ireland's a, a, a much more pious, conventional place. Irish women don't think like Molly Bloom thinks in the soliloquy. Uh, Irish men uh, don't behave the way Leopold Bloom behaves on Sandy Mount's Strand in the Norfolk episode. So, so we, we have started to, and I think because the country has grown up more in the last 40 years, uh, and I think Nick Quaife mentioned last night the global Ireland um, policy, which I think is a reflection of the fact that we now understand that we're no longer the struggling country we were back in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and even into more, a more recent decade, that we're now a country that has, has come into its own and we now have responsibilities. And, and um, Geraldine, who's here, um, uh, sir, uh, Geraldine Bernays, and, you know, spent the last two years representing Ireland on the Security Council. And I think this time on the Security Council, we really did stand up and, and perform like a fully developed country. Whereas I, I, my sense is that in previous times we were on the Security Council, we were still 
in that position of thinking of ourselves as being outsiders. Now I think we, we recognize that we are at the heart of things and we want to play our part at the heart of things. And that's why I think we're now more comfortable with the kind of complex presentation of Ireland that you get in James Joyce's Ulysses. Let me go back and uh, ask you a little bit about the degree to which or not uh, the very existence of Ulysses has contributed to bringing about that change. Now, Auden famously said in the Yeats context for poetry makes nothing happen. But uh, a lot of you know that Dan is a great uh, student and reader and performer of the Cy Cyclops episode. But I wonder, could one say that the portrayal of the citizen in Cyclops as an extreme embodiment of an extreme view of nationalism and of uh, prejudice, uh, in contrast to Bloom as a, in a way of a representation of openness to other, um, could it be said that uh, Pache on uh, the very existence of Ulysses has been a contributing factor in the creation of an Ireland that's less inwardly focused on yep. its nationalism and is less prejudiced and less open to ideas that uh, at the time it was published uh, were thought to be a menace to yep. Irish culture. Well, I look, um, <sighs> literature, among its other qualities and virtues, is that it does give every society a window through which to observe itself. And all great writers write from some sort of social, all, all writers, I guess, write from some kind of social context. And they, they give us a view of the world around us, which we wouldn't have access to were it not for the writers engaging in their creative activity of writing the novel and publishing and so forth. And the same is true with this great novel, it does, and it's a massive novel. So it, it's not one, I mean, many other novels were, uh, were published in 1922. I'm sure there were other Irish novels published that year, but they've all disappeared from view. But Ulysses is, is, a, is a kind of a, it's a Leviathan that you can't ignore. And, 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 and therefore, I, I think it has been um, a reference point for a particular view of Ireland, a more refined warts and all um you know a portrait of ireland that's a realistic one to to a to a large degree although you can never be fully realistic but but it is at least a, a, an effort to present the country in the round rather than as a kind of a one-dimensional um the, the way in which uh, nationalist ide ideology would have wanted to present ireland was not the way in which Joyce presented Ireland in Ulysses because had he presented it in that way, Ulysses would have been forgotten within a year. <laughs> so the quality of Ulysses is that it's a it's a permanent monument. It's it, it's like I mean, Joyce has a very modest monument in stone in Dublin on Stevens Green because uh, we don't we don't really go for producing or erecting enormous uh, enormous monuments in Ireland um, um, at least in the twentieth and twenty first centuries. Um, but he does have a monument in the form of Ulysses. And now Molly, the, the museum in Dublin, which um, celebrates um, uh, Irish literature and with a, with a primary focus on Ulysses. Uh, so he, he is a monumental figure. And it's a bit like um, if, you're, if you're British, for example, you can't ignore Shakespeare because there's no way of doing it. You just can't, it can't be done. And I think in Ireland, you can't ignore Yeats and Joyce, which is why I've started to call what I also call our Gilded Age, the age of Yeats and Joyce. And now that we enter the second century of Irish independence, I think those writers will become even more important in remembering the era that produced them and the things that happened during that era, the great literary achievements of that period, and also the great political achievements which um, Irish independence represented because my argument about Irish independence is that whatever you think about it, it was an enormous achievement for a country with at that stage, 5 million people maybe to actually extract its independence, not from an empire that had collapsed during the first world war or after the first world war, which was the case with most of the countries 
I became independent in 1918, 1920. Became independent because the empire they had belonged to collapsed, and their independence was a product of that collapse. In the Irish case, um, the Irish independence struggle was conducted against the wishes of a country that had been victorious in the greatest war in human history to that time, in the First World War. And therefore, that achievement is really one that I think is one of the reasons why um, we still command uh, admiration around the world. And I've, I've come across African and Asian ambassadors, my different postings, who've told me just how important uh, Ireland was to them as an example of how you could actually map a course to freedom, even against the might of a powerful empire like the British Empire that Ireland left 100 years ago this year. Well, and of course, India, I mean, the, the parallels uh, that yeah. India saw in Irish independence are, are fascinating. It's something I, I learned from reading my friend Sunil Kulani's book is that uh, Annie Bazan was the head of the Congress Party she for, was. for 10 years. She was. But she did not speak any. Uh, and Margaret Indian Cousins was dialect. also involved. She was another uh, Irish woman who went out there and became involved in, in the Congress Party. The Congress Party was, was to a large extent, modeled on the Irish Parliamentary Party. Yeah, very interesting. But let me go back and push a little bit more on the notion that uh, uh, Bloom, say take, say take the characters of Bloom and the citizen in Cyclops. Yeah. Um, were they, I might ask it this way, because I know one of the ways Ulysses has traveled in the world is with you. <laughs> it's bringing it, bringing it, well, but, 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 but bringing it to the attention of people in the yeah. countries to which you were Ireland's, Ireland's yeah. accredited representative. And I wonder, is it, maybe you'd say a word about how uh, Bloom's example, uh, or the example of Bloom, uh, or Bloom as the character, uh, is uh, something that's useful to you as an Irish diplomat or as a, as a representative of Irish culture? Well, you know, I mean, first of all, I've always been a fan of the Cyclops episode. And in fact, heretically, and I say it in this company very guardedly and advisedly, uh, probably unadvisedly, I'll be careful now. Uh, I say to people, well, if you don't think you can read the whole of Ulysses, and I, I don't blame people for being intimidated by, you know, even the length of the book, but also the complexity and the different styles in which it's written. I say, well, read the Cyclops episode because it will give you a very good flavor of the brilliance of Joyce's writing. And it's also a very enjoyable, lively chapter it's got great dialogue, it's got wonderful one-liners. Um, the narrator is a nasty piece of work, but he's fun. <laughs> and you can't, uh, it's hard to, um, uh, to ignore him, uh, no man. Um, I say, and also you, you also get this extraordinary debate about national identity, which for me at least is not just about Ireland, it's about national identity across the board. And when I was in Germany, I, always at my Bloomsday events, always quoted the line where the citizen asks Bloom, what is your nation, Mr. Bloom, if I may ask? And Bloom says, Ireland, I was born here, Ireland. Now I was saying that in a country which had suffered enormous trauma because it had refused to accept that notion of nationality and that it had refused to accept that people of Jewish religion, Jewish heritage, who had been generations living on, on the territory, born, died generations on, on the territory of Germany. 20th century Germany, for a time, refused to accept that they were proper Germans. And I, so I, I made that point all over the place, that, 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 that Bloom is, a, is an example of a version of national identity, which I think would be profitably embraced by countries. And even today now, we're back in a situation where national identity is again, we, we thought we were in an era of openness and tolerance. We are in Ireland, but elsewhere around the place you have, even in Scandinavia now, you've got these nativist parties who are kind of, you know, pushing back against the notion of a multicultural, multi-ethnic society. Happily in Ireland, we're still celebrating that, 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 that reality. Um, so this year, um, it, it occurred to me after I published the book that Bloom 
was becoming an even more important example to the world than I had anticipated when I was writing the book uh, in 2020 and 2021. Because Bloom is this character who, who pushes back. I mean, there's only one place in the book where, in Ulysses where Bloom asserts himself. And that is in the Cyclops episode when he's goaded by the citizen and others in the pub, in Barney Kiernan's pub on Little Britain Street, which is a, a rather humorous uh, location for, for a debate about Irish, uh, about Irish identity, Little Britain Street. I, I said, I, I spoke at the, at the embassy in Mexico, a, a webinar they did last week, and I said, be a bit like um, discussing Mexican identity in a place called Little Spain Street. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, so finally, when Bloom, the very diffident, cautious, careful, excessively prudent individual, understated, hits back and he says, force, hatred, history, all that. That is no life for a man and a woman. When it's the opposite of that, that's really life. What says Alf? Love, I mean the opposite of hatred. So I actually wrote a, a piece for the, for the Washington Post, which was published at the end of January this year, which I said that, that these principles of pushing back against force, hatred, and history, by which Joyce meant the abuse of history, uh, had become, again, issued for the 21st century. And remember, I published that piece when the war in Ukraine was, hadn't, hadn't broken out, but it was, certainly, it was certainly on the way, and everyone knew it. Um, and I made the point that, you know, Russia had unleashed force against Ukraine, on the, in the belief, Putin's belief that force could determine everything. All you had to do was ab apply force and you get what you wanted. He's unleashed hatred against Ukrainians, regarding them all as fascists, therefore fair game for, you know, for war crimes um, in, in, in that scenario. And also, he's based everything on an abuse of history, on a version of history which assumes that Ukraine doesn't have a history. Ukraine's history is actually Russian history, and that Ukrainian history is a kind of a is a perversion, is a is fake history, right? So, for me, that was an example of how, even after I wrote this book, I started to see some of the principles that go through Ulysses as being maybe more relevant than I imagined, even when I wrote it. And I also also used. Bloom's, you know, if people talk a lot about narcissism these days because of events in this city, I won't name them, but you know what I mean. Um, but Bloom is the ultimate anti-narcissist because he's, he's so self-contained and doesn't, apart from the one episode in, in Cyclops where he asserts himself, he basically, he, he maneuvers around Dublin and keeps out of trouble and keeps his views to himself and He's a, he's a, he's a, he has an unfaithful wife. He's unsuccessful in his business as a, an advertising salesman. And yet he takes a kind of a, a quiet pleasure in life without needing to be up there on a soapbox performing the way the citizen does. So, and then the other thing I think I told you about, uh, I, I came across, after I'd finished the book, I came across this reference, which I hadn't really noticed before in, in Eumaeus to the idea of everyone having a, having a guaranteed income. This is the, you know, the, uh, the basic minimum income, which is, and, and Bloom puts it at 300 pounds a year, which I, I looked it up and it would be $40,000 today. So I think that might, might create a few issues, all right. But, but nonetheless, here you have Bloom arguing for a basic minimum income, a, a principle that's now being looked at in different places around the world. It might be a, one of the solutions to dealing with the, the problems of, of the 21st century. Well, I, I love the way you see uh, Bloom's uh, embrace of the other as, as a great legacy of, of Ulysses. And, and I would read Bloom's I was born here comment in the context of his overall notion of love, not hatred, and acceptance of yeah. other people. Uh, yeah. And in terms of the born here thing, I think of Shaw, who had the interesting comment that uh, uh, it wasn't an Irish uh, 
ethnic identity that shaped uh, people in Ireland. But he said the Irish climate could affect you more <laughs> than anything else uh, very quickly. And I think that's a way of saying that it's the Irish culture uh, that's important and that people who want to be part of the Irish culture are part of the Irish community. And so that one of the great things about Ireland today, which many of you know more about than I do, is the tremendous influx of uh, new cultures into Ireland uh, and people of those cultures who uh, see themselves very proudly as being Irish. So it's given Ireland a tremendous uh, vitality, uh, cultural and otherwise. And uh, I think it's fair to give Joyce and Ulysses credit for that, in some credit, not 100% credit, but some credit for that notion as expressed by Bloom of the importance of love for other people and welcoming of other people. Yeah, and in uh, fact, in, in, in the Umeus episode, he he talks about, he says, uh, he says, you have to look at both sides of the story. He's this great sort of uh, moderate. He's the ultimate moderate. You have to look at both sides of the story. He said, it doesn't make any sense to hate somebody because they live down the street and speak a different vernacular, so to speak. <laughs> and then he has this wonderful line about revolution should come on the Jew installments plan. <laughs> now, I don't know many revolutionaries who would, who would sort of believe that. But actually, when you think about it, uh, the Jew installments plan is not a bad way. You know, it's pragmatic, step by step, you know, uh, only, only, only bite off as much as you can chew. Uh, and move forward in that way. So, so Bloom, I think, is a is a political philosopher, actually. Agreed. And in fact, he he uh, we uh, we know from Cersei that he he had ambitions uh, to stand for election, and he has a wonderful um, uh, he, he has a wonderful um, uh, manifesto, which you'll find in, in Cersei, and it's about uh, um, three acres and a cow for every child of nature, which I said sounds a bit like California in the 1960s, but anyway, and, and it's sort of free love and a free society and a free world and all these things. It, it's, I, I actually had Governor Martin O'Malley read it at our Bloomsday uh, this um, um, June gone by because I thought he was, the, he, was the, he was a perfect person as a former, as a politician to, to read Bloom's wonderful political manifesto. Well, I think uh, it's interesting um to think of the fact that uh, here we are 100 years after Ulysses, it's so interesting to have uh, you participating in this conference and to have uh, Geraldine and Nick here. And over the course of your time here as ambassador recently, your participation uh, in so many uh, Georgetown Global Irish Studies events and Solus Nua events, and I wonder um, since part of the theme of the conference was to look toward the future, um, what you might see uh, as the future of cooperation between the academic world of Joyce or the academic, the world of academics who love Joyce and the public presentation of Ireland through its diplomacy and otherwise, uh, how do you see the future of that as, as progressing? You know, um, we're in a world today where um, expertise and knowledge is often dismissed and uh, instinct is seen as the, uh, the, the more powerful driver of, of, um, of, of the world around us. And, 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 you know, we've seen all these, um, you know, this kind of anti-elite um, thinking that's going on and, and populist elements exploiting the, you know, the resentment that people have and that, that people feel about um, those who are, who are not like them, who are looking down on them and so forth. So I think, I think academics have a real um, responsibility uh, to get out there and communicate. They need to communicate to themselves, by the way, because that's how scholarship kind of develops. But I do think there's also a, uh, a continuing need to, 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 to write and to communicate with people who are not part of the academy, people who are, and, and I, I wrote this book and I have other books in mind to write as well. I, and I wrote it um, because I wanted to, and I say in it that I, I, I understand why academics write different books from this, you know, because academics and students need to delve deeper. 
into the core of Ulysses and find things that I couldn't couldn't possibly be able to spot. But I do think that there's a need to to communicate with people who are serious readers, but maybe alienated by things that appear to be too forbidding for them. So that's why I told people, if you don't feel you can read this book in its entirety, just read the chapters that, and I recommended eight chapters, and then I recommended three, and then one finally, Cyclops. So, you know, and then I recommend, if you can't read this book, then, you just re read, yes. then read this. <laughs> this is kind of a greatest hits package. It has all the best quotes in it, I promise. Okay. <laughs> so look, I mean, so look, that's the, that's the, that's the challenge. It's a challenge for, not just for academia, but for government as well. I mean, how to communicate to people, how to win the argument against people who will exploit, um, they will try to propagate ignorance in order to advance their own ends. So I think there's a, there's a, there's a big battle to be fought really all over the world um, to kind of, to ensure that we continue to live in a world driven by enlightenment values rather than the kind of values that Leopold Bloom pushes back against in Cyclops and, and throughout the novel. And by the way, I do want to make a point about Michael Cusack, the citizen. I mean, obviously, the citizen is a caricature. So I don't, I don't think it's fair to, to see the citizen as an exact historical replica of of the real Michael Cusack, who is a colorful character, no doubt, but he did come up with one of the ideas that has continued to shape Ireland to this day, and that is founding the Gaelic Athletic Association, which is, if you look at the other elements that changed Ireland in that period, in Ireland's Gilded Age, the age of Yeats and Joyce, obviously the literary uh, your revival was important. The Gaelic League was very important politically, but the GAA has had the most lasting impact uh, on Ireland. And today it continues to be a mainstay of Irish identity uh, and one that's unique in that no other country in Europe certainly has and has national sports that continue to be the most popular sports in, in those countries. And we have that. So it's a, that's a legacy of Michael Cusack. The other thing is, of course, what Joyce was trying to do was he was trying to to examine national identity by, by putting Bloom, the reasonable, moderate, rational, sensible individual, the good man, opposite a caricatured version of the Cyclops, you know, the monster uh, in Cyclops. And he does that brilliantly in uh, that chapter. Um, but we have to remember that it is a caricature and that it's not a fair, I mean, you know, it's not a fair, in fact, I, I feel that D.P. Moran might, might be the real target. But of course, in, in 1922, uh, Moran was still alive and kicking and would have, would have undoubtedly taken Joyce to court had he been caricatured in Ulysses, whereas Michael Cusack was, 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 you know, was safely dead and, and therefore uh, couldn't take any action against Joyce. But, but he was pushing back against that Irish Ireland idea. The, you know, the idea... And that's the important point. Yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah D.P. Moran had was that Irish identity had to be Catholic and Irish in terms of being of the soil of Ireland for generations and operating through the Irish language. That, 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 that was D.P. Warren's kind of idea. Of, and that was completely, that was anathema uh, to James Joyce. Uh, and that battle, if you like, has been fought over the last hundred years. And I'm happy to say that, you know, at the moment at least, uh, the Joyce version of Irish identity has triumphed now you know things can change and we can't assume that ireland won't go down the road of other countries that have become more narrowly focused in recent times um <laughs> i i am I'm, I'm still in ambassadorial I mode you know i can't buy i i, I, I won't cut loose for another few cough. months you know <laughs> been seized with a little bit of a cough there <laughs> but isn't that but, great but, uh, but that's in europe as well by the way it's not not just not just in in <laughs> In other places, it's in Europe as well. It's in Europe, you know. It's in Europe. <laughs> well, you know, in, in, I'm in all the world from China to Peru, as Samuel Johnson once wrote. <laughs> I'm delighted, really, to, to to hear the way you've uh, encapsulated the notion of uh, 
the Cyclops chapter and the version of nationalism in it uh, is, a, is embodied in that particular character uh, without regard to who may have been a real life correspondent of, of that character or not, but of that attitude, of, of that, uh, the, the quintessence of nationalism or, or of over-nationalist nationalist thought in that character uh, was a great achievement by Joyce in holding that up as an example of what not to be, and Bloom is an example of what to be, and I, I really think that is a great achievement of the novel Ulysses, and it's one that uh, is worth uh, noting in this notion of uh, Ulysses in the world. And I guess maybe just to touch another base of uh, Colleen's uh, uh, setting out of the theme of the conference was uh, a, a, gl a global world. Wh where is Ulysses in a, in a global world? And, and maybe one segue into that is uh, not to complicate it, but um, I I've seen recently uh, uh, Ruin McGann's uh, wonderful film on RTE of uh, 100 Years of Ulysses. And, uh, and, and he's, in a way, advancing the ideas of my great friend and the great loss to Ireland and the world, Frank Callanan, oh, yeah. um, that, that Ulysses was, uh, well, Frank would say, a European novel. And I, I guess you can be a European novel and an Irish novel at the same time, but to, to try and reduce this uh, wandering uh, stream of consciousness to a question, two questions. Do you see Ulysses in any respect as a European novel? And then uh, is it a global uh, novel or a, a uh, harbinger of a global novel? Yes, I, I think clearly Joyce wanted to write a European novel set anchored deeply in Ireland, which is what he did. Um, the best example of that is when I was in Germany, uh, I was in Germany the year that Ulysses went out of copyrights in, um, 2011 and within, within a week, two German radio stations had produced complete dramatizations of Ulysses. One of them did it for, for, um, a half an hour a day for a number of months. And the other one did it on one weekend, and I took part in that, in the launch of that in Berlin. And it was marvelous to be able to, to see a German audience turning up to listen to uh, the first episode of, of Ulysses being done on, 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 on stage by the actors, and then tuning in for the following few months to listen to the daily dramatizations of James Joyce's Ulysses. So... Yes, it, it's a novel that commands attention all over Europe and in America, by the way. I mean, honestly, I can't count the number of first editions of Ulysses that I've seen in the libraries of American universities and other institutions where books are held in esteem. I mean, it's extraordinary. There's, there must be, I, I'm, I'm sure someone could, 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 could do them sums on this, but, but it must be a good percentage of the the, the um, surviving copies the surviving um, copies from among the thousand that were that were published in the first edition must be in American universities and not just that but I've I mean I've seen I've seen a, quite a number of of um, other um, you know I mean I've seen I think Yeats's Eastern 1916 was published in 25 copies I've seen about six of them in American universities already so 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 this is an extraordinary um, advantage for for Ireland that that we have this literary tradition that that, that commands attention and I, I'm teaching a class now at New York University at Glucksman Ireland House called Literature as History Ireland 1880 to 1940 and half of my students are are from backgrounds that are clearly not Irish at all but they are drawn to uh, Irish studies by the renown of our literature and I think that's great. Um, benefit for us so so yes it's a european novel is it a global novel uh well i i certainly managed to organize bloomsday events the four years i was in malaysia which after all is a, an islamic country um you know where, where where a character who's a who's a hungarian jew might not be you know their kind of ideal 
icon, but but I managed to do that, and there was a lot of interest in, in Ulysses also in, in Malaysia. So so point I think is that that this novel is such a gigantic um, presence in the world that I think it will continue to attract people to it. I also taught a course recently at the Rosenbach uh, Library in uh, Philadelphia, where the original manuscript of Ulysses is located, and there were people there. Some of them were reading it for the first time. Some had, had read it during the pandemic. They had made it a pandemic project to read it. Others were, had read it 10 or 15 times. So this is a novel that has depths to it that, that seem to be um, limitless. And where even I, having read it umpteen times, when I go back now, I find new things in it, including the reference to the basic minimum income. <laughs> well, that's maybe a good place. Which now that I'm retired, I'm now in favor <laughs> of. Good place to end it. Let's hear it for the uh, basic uh, guaranteed income. And uh, let's hear it for Dan. It's so nice to have him here and for Colleen in this wonderful conference. So, uh, and thank and and for all of you for being here. Thanks very much. Thanks, uh, Joe and Dan. Again, we'll take about five minutes um, for a coffee break. The coffee just arrived. There are cookies and everything. And we'll see you back here in five minutes. I'll be yelling at you. Or Nathan. Maybe my colleague Nathan will let you will yell at you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank 
Yeah, so I want to share The chair, maybe for yes. yeah. Uh, 
Okay. Yes. Hi, everybody. I I promised I would um, I promised I would yell at you. Um. Will you take your seats? We're going to start again. We have a, a packed schedule for the day. And uh, the sooner we start, the sooner we get to lunch uh, after this. So um, if we get started, I have no authority in this room. <laughs> Nobody listens to me. Is that sound good? Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. They're good. They're uh, Hi, everyone, and welcome back. Colleen's right. An unruly set, isn't it? Yeah. Unruly <laughs> set, yeah. <laughs> All right, everybody. I'm going to hand you over to my fantastic colleague, uh, Nathan Hensley, who is, teaches in the English department alongside me, and he is going to be the chair for uh, this next panel. And um, we will uh, enjoy a really great discussion. So thanks, Nathan. Yeah, my name is Nathan Hensley. I teach in the English department here. I'm really honored to play a very tiny bit part in all of this wonderful uh, discussion and event today. So um, in the interest of time and to get us towards lunch, I'm going to um, use a, a digital watch to make sure that we stay to time. And um, I'm going to read abbreviated biographies of our three speakers and then uh, let it roll from there. So um, let me start. We're switching up the order a little bit from the program, and we'll start with um, Catherine O'Callaghan. Catherine O'Callaghan lectures on James Joyce, modernism, Irish literature, and the role of music in novels in the English department at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. She's an elected member of the Board of Trustees of the International Joyce Foundation. She's the editor of Essays on Music and Language in Modernist Literature, Musical Modernism, and the co-editor with Una Frawley of Memory Ireland, Volume 4, James Joyce and Cultural Memory. Um, and uh, I will let the authors read the title of their own papers when they go, if that's okay. Um, our second speaker uh, will be Gregory Baker. Gregory Baker is Associate Professor of English and Director of Irish Studies at the Catholic University of America, our neighbors. Um, his book, Classics and uh, Celtic Literary Modernism, Yeats, Joyce, McDermott, and Jones, was published in February 2022 with Cambridge University Press. Other recent publications include work on the Scottish nationalists and Lalaphone translator, Douglas C.C. Young, as well as the annotated bibliography for volume five of the Oxford History of Classical Reception in England. Um, our final speaker, uh, Barry McRae, is a novelist and scholar of comparative literature, in addition to being the Keogh Family Chair of Irish Studies and Professor of Comparative Literature um, at Notre Dame with appointments in Romance Languages and Literatures in, um, and Irish Language and Literature. Excuse me, I botched that. With appoint appointments in Romance Languages and Literature and Irish Language and Literature. Um, his, uh, he's the author of three books, Languages of the Night, uh, In the Company of Strangers, and The First Verse, all of which um, have been awarded uh, multiple times. Um, so these are our three distinguished speakers, and I will now and make room for Catherine. Catherine, thanks. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Great. In the mel melodic term, far falling, James Joyce combines several of his most potent literary tropes. The word brings to mind the seven times repeated falling of the final passages of the dead and the pervasive spatial motif of a call from afar or a far calling 
which can be found across all, all of his texts. A rich and suggestive portmanteau neologism, far falling evokes the influence and impact of exile, both in space and in time, which concerned James Joyce. This nodal point provides a starting point from which to consider the significance of our own temporal distance as far fallen readers from the 1922 publication of Ulysses. So let's take a look at the context in which the term appears. So this is from the Aunt and the Grace Hopper section of Finnegan's Wake, which is filled with many aspects of the insect world. In several passages, butterflies abound. Joyce delights in his good Schmetterling of entomology. The German for butterfly is in there, Schmetterling, combined with the smattering of butterfly etymologies. So the aunt, who's like the aunt of um, Aesop's fable, wears Papillonian babushkis, combining the Latin butterfly, Papilio, and the Russian, babochka. And in nearby passages, we find Norwegian summerfug, uh, the Romanian, the French, the Spanish, Mariposa, the Hungarian, and the ancient Greek psyche, which of course also means soul. So the context of the word far falling here confirms the presence also of the Italian butterfly farfalla in far falling. So we find not only spatial and temporal distance in this term, but the metaphoric and catalytic, catalytic essence signified by the butterfly. Writer Rebecca Solnit refers to the butterfly as the sentient cousin of the flower. In the next section, I will suggest that flower and butterfly combine in Joyce's Ulysses in the figure of Leopold Bloom, a man who thinks in the language of flowers and ponders, as does Stephen Dedalus, the concept of the transmigration of souls or psyches. His pen friend Martha calls him Mr. Flower, which exaggerates the flower aspect of his name, but he is also addressed as Papley by his daughter. Papley is a fairly striking use of a word which I have struggled to find anywhere else at all. Papley has traditionally been glossed as Hungarian, but Hungarian colleagues assure me it is not. A Hungarian translation of Ulysses chooses Papuli. Bloom himself calls his own Hungarian father Papa, closer to how Joyce's sisters referred to their father, Papi. Um, a more qualified suggestion is that the word combines the Hungarian papa with the diminutive suffix of Austrian or German origin, li. Uh, a colleague suggested to me that perhaps Millie has converted papi or papa to rhyme back to her own name, Millie to papli. But that is not suggested anywhere in the text. However, noting the Latin papilio for butterfly in the word papli opens us up to both the butterfly and the flower in papli bloom. The first instance of Papley is in the Telemachus episode. It is the endearing way in which Millie addresses her father in the letter which she sends home from Mullingar, dearest Papley. The letter ends with, please excuse, uh, P.S., excuse bad handwriting, uh, sorry, excuse bad writing, I'm in hurry, bye-bye, M. This reading of the letter comes direct, directly just after the discussion on the word metempsychosis between Leopold and Molly Bloom. In other words, just after a discussion on the transmigration of souls. Bloom lets the phrase Papley resonate in his mind again in the Hades episode while traveling in the carriage. Still, she's a dear girl, soon to be a woman, Mullingar, dearest Papley, young student. This leitmotif returns in the Nausicaa episode. Little hand it was, now big, dearest Papley. In the next episode, Oxen of the Sun, we hear the name from Bannon, Blue, Cage's ads, Photos, Papley. When in the Circe episode, um, in which the theme of metamorphosis is ever present, Millie appears, Mool, uh, Bloom confuses his daughter for her mother, Molly. Molly in green is a hibernicized little red riding hood. She says, my, it's Papley, but oh Papley, how old you've grown. And Bello, now changed from Bella, responds, changed, eh? Bello not only refers to Bloom as Papley, but uses the spelling which Millie used in her letter, bye-bye. We'll manure you, Mr. Flower, bye-bye, Poldy, bye-bye, Papley. Bloom is thoroughly fragmented here, seen through the prism of the names bestowed on him by Martha, 
Mr. Flower, Molly, Poldy, and Millie, Papley. The manner in which Papley repeats is a good example of the action of the leitmotif in Joyce's writing, repeated terms or phrases which call to each other across the book, producing a pattern of distant echoes and returns, perhaps something um, similar to what we saw in the dance last night. We first see the term Papley is repeating in Bloom's mind through the day, and we can conclude it is of some significance to him. When the student Bannon apparently thinks it to himself to identify Bloom, the reader can then cast their mind back to the Calypso letter to understand that this is the Bannon Millie was writing about and that he has given the nickname photo for her. The final two appearances of Papley allow us to understand why the word has such power for Bloom. Two treasures kept from Millie's childhood are described in the Ithaca episode. Uh, the first one is an illustration of Papley with the title Papley. Um, we are given a verbal rendition of it in the text. And what you see here um, is the artist Richard, ha Richard Hamilton's drawing of Papley as described um, in the text. Um, secondly, we have a letter which Bloom keeps also, which is phonetically spelled out to us by the na narrative voice as though it is dictating to the child or perhaps mimicking the child's need to carefully distinguish letters and capitalizations. Um, so we have dated small M Monday reading capital P, Papley, comma, capital H, how are you, note of interrogation, capital I, I am very well, full stop, new paragraph, Signature with flourishes, capital M, Millie, no stop. Here we get an example of how Ulysses works through a process of retrospective understanding, which Fritz Sen has so carefully elaborated on. We only know with the final utterances of the leitmotif, the depth of its significance for Bloom, that for him, the young woman writing to him from Mullingar is not only shadowed by what's to come, her transformation into a woman, but by the child of the past that he remembers. Millie has produced an image of her Papley, but what of the books? What might Papilio Ulysses look like? So here is Papilio Ulysses in all of its blue glory, um, the Ulysses butterfly, um, also known as the Blue Emperor, a large swallowtail butterfly. It takes its name, much like our book, from the Greek hero Odysseus. The blue of this Ulysses butterfly is at the core of the book. The most striking blue of Ulysses is famously the cover of its first edition, as uh, Coley noted earlier. Sylvia Beach recounted the difficulties of achieving um, Joyce's desire to dress the book in the colour of the Greek flag. The book's printer, Durantier, made several journeys to Paris to match the colours to the flag, which was flying at Shakespeare and Company in honour of Odysseus. Eventually, the blue was found in Germany, but on the wrong paper. And so... The colour was lithographed on white cardboard to create what Joyce in Finnegan's Wake called his uselessly unreadable blue book of Eccles and bluest book in Balia's Annals. There is an irony to the fact that the colour blue famously does not appear in Homer's Odyssey, but it is evident throughout Joyce's Ulysses, from the pale blue scarf of Millie Bloom to the blue clocks on Boylan's socks to the blue French telegram bidding Stephen home or the blue sky of his riddle to the blue litmus paper of the chemist, to the heaven tree of stars hung with humid night blue fruit, to blue dusk, nightfall, deep blue night. This is a blue hued book. Blue is associated with many characters. Molly desires a ring with the stone for my month, a nice aquamarine. Suter blazes boiling, is also festooned with the hues of blue along with the bar barmaid, sparkling bronze, azure eyed blazures, sky blue bow and eyes. Bloom is called many names throughout Ulysses, and one of the most poignant is what he thinks of himself in Sirens, Blue Bloom. The kernel of the episode is found in some of the simplest of the opening phrases. Blue, blue bloom, blue. I feel so sad, P.S., so lonely blooming. Stephen Dedalus ponders the possibility of green roses in portrait, but it is in the blue flower or blue bloom, which is associated with Leopold. Depression and growth, the bloom that rose is a rose is rising, can be found here in this one condensed trope. 
Joyce plays endlessly with the name and its lexical, sonic and etymological resonances. So lonely, so blue, blue bloom. In her series of essays on the topic of the blue of distance, Rebecca Solnit writes, the world is blue at its edges and in its depth. This blue is the light that gets lost. Light at the blue end of the spectrum does not travel the whole distance from the sun to us. I'll just skip to the blue at the horizon, the blue of the land that seems to be dissolving into the sky is a deeper, dreamier, melancholy blue, the blue at the farthest reach of the places which you see for miles, the blue of distance. This light does not reach us, touch us rather, does not travel the whole distance. The light gets lost. That gives us the beauty of the world, so much of which is the color blue. So Sun traces this um, distant blue to the landscape paintings of 15th century European artists. And she's looking at that blue there you can see on the horizon here in um, Solario's Crucifixion um, and in uh, Da Vinci's Ginevra da Vinci. Um, she considers the impulse to paint the blue of distance, the far away. Smitten with the color blue, Solnit writes that the paintings give the impression that if you were to walk through the expanse of green grass and brown trees, you would at some point arrive in the blue country. But distance ceases to be distant and to be blue when we arrive in it. As we know, if we were to go to that blue country, the blue would recede to the next set of hills. A tension between the desire to reach the blue and the impossibility of doing so is thus created. For the blue is not in the place those miles away at the horizon, but in the atmospheric distance between you and the mountains. And for Solna, that atmospheric distance has its own value and worth. This provides a template for considering the distance between Ulysses and us. Ulysses concerns itself with exile, with wandering, with getting lost and trying to find one's way home. It is full of characters who are spiritually or physically far fallen from their homes, their times. And we too all continue to fall far from this time and place of the publication of Ulysses. And in experiencing our far falling condition as readers, we recognize also the blue of our distance from Ulysses. In marking the centenary of its publication, we might experience something of the desire to close the distance between the blue Ulysses of 1922 and our own moment. And we might also cherish our ability to witness the moment in which the gap between then and now is a full 100 years. And thus we have the chance to experience the atmospheric blue which that distance creates. As Solnit notes, often it is the distance between us and the object of desire that fills the space in between uh, with the blue of longing. And she wonders whether, with a slight adjustment of perspective, it could be treasured, treasured, treasured as a sensation in its own terms, since it is of an inherent, it, sorry, excuse me, since it is as inherent to the human condition as blue is to distance. Joyce's Ulysses was inspired by a text from over two millennia before, and Joyce was a man who saw into the long future. Parandowski recalls Joyce in the late 1930s as saying, I had, as I sat down to work, the conviction that in the midst of all these rooms, I was building something for the most distant future. We inexorably become that distant future for whom he wrote. The blue of the 1922 front cover of Ulysses may seem to fade as we recede from it past its centenary, but we also know it is also at heart a book of metamorphosis change and adaptation, which are also inherent in its essence as a blue Ulysses. Thank you. All right. Um, the title of my paper um, is Oh, rocks, not Greek again, Ulysses and the legacy of mistranslation, mistranslated Molly's comment to Bloom discussing uh, the meaning of metempsychosis, in which she says, oh, rocks tell us in plain words. In 1932, while discussing the modest mystery he called translation, the Argentine writer Jorge Luis Borges noted how for him, Cervantes' Don Quixote always seemed like a uniform monument with no other variations, except those provided by the publisher 
the bookbinder, and the typesetter. This sense of dull uniformity which Borges experienced in Cervantes was due in no small part, he felt, to his profound fluency with Spanish. Borges knew what Cervantes meant, and so he felt he had few questions to ask of his world. The hard shell of clear knowledge, his fluency, um, it seems, had obstructed him from engaging with Cervantes and, and his fiction more deeply, more imaginatively. But Homer and the Odyssey, on the, other, on the other hand, he suggested, that ancient world called to him in tantalizing fashion. Homer and the long complex reception history his poetry had engendered was, he wrote, quote, an international bookstore of works in prose and verse. Thanks in large part to what Borges called his, quote, opportune ignorance of Greek. Homer's, quote, heterog 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 heterogeneousness and even contradictory richness is not attributable to solely to the evolution of the English language, he declared, or to the mere length of the original, or to the deviations or diverse capacities of the translators, but rather to a circumstance that is particular to Homer, the difficult category of knowing what pertains to the poet and what pertains to the language. To that fortunate difficulty, the difficulty of not knowing Greek, we owe the possibility of so many versions, he claimed, all of them sincere, genuine, and divergent. As I consider our broad theme for today, and what I might have to say about the remarkable, expansive reach of Ulysses in the world after a hundred years. I thought of Borges on Homer. That is, I thought of the sheer difficulty of knowing Homer's world, the world of Greek epic. And then of course, I also thought of Joyce, Ulysses, and its own complica uh, complicated relationship with the Homeric world, to say nothing yet of the diverse forms which receptions of the novel have taken over the last century. It is also substantially difficult to know Joyce, more so even to wrap one's arms wholeheartedly around understanding all that Ulysses is and has been for the last 100 years. This is the experience of many readers and critics alike. But still, like Borges to Homer, we feel called back to the novel, its stories, its styles, its impact, and its profoundly important achievements. And it is worth wondering, as we are today, after 100 years, to paraphrase Borges, what pertains to Joyce? What pertains to the languages Ulysses speaks to us in the world? When I think of these questions, uh, it hurts one's brain, my brain at least, to think of all the labyrinthine receptions which the density and force that is Ulysses has generated across the world. But I find Borges' comments on translation in Homer suggestive and helpful too. Perhaps it is due to the fortunate difficulty of not knowing at all times, in all ways, what exactly Joyce was up to in Ulysses. Perhaps for that very reason, many of us have collectively read our way into what Borges called the possibility of so many versions. As with Homer, our ignorance, the state of being stuck in the gray, in partial knowledge of the novel and its workings, makes us all the more receptive. We see through a glass darkly but the brilliance of Joyce's work refracts its rays in great variety in a kaleidoscopic fashion across the novel's many readers. And it is the challenging ambiguities, the difficulty of Ulysses, which pushes us toward finding some narrative thread, a scheme, however translated or badly mistranslated, that might move us toward better understanding of Joyce's vast fabric. Whether such threads are critical or creative, so many of the novel's receptions, interpretations, adaptations, and readings have shed new understanding, new light, not only on the matter of Joyce's work itself, not only on Ireland, not only on the development of international modernisms, but also on the contemporary world in which we all still live with Ulysses now. Um, as someone who spends his time studying the evolving roles which classical knowledge and its governing institutions have had in the 20th century avant-garde, my own work on Joyce has coalesced, unsurprisingly to everyone around here, um, around Ulysses' complex overwriting or underwriting of Homer. This includes Joyce's acquaintance with classical theories and contemporaneous scholarship about the Homeric world, and more broadly, his knowledge of languages. Or his commendation of ignorance, of not knowing Greek, is something Joyce not only experienced personally, um, but a phenomenon he consciously knew he had experienced and reflected on as he finished Ulysses. Joyce was not a fluent reader, nor even a traditional student of Greek. 
He was, of course, a prolific genius amateur, a half-read magpie of so many languages. But the lack, I would argue, of a more staid, more institutionalized training in Greek kept him from receiving Homer and that ancient world in conservative, conventional fashion. That lack helped him not only unleash his own genius, but also untether Greek and Roman antiquity from the more traditional, more concentric forces which then dominated uses of classical knowledge in his own time. As classics and those institutions which govern their transmission began to slowly lose something of living authority in Joyce's time, their well-worn notions and categories of classical knowledge became more co coercive, becoming implicated in a variety of nationalisms. But as that happened, the range of possible receptions in modernist literature was widened too, and the notion of the classical became a far more pliable and volatile phenomenon. Um, thus the notion of an avant-garde on tethering of antiquity is not unique to Ulysses or discussions of modernism more broadly, but the novel is in my mind, no doubt its greatest display. This phenomenon exists too, I would argue, in other incendiary acts of creative revolt in the period, those which seized the traces of antiquity, mistranslated it and satirized the hardened centers of ideological power. In, in place of those modes of reception, there was a demand for a more capacious, a more humane, indeed a more hybrid, perhaps even contradictory sense of what classics, the canon, and the future of Anglophone literature might look like. For other examples, one might need only think of uh, first, perhaps of Wilfred Owen's denigration of Horace and his old lie, Virginia Woolf's salient discussion on not knowing Greek, Ezra Pound's attack on, on, British, on Britain's imperial venturing in the homage to Sextus Propertius, or elsewhere and later still in the Americas and in Africa, from the so-called Pindar of Har Harlem, Melvin Tolson, his deeply elusive use of Greek um, in, Harlem in Harlem Gallery, a 1965 poem, to Walcott's Omeros, or the Nigerian poet Christopher Okigbo with the traces of Virgil he set throughout his 1962 collection, Heaven's Gate. The social, political, and cultural forces which worked on all of these writers were clearly and profoundly different and diverse, but all, it seems to me, were joined by a desire to upend the dominant and conventional modes of receiving and using the so-called wisdom of the Greeks and the Romans. All too had some measure of classical education, learned often at the hands of ecclesial or imperial power. But he tried to receive that learning and put it to use for decidedly eccentric and unique creative ends. When raids were set on the ancients, these writers seized the storehouse, not simply so it could serve as midwife for introspective self-critique, but as a way to interrogate the tired memorial ideals, ideals which govern the literary, the aesthetic, the political, and the social in their own times. They bent the classics into shapes no one yet had eyes to see or better ears to hear. In Joyce's case, his being untethered galvanized a greater sense of latitude in him, latitude to creatively satirize both conventional and also crudely nationalistic uses of Homer, which were then rife across Irish literature and European culture more broadly. Unlike many of his contemporaries within the revival, Joyce saw in the long history of Homeric receptions a capacious sense of linguistic, cultural, and thematic hybridity, something akin to Borges' belief in Homer's heterogeneous, I got it right, and even contradictory richness. Thus, when he chose to adumbrate the contours of the Odyssey across June 16, 1904, his motivations were clearly not shaped by the, by the myopia of dry fidelity from a literalist urge to communicate Greek epic, quote unquote, in the original to borrow Buck Mulliken's uh, line. He was moved rather by a longing for the richness found in wandering, in being lost and at sea, for those epiphanies, the knowledge which comes by error through mistakes made and by partial knowledge of past and present. It's in mistranslating the original that Joyce articulated the moving alienation and the encom encompassing humanity of Daedalus, of Leopold and Molly Bloom. Of course, Many of the earliest reviews and essays on Ulysses did take account of its Homeric elements, but usually crudely and unhelpfully so, I think. Famous by now, T.S. Eliot <laughs> declared that Joyce had used the Odyssey as a mythical method to give a shape and significance to the modern anarchy 
of the contemporary world. But Eliot's stress here was always on Homeric order over against apparent modern disorder. And this tension obscures far more than it reveals. We know, for example, that from as early as 1901, Joyce had openly attacked contemporaneous Irish appropriations of the classical world. Those which tried to set Greek examples and as an ordering principle in national and stylistic matters related to the Irish revival. For Joyce, the conscription of classical authority could not easily make in the endeavors of Yeats, Singh, and others associated with the revival seem worthwhile, no matter how often Yeats insisted that his aim had been to, quote, make the land in which we live a holy land, as Homer made Greece. This was suggested first, perhaps, in the popular histories of Standish O'Grady. This insistence on a parallel, a correspondence between Gale and Greek, had become pervasive in the jargon of revivalists so much so that Yeats once declared that he could hear in his own drama, quote, Greek tragedy spoken with a Dublin accent. Joyce, however, heard no such accent and felt it seems that this talk offered only romantic enticements that threatened new artistic invention. No past moment, no past form as he saw it, could be effectively resurrected by present imitation and to saddle contemporary writers with appeals to past literary achievements, whether of Gaelic Ireland, Homeric Greece or any other ancient civilization was to invite not achievement, but insidious nostalgia. Thus in considering the role Homer and his translations have had in Ulysses, it's important to note, I believe, that whatever correspondence may exist with the Odyssey, it is not one bent on ordering the chaos of contemporary Dublin. As I see it, it is one set against those popular notions of Homer, which would render him and Greek as fundamentally representative of grand order and epic national cohesion. It is the very hybridity of Ulysses that undermines the Philhellenic fetish for classical purity, which Joyce saw in Yeats and other revival era contemporaries. In this way, Ulysses anticipates, I think, a more global sense of what classics could and has at times um, often become in a post-colonial, post-imperial world. Joyce's complex vision of Homer has perhaps troubled us too as readers. Um, it should, I think. Maybe, it, it, maybe it's time to mimic Molly here. Oh, rocks, tell, tell us in plain words. But what I mean is this, the prospect of some sort of master mythological key, the coming of clear Homeric order to the novel, something that will make us understand it better is very tantalizing, especially if you feel wrecked perhaps in Circe's Night Town. But seeing Joyce's reception of Homer as a key to unlock our difficulty misses the point. Ulysses' mistranslations of Greek are far too metamorphic, far too hybrid, and far too contradictory. Fritz Sen once commented how thoroughly the novel's various stylistic experiments confront the question of of experiencing great literature through the medium of translations. I like this remark very much. For by the novel's 18th episode, the Odyssey has been so refracted in it by the irreverent art of mistranslation, much like Bloom himself has been refracted. Any notion of a stable, authentic Homeric identity has just slipped away. In this way, Joyce seems in sympathy with Borges to return to him. Borges who felt that no style, no approach to the Greek source could grasp, quote, Homer's imaginations and the irrecoverable men and days he portrayed. The contextual details, the eccentricities of place, language, idiom, and particular cultures that differentiate an original moment of a source text from that of its modern target language create a labyrinth too immeasurable. And yet with that said, that is so much the beauty of Ulysses. The myriad ways Joyce reveled in the labyrinth of possible and impossible translations from the Greek. The novel treated the sense of an original not as an object whose order had to be retrieved, but rather as a kaleidoscopic center radiating creativity and new discovery. That Homeric center, a kind of black hole, if you like, he reconfigured and reworked again and again across the stylistic varieties of Ulysses. In this way, the novel's errant style set free further forms of experimentation in reception and in interpretation, all the while ironizing the conventional chain of receptions which nationalists had used to forge an Irish Homer. Thanks very much.
Good morning, everybody. Um, so to finish this panel, I'm just going to offer a few um, broad stroke reflections on two different legacies that I think Joyce has in European contemporary fiction. Uh, one of them is among a group of writers, I think about a dozen writers um, from continental Western Europe, writers who are in their 40s and 50s now, who don't necessarily know each other, um, but whose generation is characterized by precarious employment, that's in Italy, they're known as the precariato, the precariat, um, who have found something in Joyce that is producing, I think, an emergent new form of the novel that is very interesting. Uh, the other one is about the novel in Ireland, more generally, contemporary Irish fiction. And because John McCourt is going to be talking about the reception of Joyce in Ireland later, I'll focus mostly on that one, on the latter. I think the great influence that Joyce continues to have um, on world literature and the popularity that Irish fiction has had in recent years can blind us to the fact that the novel as a genre has a fairly uneasy place in the Irish literary tradition, which is um, much different from France or Germany or uh, Britain. There is an old Marxist analysis, which I think is uh, accurate, which suggests that 19th century Ireland didn't have economic and social conditions necessary to produce a realist novel, that the social and economic relationships were too toxic to produce narratives that were about the development of sympathy or the reconciliation of uh, social conflict. Uh, so we didn't have a 19th century realist tradition in Ireland, really. None of the great works of the Irish uh, revival were uh, novels. That was a movement generated mostly by poets critics and dramatists. Novels were not part of it really. And the same is true with a couple of exceptions, I think, a hundred years later in the Field Day movement, which again, uh, poetry and drama and criticism were at the center of it and novels uh, peripheral to its project. The few great contributions that Ireland has made to the novel in the 20th century are mostly tricky, form-breaking works. Joyce's novels, of course, uh, or Beckett or Flann O'Brien, works that dazzle but don't easily admit of response and really can't instantiate what we might think of as a tradition. How do we understand this um, oddity about the novel in Ireland in so, such a literary country? One way to look at it is to, or to understand it is to look at the experience of the Irish language novel, first of all. The Irish language novel has, since the 1930s, had an overtly vexed uh, relationship with the novel form. In Irish language circles, it's often has often been throughout the 20th century and still to the, today, a source of complaint that there isn't a proper Irish language tradition of the novel. This wasn't inevitable. In the medieval period, the Irish language looked like it was heading like French and everybody else for the novel. This development of the language, of the literary language was interrupted for obvious reasons arising from colonialism, lack of access to printing, lack of a, an Irish reading bourgeoisie and so on. Uh, with the result that in the 18th century, when the novel was taking off in other languages, the Irish language was falling out of use as a written medium. And so the only novels written in Ireland um, from the 18th century on before the revival were in English. After independence, however, Irish was compulsory in schools, there was a big uh, middle-class population literate in, in the language, but poetry has continued since the revival and to today to dominate in an extraordinary way Irish language literary output. The novel has remained peripheral to the Irish language literary tradition. There are hand, there's a handful of form-breaking masterpieces like Crane Achille by Mortino Kain, uh, and a couple of others, but unlike Irish language poetry, which has schools, generations, and traceable legacies, the Irish language novel has no ongoing tradition. I think this um, has at least in, to some extent to do with the bourgeois origins of the novel, the genre of the middle classes, the genre of social mob mobility going from rags to riches, and with it, the social and psychological transformation that we call Bildung, in the novel, this has a linguistic component too, as you move from rags to riches. Um, to narrate or to be the center of a novel, the protagonist must first acquire the language of the middle classes. That is a precondition of narrating 
or being at the center of the narration in a novel. And there's a hundred of exa examples I could offer you, or I'm sure you know them yourselves. One very extreme one that I'll just throw out there is Dickens' Oliver Twist. And this is in the, in the, in the film, it's, it's very clear because you hear the people's accents. So Oliver Twist is brought up in workhouses, orphanages, brothels, and criminal dens around people who all speak this colorful Cockney, but he himself speaks from the minute he's born, he speaks the Queen's English. Um, there's no ostensible reason for that, other than that we know as we read the novel that Oliver is in the wrong social class. He's going to be taken out of that class and restored to another one. Um, and that is that his, the Oliver's linguistic identity and class identity will be matched up at the end. Now this linguistic sphere is not just the language of the posh people, it's also the language of the narrative voice in the novel, the language by implication of the reader too. Oliver is one of us, he speaks our language. This is the language of the novel. Um, so more often, Oliver Twist is a kind of strange example, more often we have a character who's born speaking a uh, proletarian version, a variety of a language, who learns to speak like us. That happens in the Elena Ferrante novels, it happens in um, Sally Rooney to some extent, in the French novelist Edouard Louis. Um, but the main point is the same, that to be the narrating voice of a novel, implicitly or explicitly, one must have entered the middle class and learned, to, learned its language. Now, in the Irish language, which survived as the speech of a peasant class, there is no middle class register for a protagonist to enter. Every variety of Irish that's available to write is regionally inflected, sometimes hyper-regionally inflected, but it's not class inflected. There is no bourgeois idiom that you can use. So I think this is just an extreme version of a situation which also applies to English in Ireland, or at least English in Irish uh, literary imagination. The national decolonization question from the late 19th century on posed a challenge or a, a supposed challenge to writers. Irish writers who wanted to be part of the national project either had to write in Irish, not an option for nearly all of them because they didn't know it or didn't know it well, um, or explain how writing in English had something Irish about it. So what kind of English would be fit for literary purposes, but also feel indigenous? So we know what Yeats did in poetry. He forged his own um, uh, Irish idiom there. We know what Singh did in drama. But Joyce in prose is the most dramatic and influential example. Sorry, my pages are all in a out of order. Jesus, I'm last ended. Um, sorry, I skipped ahead. Sorry, in prose, the language of the regime of the novel, the bourgeois standard, I think even in English, has no native feeling version in Ireland. So if we compare Irish modernists to Mann, Wolfe, or Proust, the latter of whom all created singular signature prose styles within their standard language, none of the Irish modernists did that. What Irish modernist prose did instead, uh, led by Joyce, was to uh, develop a sort of external relationship to style and idiom as things to be manipulated and deployed. So it begins with Wilde, I suppose, but Joyce is the most dramatic and influential example. Both Ulysses and Portrait are uh, predicated on the impossibility of an Irish novel having a single so-called native idiom, which a writer might adapt and stretch for all of his purposes, as Yeats could do in poetry or Proust and Wolfe could do in the novel. There's no natural or native idiom in Ulysses from which the pastiche departs. There's no clear bourgeois speaks that speaks, that speaks above the text to us. It's all just varieties of language that, that jump out from inside the text. In the century since Ulysses um, came out, Irish poets, poets and dramatists have created singular styles um, and idioms, but this isn't the case, and it still isn't in Irish fiction, I think. There is still no sense of ownership amongst Irish writers of a high bourgeois register of written English. So the result, if you think in the last 30 years um, of great successes in Irish fiction, we have First person narratives in spoken more or less dialectal idioms, Pat McCabe, for example, or dialogue, Roddy Doyle. These are forms of the novel which are at their heart dramatic uh, monologues or dialogues or plays. The, the, the bourgeois linguistic register in all of these writers is externalized and represented as a hostile force outside of the text's world. 
the expectations that writers and readers of Irish prose and English have of novels is still one of a kind of linguistic magic. If it's not vernacular, as it is in Pat McCabe or Roddy Doyle, then we have experimental approaches to language in the work of Emer McBride, Mike McCormack, or extremely successfully, uh, really brilliantly, um, Anna Burns and Milkman. I think that this Joyce effect can also be detected operating in reverse in novelists in Ireland who seek to free their work from this expectation of style as meaning and go to great lengths to avoid any hint of linguistic spectacle. Sally Rooney is an example of this too. Uh, she's a writer who scrupulously, scrupulously avoids vernacular, but also doesn't attempt to create a high style within English. In the, the novels of Sally Rooney, the art and the energy comes from montage, I think, from uh, chopping around time and putting things together. It is though, in the Irish novel in English, there is still no faith in the possibility of manipulating standard middle-class English to do some of the work of the novel. This is to say that Irish novelists, I think, continue to write under the sign of Joyce, even when they reject him. The linguistic instability of modern Irish fiction in English might be the real long shadow that Joyce casts on Irish writers after him. And in some ways, it may not be the shadow of Joyce, really, but the shadow of the original decolonizing language question, as it has been amplified and refracted through the work of Joyce. Now, this, in, this inheritance of Joyce is completely different on the continent, I think, and especially in this, what I think is an emergent new form of the novel amongst European writers from Generation X, that is, people born in the, let's call it the long 1970s. So the, 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 the generation after uh, the post-war boom. So these writers are mostly middle class themselves. They've had an ample education, but they have as a generation, I mean, there are exceptions, of course, but as a generation, they found themselves excluded from institutions. They've spent lifetimes in precarious work, going from job to job, short-term contracts. They have, in other words, a combination of high culture and low economic expect expectations. They have not had a powerful individual institution or a powerful institutional voice. Now, as these writers enter their 50s or move to their 50s, they have a fear of their experience going unrecorded. One of them that some of you might know is a three um, volume uh, novel called Vernon Subutex by the feminist French uh, novelist uh, Virginie Despentes. And her, uh, the epigraph to hers is taken from Horace, Non omnis moriar, I will not entirely die. And this is, I think, a generational statement. I'm going to record my generation's experience. So in this novel, this three volume novel, like many of these writers, we have a picaresque situation. In this case, it's uh, a man, Vernon Subutex, who used to own a record store but then with the rise of streaming and everything else, his business, he went out of business. He used to be the coolest guy in Paris, really, during the late 80s and early 90s. But now he's down on his luck, in fact, finds him home, himself homeless. And the novel for three volumes follows him around as he tries to catch sofas to sleep on and money from friends and drugs. But it is actually written in um, an epic form. And this is characteristic of all of these novelists. So unlike in Ireland, a high stylistic register is not foreign one to these writers, but actually one that feels very familiar to them. So this picaresque um, kind of shabby life is narrated with very high language. What these writers, um, and I will name them later in a kind of, uh, just one at the end, and it'll sound a bit like Yeats's um, Easter 1916, because I, I can't tell you about all these writers, but I will name check them before we get to the end. What they get from Joyce, I think really is a, a predicament whereby the educational achievement or educational knowledge or um, cultural competence is at odds with economic prospects. And this is an idea, obviously, to all of us who know Joyce, it's familiar to us. What does this generation that has spent as a generation its life in precarity do? What, what does it do with all its education now that it's not going to rise up socioeconomically like the generation before it did? They're searching for plots outside of narratives of growth, development, and improvement, the kind of plot that we get in Eleanor Ferrante, um, but in dignity. All of Joyce's characters, was it Hugh Kenner who said this, um, but all of Joyce's characters more or less have the same amount of money. This it sets them apart from so many other novelists. They strive for respectability, 
but there's no room for Joyce's characters to move up the socioeconomic ladder in any significant way. Social mobility is not really an engine of plot in Joyce. That's why Ulysses can be confined to a single day because nobody's really, it's not about people changing their circumstance. Instead of offering us progress, advancement and change, it engages in a form of, of linguistic and cultural archeology. span And Finnegan's Wake, of course, um, doesn't even end. It just goes round and round and round. This is connected to this imbalance between education and economic prospects. And this um, Generation X epic novel on the continent, I think, has taken this idea and run with it. Uh, and they've got this, they've got a model for doing this from Joyce. We have characters who are typical rather than exceptional. Instead of depictions of individual greatness or exceptionality, like Oliver Twist, what we have in all of these novels is really a depiction of the ingredients of the cultural soup in which their characters were cooked. So not individual greatness, but collective cultural realities. I want to just give you one, um, to conclude just one uh, moment in the plot of one of these. It's a novella by an, uh, an Italian writer called Andrea Pomella. Uh, it's called Anni Luce, uh, Light Years. And it's about two um, guys who go interrailing. He's remembering they go interrailing in the early 90s, very common experience for European Generation X. And they're on the way, they're on the train to Paris uh, from Rome and realize that um, alcohol is going to be too expensive, expensive for them to buy in Paris. And they do some calculation, realize it would be cheaper to get the train all the way back to Rome, stock up on whiskey in this train station kiosk, and then start the journey again. So this, this little moment could be taken as uh, a, a summation of the Gen X epic narrative mode, because what happens on their trip back to Rome is uh, a series where we get a series of digressions, really essays, mini essays about Kurt Cobain, uh, Leopardi, Proust, uh, Stefan Zweig, Italian politics. So we, we get this, um, and uh, we have them in all of these um, these novels. And um, in Andrea Inglese is another one. I said I'd name them. Paolo Zanotti is uh, another one. Knausgaard is actually one of them in a, in a certain way, but I, in a, only in a certain way. But what we get is uh, these great goals that people don't arrive at. And instead of um, uh, boom or growth or development, we have digging down, repurposing forms of collective cultural archaeology. Thank you. Is this working? Thank you so much to all of our speakers. Those were amazing papers. I think we're going to borrow just a couple of minutes from our uh, the beginning of the lunch so we can have 10 minutes to chat with everyone, if that's okay. Um, so thank you all. And I'd like to just open it up to the audience to see if we have any questions for these three really fantastic papers about the blue of distance between us and Ulysses. But it's not working? Oh, okay. Yes, please. Thanks, Shinjini, is that on? You can hear me okay? Um, I think one of the blues that is a sort of absence, absent presence in the whole um, um, of Ulysses is the blue of the Virgin Mary as a sort of, which is a sort of um, invented color for, for Mary, in fact. Um, and you see that as a sort of shimmering in the background in episodes like Nausicaa, I think, in, in having the star of the sea um, close by. Um, it does appear as I, as I mentioned, for numerous characters, and we have these ideas of blue, but it is very much associated with sadness. Um, it's it's the, the use of blue, particularly in the Sirens episode, is bloom 
playing on his own name and the idea of blowing, of creating wind um, and on the idea of his own sadness. And the sadness of Bloom, um, I've spoken about in, in another place, has something maybe of the quality of, in Irish, there's a word, mishnok, which is a sort of courage, but it is one where one is continuing with tears. It isn't a sort of bravado. And, and that's the sort of courage I associate with this blue bloom that we meet in, in that episode. Um, he has to have a resilience against these rivals, um, the su suitors like Blazes Boylan, um, or like Simon Dedalus as a sort of rival for, for a son. Um, and yet he continues. Um, and so his blueness um, is one which um, it does not prevent him from the, uh, continuing on into the next episode, if you like. Thanks, Shinji. Yes, please. Thank you. Here, try this one. Microphone switcheroo here. This is a question for Barry. And you talked about the, uh, the influence on other European writers. And I have just read Al Alfred Dublin's Alexanderplatz, and which was heavily influenced by Ulysses. And was the use of Berliner dialect throughout the entire book, was this an example? of the influence of Ulysses on him? Um, I, 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 suppose, I suppose it is. Um, and it's reveling, reveling in the particularity of a cultural context. Uh, I, I think um, Alexander Platz has other things that um, he takes from, from Joyce as well. But in, in, in these um, European novelists that I'm so interested in, for example, Paolo Zanotti, his, his, his last, his, they're all posthumously published, unfortunately, but his last one, um, it includes a, a long, um, which reminds me of um, Alexander Platz in that sense, there's a long a glossary of the kind of slang spoken by young Pisans, by people from Pisa in the 1990s. But it's, and it's just, it's just slang, but it's very generationally bound slang. But he takes it extremely serious as a cultural context that should be recuperated and recorded, but it's not, it, and it's a plot that doesn't lead, there's all these futile quests, which also you get there too, that's not leading anywhere great. Nobody is going to become anything extraordinary, but, but, but by following them, what we're going to get is the slow revelation and manifestation of a particular collective cultural context that otherwise might vanish um, unrecorded, but um, very banal ones, you know, just elevated to the level of epic. Like, Um, this is also a question for Barry. I'm so struck by the two trajectories you map out of Joyce's influence in that the first one on the sort of Irish language side in the Irish novelist is about um, an impossibility of a kind of um, bourgeois narrative voice, which you also, I think, are linking to a third person narrative voice. And you give us these examples of all of these novels being monologues and first person voice. But then in the other set, right, um, of the contemporary European novelists, you talk about how they're all writing not about individual experience, but collective experience. And so it's just so fascinating to me that in a sense, we get two opposite versions, right? One that is an impossibility of individuality and one that's an impossibility of collective, and both of them come from the same source. And I, I'm wondering to myself if maybe um, part of this is because of the way that Joyce, especially in kind of use of free indirect discourse, shifts constantly between the two or problematizes the relationship between the two. And maybe that's one way to account for this. But I wonder if you have other thoughts about that. Well, no, that, that's beautifully put. I actually wish I, I had that for describing this paper. I mean, some of it's grammatically, some of the Irish ones are in the third person, Edna O'Brien. Um, uh, is, I, I actually certainly have a doubt, but some some of them are in the third person, but they use a sort of free and direct discourse. They're still embedded in a in a, in, lingu in a linguistic 
a marked linguistic uh, register, whereas some of the Italian ones um, and French ones are first person, but uh, but in the very high bourgeois register, they just give us the slang as a, or kind of cultural artifacts as something we discover through them, but they're not, we're not embedded in them. They, there is a kind of standing outside, which is what and the Irish novel really resists as a possibility for, for some reason. But I also, like you, I'm fascinated by how Joyce can give two seemingly opposed, um, but in both cases, they are connected to a, a, a troubled relationship with the middle class, I think. They're being in the middle class, but not quite of it, which is common to the characters in Dubliners as it is to the these Italian writers I'm thinking of, Italian and French, um, and in ways to the Irish novel in general, which there's a, a kind of, a, even if the writers are middle class, there's a sort of an uneasy, uh, uneasiness in identifying themselves with that class, I think. Um, thanks. For that. I have a question for Greg. Do you mind if I ask? I was thinking about it because of the blue and the painting and this emphasis on the material context of culture that Barry's describing for us. And it struck me that when I was reading about Turner one time, I learned that the blue of these Renaissance paintings was made only from lapis lazuli that could come from one specific part of Afghanistan. And so there's a whole material train and a colonial train that really materializes this like evanescent idea of distance, for example. And I just, for Greg, I just, I'm just wondering, like, is this the kernel of Joyce's like impatience with the idealisms of these other classical models? And I'm thinking about how we know now that these pure white statues were like painted in insane colors, for example. Is, is, that, is that the core of it is about a materialist view of history instead of nationalist idealism or is that too simple? It's on. Is this on? I don't. Is this on? Is it? On? Um, I, I I think so. I mean, and Joyce was fascinated in particular. I think of the Homeric scholarship he was fascinated with. One one thing that some of you may know is uh, Victor Berard's uh, uh, discussion of the Phoenician origins of the Odyssey itself. And so Joyce was tuned into very much uh, classical scholarship that had already indicated that 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 the Homeric world was a world which was culturally hybrid. It wasn't born out of a pure Greekness, right? It was born out of cultures that melded and mixed together. And I think of his lecture that he gave um, in Trieste in 1907, um, Ireland, Island of Saints and Sages, which in, to me at least, as I read it as a kind of salvo against um, a more purist model of Irish revivalism, and he, he entertains the question though, which he always poses it as a question. Um, and I'm paraphrasing here, but so uh, apologies. But he says at one point, is this country going to resume its position as the Hellas of the North? And I always wonder how seriously he entertained that question. Um, but it was a question he was, he was engaging with. And so I think it's right that he was focused on material history rather than sort of national myth. Yeah. Um, but nonetheless, finding uses for Homer within that to complicate that. Thank you so much. I, if, if there's any last question, we can ask it. Otherwise, we can chat over lunch. Does that sound good? Please join me in thanking our really incredible panelists. to you to please be back by 1 30 there is lunch uh, there's plenty of lunch lots of vegetarian options uh it's beautiful outside it's there are feral students everywhere so watch out um but please please do be back here at 1 30 and tope falaran uh in conversation um just to you know reminder that obviously there are people watching this online we don't want to be leaving them while we're enjoying our sandwich um so one thank you
Hi, everybody. Thanks for uh, thanks for rejoining us. Um, this is going to be quite exciting, quite fun. Um, this panel is called, I think, Writing Against Ulysses or Writing Against Joyce, but I meant against in the Irish way, which is beside, alongside, um, but of course also in the other way. Um, I'm going to take uh, ch Chair's prerogative for a second and say, um, I, I mentioned this morning in my in my remarks that there are mugs and tea towels of Ulysses. Entirely unbidden and without knowing that this conference was taking place, my brother, who is in Portugal, just sent me a picture of a hand embroidered face cloth with Joyce's face on it uh, in Coimbra, in the bookshop, bookstore in the university in Coimbra, hand embroidered face cloth. It's like the Shroud of Turin, uh, except for Joyce. So um, I'm glad to know that it's not just mugs and tea towels, but also um, uh, hand embroidered face cloths. Um, I am delighted. Uh, to be joined by two of our neighbours, um, Tope Falarn and Alice McDermott, are um, both writers, uh, novelists who live here in DC. Tope is um, a professor here in Georgetown, teaches in um, the English department with the Lannan Centre for Poetics and Social Practice. And um, Alice uh, lives just up the road. So it's really, I mean, um, you know, I know in New York, people are uh, spoiled with writers all over the place. Um, but it's a real pleasure to have uh, Tope and Alice with us today and to talk to them about their relationship against or with or beside or alongside uh, Joyce. I'll read their bios um, very briefly, just so you know. Tope is a Nigerian-American writer based here in D.C. As I said, he won the um, Kane Prize for African Writing in 2013, which uh, those of you who have a Georgetown connection will know that the Kane Prize is um, substantially supported by Georgetown, and there's a long relationship between Georgetown and the Kane Prize for African Writing. And he was shortlisted again for the Kane Prize in 2016. He was also recently named um, to the Africa 39 list of the most promising African writers under 40. Uh, that'll only last so long, uh, I think. Uh, he was educated at Morehouse College at the University of Oxford, where he's a Rhodes Scholar, uh, and he's the author of, um, just two years ago, two and a half years ago now, A Particular Kind of Black Man, um, which came out from Simon Schuster, uh, and uh, as I said, is currently teaching in the Lannan, um, uh, visiting, uh, the Lannan Center for Poetics and Social Practice here in Georgetown. We're delighted, Tope, to have you with us, um, and I will just... Uh, Alice's bio has gone run missing here. Alice, um, uh, it, her eighth novel, The Ninth Hour, which is confusing, uh, was a finalist for the 2017 National Book Critics Circle Award and the 2017 Kirkus Prize for Fiction. Three of her previous novels, After This, At Weddings and Wakes, and That Night, were finalists for the Pulitzer Prize. Uh, Charming Billy won the National Book Award for Fiction in 1998. Uh, and that night was also a finalist for the National Book Award, the Penn Faulkner Award, and the LA Times Book Prize. Her stories, her essays, her reviews have appeared in the New York Times, the Post, the New Yorker, and elsewhere. And um, she is formerly, congratulations, I think, on it being former uh, Maxi Professor of Humanities at uh, Johns Hopkins uh, University. So, Tope, Alice, um, thanks, for, thanks for joining us. We spent a morning uh, talking about Ulysses, and we've got seven more hours to go. Um, <laughs> But the one thing we haven't, well, yeah, yeah, the one, the one thing we haven't actually done yet is heard a whole lot of Joyce's words, except cut up between, uh, cut up in between sentences and parsed and, and moved around. And I thought I would start by asking Tope and Alice to read a little bit of Joyce's work. Um, and uh, Alice, do you want to, do you want to go first? I know you have a, a passage or three that you're trying to decide, so. <laughs> um, a few of the passages that I marked that I might read today have um, already been mentioned. Um, so maybe I'll start with, uh, with one that, that just came up um, when Dan and Joe um, were speaking. I want to see everyone, concluded he, all creeds and classes pro rata having a comfortable 
tidy sized income in no niggard fashion either, something in the neighborhood of 300 pounds per annum. That's the vital issue at stake, and it's feasible and would be provocative of friendlier intercourse between man and man. At least that's my idea for what it's worth. I call that <clears throat> patriotism, ubi patria, mm. as we learned a small smattering of in our classical day in alma mater, vite bene, where you can live well, the sense is, if you work. Over his untastable apology for a cup of coffee, listening to this synopsis of things in general, Stephen stared at nothing in particular. He could hear, of course, all kinds of words changing color like those crabs about <clears throat> ring's end in the morning, burrowing quickly into all colors of different sorts of the same sand where they had a home somewhere beneath or seemed to. Then he looked up and saw the eyes that said or didn't say the words, the voice he heard said, if you work, count me out he managed to remark, meaning to work. The eyes were surprised at this observation because as he, the person who owned them pro tem observed, or rather his voice speaking did, all must work, have to, together. I mean, of course, the other hastened to affirm work in the widest possible sense, also literary labor, not merely for the kudos of the thing, writing for the newspapers, which is the readiest channel nowadays, that's work too. I've been trying to tell my relatives that for years. Um, <laughs> important work, after all, from the little I know of you, after all the money expended on your education, you are entitled to recoup yourself and command your price. You have every bit as much right to live by your pen in pursuit of your philosophy as the peasant has. What? You both belong to Ireland, the brain and the brawn. Each is equally important. You suspect, Stephen retorted with a sort of half laugh, that I may be important because I belong to the Faubourg saint Patrice called Ireland for short. I would go a step farther, Mr. Bloom insinuated, but I suspect, Stephen interrupted, that Ireland must be important because it belongs to me. What belongs, queried Mr. Broom, Bloom, bending, fancying he was perhaps under some mis misapprehension. Excuse me, unfortunately, I didn't catch the latter portion. What was it you, Stephen, patiently cross-tempered, repeated and shoved aside his mug of coffee or whatever you like to call it, none too politely adding, we can't change the country, let us change the subject. Hmm. <clears throat> Which I have quoted to my New York relatives quite often. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, you, you, you read from one of uh, what, what are uh, allegedly Two famous, two of the most boring chapters <laughs> in, in, in Ulysses. So, and, and uh, you managed to make it very uh, entertaining. Uh, and I just want to, you know, give you uh, an opportunity to just talk about that that passage. But um, what is it draws you there? Besides, obviously, the apologia for writers. Uh, for writers <laughs> life. There, there's that too, and the very handy line of "Let's change the subject," um, <laughs> which which is very handy these days. Um, but also, I was thinking about um, what we had talked about, uh, just the, the sort of relevance, uh, relevance um, and the possibility, and, and I'm sure we'll get into this in our hour, of um, who will be reading Ulysses in the next <clears throat> hundred years. Um, and to find a passage like that in what is, um, Dan, I think maybe one of those places where Dan said we're allowed to skip in his book, which I'm forever grateful for, um, <laughs> that I've been given permission to skip over <laughs> um, many pages in Ulysses. Um, but even in the, the a chapter that's, that's not um, as, as off quoted, here is something, um, as Dan pointed out this morning, it's, it's what we're talking about. Um, it, it's there. So there's, there's um, what literature is meant to do there. Um, to to speak to the times even as the times change. Yeah, it's one of those you know places where 
Ulysses does indeed seem to cast its shadow before, in some sense, um, uh, those coming events <clears throat> cast their shadow before. Um, Toby, I think you you decided to read from Port of the Artist as a young man, uh, and I, I just you know part part um, just thinking about having a conversation with somebody in in India recently who, and I was you know talking about Ulysses in India, and she said to me, "It's not Ulysses; it's a portrait." Hmm. You know, that's the novel. <clears throat> That's being read. That's being reread. That's being digested. That's where, that's being used. Um, so, um, yeah, I'd love to hear from. You. Of course, uh, so good to be here. Uh, thank you so much for this invitation, uh, Alice. It's truly an honor to be reading and and uh, sitting here with you. I'm a long time fan and admirer of your work. Uh, I chose to read from a portrait because um, I'll and I suppose I can say some of this later on, but just in in terms of like providing some context. Uh, when I was a graduate student at Oxford University, I decided, uh, you know, I kind of went there and said, I'm gonna do everything that I can to become a writer. Um, and prior to my time at Oxford, I was a political science major at Morehouse College. I was, you know, deeply interested in sort of domestic and foreign policy. And that's where I directed my intellectual energies. Um, but again, once I arrived at Oxford, I said, well, I need to kind of create a personal syllabus of work that, that I need to read and engage with and learn from if I really want to uh, sort of become the kind of writer I want to be. And, uh, and so Joyce obviously was, is a prominent figure. And I, I have to admit that I was a little intimidated about sort of approaching the work. And so I kind of circumnavigated the work for a while. I read a, a lot of people who had been inspired by Joyce. I read a lot of work that had been inspired by Joyce. Um, but finally, over time, uh, summon the courage to dive in. And a good friend of mine who uh, was also an aspiring writer said, you have to read a portrait of the artist as a young man. And I did so. And so for me, this, this is a copy I, I purchased actually in London, but it's the second copy because my first copy was so, I, I, you know, sort of read it so many times that it was beginning to lose its, its integrity. Um, yeah. And, and when I was growing up, my dad, it was funny because I, you know, I heard, I, you know, I knew I was going to be on this panel and I went to my bookshelf and pulled this book uh, from the shelf and began to peruse it for the first time in perhaps a decade, to be honest. I've read excerpts of this book online and in various other places, but it's been quite some time since I've actually picked up this book. And when I was younger, my dad told my siblings and, and me that we could never write in books, that it was verboten. You know, books are to be cherished. You read them, you you, uh, and then you place them aside. And so, whenever I wanted to, um, you know, write something, if I'm re reading a book and a thought occurs to me, instead of you know sort of writing in the margins, I I'll have a notebook and I'll write. And I say that all because I was surprised when I started flipping through the pages that I've marked this book up, which is something I never do. Um, and so I wanted to read a bit from the portion I've marked up. Um, so for those of you who are familiar with the book, this is a moment when our protagonist, our hero, Stephen, is in his second year at Belvedere College, um, and he's about to go on stage to perform in a play. While his forehead was being wrinkled and his jaws painted black and blue by the elderly man, he listened distractedly to the voice of the plump young Jesuit, which bade him speak up and make, and make his points clearly. He could hear the band playing the Lily of Killarney and knew that in a few moments, the curtain would go up. He felt no stage fright, but the thought of the part he had to play humiliated him. A remembrance of some of his lines um, made a sudden flush rise to his painted cheeks. He saw her serious alluring eyes watching him from among the audience and their image at once swept away his scruples, leaving his will compact. Another nature seemed to have been lent him. The infection of the excitement and youth about him entered into and transformed his moody mistrustfulness. For one rare moment, he seemed to be clothed in the real apparel of boyhood. And as he stood in the wings among the other players, he shared the common mirth amid which the drop scene was hauled upwards by two able-bodied priests with violent jerks and all awry. A few moments after he found himself on the stage amid the garish gas and the dim scenery acting before the innumerable faces of the void, it surprised him to see that the play which he had known at rehearsals for a disjointed, lifeless thing had suddenly assumed a life of its own. It seemed now to play itself and he and his fellow actors aiding it with their parts. 
When the curtain fell on the last scene, he heard the void filled with applause and through a rift in the side scene, saw the simple body before which he had acted magically deformed, the void of faces breaking at all points and falling asunder into busy groups. He left the stage quickly and rid himself of his mummery and passed out through the chapel into the college garden. Now that the play was over, his nerves cried for some further adventure. He hurried onwards as if to overtake it. The doors of the theater were all open and the audience had emptied out. On the lines which he had fancied the moorings of an ark, a few lanterns swung in the night breeze, flickering cheerlessly. He mounted the steps from the garden in haste, eager that some prey should not elude him, and forced his way through the crowd in the hall and past the two Jesuits, who stood watching the exodus and bowing and shaking hands with the visitors. He pushed onward nervously, feigning a still greater haste and faintly conscious of the smiles and stares and nudges, which his powdered head left in its wake. When he came out on the steps, he saw his family waiting for him at the first lamp. In a glance, he noted that every figure of the group was familiar and ran down the steps angrily. I have to leave a message down in Georgia Street, he said to his father quickly. I'll be home after you. Without waiting for his father's questions, he ran across the road and began to walk a breakneck speed down the hill. He hardly knew where he was walking. Pride and hope and desire like crushed herbs in his heart sent up vapors of maddening incense before the eyes of his mind. He strode down the hill amid the tumult of sudden risen vapors of wounded pride and fallen hope and baffled desire. They streamed upwards before his anguished eyes in dense and maddening fumes and passed away above him till at last the air was clear and cold again. A film still veiled his eyes, but they burned no longer. A power akin to that which had made anger or resentment fall upon him brought his steps to rest. He stood still and gazed at the somber porch of the morgue and from that to the dark cobbled laneway at its side. He saw the word lots on the wall of the lane and breathed slowly the rank, heavy air. That is horse piss and rotted straw, he thought. It is a good odor to breathe. It will calm my heart. My heart is quite calm now. I will go back. Here we are on a stage in a Jesuit school. <laughs> uh, were you nervous? <laughs> no, you know, it's funny though, because I read that. I, I was trying to remember last night, why did I mark these passages? And I think for two reasons. One, the language uh, I find incredibly captivating, his ability to, his kind of deep awareness of the flexibility of language, his ability to kind of deploy metaphor and similes in such exciting ways is something that I'm quite drawn to. But I think the second reason I marked those passages was because when I started at Oxford, I was actually, I, I, so I, I neglected to, to say this when I was talking about my time and my kind of intellectual and personal transformation at Oxford, I, I started acting in plays. Um, and so I read this and I had forgotten this completely until I picked up the book again, that I was acting in my first play at Oxford uh, and was a bit nervous because, you know, I knew my friends would be there. I hadn't really acted since like middle school or something. And so uh, I guess I felt a kind of deep sense of allegiance, I suppose, and um, to that passage because it described what I hoped would be my experience, the ability to, um, you know, know my lines, go on stage, uh, perform ably and step off and maybe not dismiss my family afterwards, but at least have confidence that I performed as, as, as I wanted to. So I think that that is what inspired me to mark those passages. Well, so that, you know, that amazing Stephen Dedalus word, humiliation. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Right? You know, we can mm -hmm. feel yeah. it, we can sense it, we know it, we're sweating. Yeah. You know, um, that, that passage really resonates. I, I want to go back uh, to you because uh, you know I want to talk to both of you essentially about your, you know, your encounter, your sort of Joycean biography, your, your first encounter. Um, but you, you probably have a somewhat unusual story, Tope, given this, um, this idea of uh, having a few hundred books in a garret uh, and reading. Was that your, your first encounter? And was that an encounter with Ulysses as well, or just a Oh, absolutely, the yeah. So Ulysses, I knew was the mountain that I had to climb at the end after I had trained for some time. And so I had that in mind and, and it had sort of pride of place on my desk. Um, but I, you know, I think part of it was, um, I had obviously, like all of us do, had in mind a number of books that um, I hadn't read that I perhaps should read, books that in many important ways, not only kind of form the canon of Western literature, but are incredibly important for somebody who aims to be a good writer and conversant in some of the ideas that have predominated over the past couple sort of centuries of, of thought. And so, um, you know, I, I 
kind of, again, I edged my way into Joyce. I started by, you know, I was, as I said before, really besotted with the theater and plays. So I read a lot of plays before I started, you know, and I, I was, I, so I, I loved modernism and I sensed that I had a great deal to learn from the various modern movements of the early 20th century, surrealism, Dadaism, futurism, um, constructivism from Russia. And so I started, you know, with visual art and then I started reading the plays, theater of the absurd plays, plays by Beckett and Pinter were very important to me. Um, and then I started reading a sort of literary modernism. And so I read this book and uh, as I was rereading it a couple nights ago, I see so much of, I, I see the influence in my own first book, you know, and the way that he starts. And I had forgotten how the incredible experience of picking up a book for the first time and being kind of, you know, sort of, a bit lost, but simultaneously thrilled by what's happening on the page. And that happens during the first pages of this book, because uh, Stephen is more or less kind of describing his, his, you know, his infancy in a way. And the question becomes, how do you render that on the page? Um, and he and, uh, and Joyce does so in a really innovative and fascinating way. Uh, and I remember the first time I read it, I read it and I went back and, and read it again. And then I did that again. And it's a, that's a challenge I grappled with as I uh, wrote my debut novel uh, was how to attempt to render the kind of scattered and still forming consciousness of a child protagonist. Mm -hmm. And so I learned a great deal of that from engaging with Joyce mm -hmm. as a student at, at Oxford. Mm -hmm. I think uh, just as a quick aside, um, the short story that won the Kane Prize um, is a extraordinary example of that struggle to render the scattered consciousness of a child. Oh, I um, appreciate that. Mm -hmm. uh, called Miracle. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, well worth reading. Yeah. Alice, uh, how about you? Um, probably not in a garret in Oxford. <laughs> or, uh, I don't know if it was a garret. <laughs> no, 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 I love that. Yeah, no, it should have been. It should have been. From now on, it's a garret. I love that. How about you, Alice, your, your sort of first encounter with um, with Joyce, um, and you encounter with Joyce also as a writer, right? So it's uh, you know different to encounter as an early reader, and then to re-encounter in a sense as a writer too. Yes, uh, thinking about this, I, I, I'm embarrassed to confess the the my very earliest recollection of anything about Joyce was a song by Alan Sherman, um, which was a letter from camp from a little child. Alan Sherman was sort of a comic singer. Um, and the lines were, the camp counselor wants no sissies, so he reads to us from something called Ulysses. <laughs> and I remember asking my parents, what's Ulysses? And the reply was, it's a dirty book. Mm. So I was interested. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but actually, as a writer, as a very young writer, um, it occurs to me that um, I, I'm... I'm about 50 years of, of reading Ulysses. So, so I, I encountered uh, Joyce at the halfway mark of where we are today. Um, as a very young writer at Oswego State, wasn't Oxford, but, um, but we tried. <laughs> um, a little state school upstate New York and I started um, taking writing classes um, and a wonderful professor said, oh, you have to read Dubliners. Um, and my reaction was, I don't want to be an Irish writer. I want to be a Southern writer or I want to be a Russian writer, but I don't want to be an Irish writer. Um, so I went off and read Dubliners and thought, I know all these people. I, I don't need this guy to tell me. I know these characters. Um, I know this the way they think. Um, I like some of the neat things that he does, but I, these guys are too familiar to me. Um, so I put up a great wall of resistance uh, to James Joyce um, because I didn't want to be an Irish writer. <laughs> um, and I think it was portrait. I think it was um, finally uh, understanding not only um, what he was doing um, as a narrative writer, but what he was doing with language mm. um, and, and having that taking that leap, having that courage um, to, to uh, use language to recreate a certain consciousness. And, you know, I just, um, I just happened to, to reread Portrait um, just a, a couple of months ago, and I realized, um, especially the opening scenes um, when Stephen is sick, 
um, the beautiful scene in, in uh, when he's put to bed and he has a fever. Yeah. And as I read it, I realized that I could not distinguish this scene from my own memories, mm. that it had become a part of my own memory of my own experience. Um, and it was this, um, th th this marvelous sense of revisiting um, a work that, that I've probably read 20, 30 times and, and portrait I can read from beginning to end. Ulysses, I'm still having some trouble <laughs> with, <laughs> with getting right through it, um, but, but something that I've read 20 or 30 times and to realize how um, the language, the, the experience, I know the shadow of the fire on the wall. Um, I know that sense when, when Brother Michael brings the beef tea. Mm. Um, I have experienced that. Um, and it, it, it really is as, as vivid and as important to me as any memory of something that has actually occurred in my life. Mm. Um, and I think that's the power of um, what Joyce does, again, not just as a narrative, but, but how he allows that language to somehow recreate the language with which we speak to ourselves, which is never exactly the same thing as the language with which we speak to each other. It's interesting that you both pick up on portrait and, you know, obviously because of its sort of teleology of development and emergence and the emergence yep. of the artist. And it has that sort of story that can uh, align itself with our own understanding of our own youth. And I, I, I want to um, go back to something you just said. Um, uh, you said the Great Wall uh, against Irish literature. Um, uh, and uh, we could use another phrase from portrait, nets. Right. So uh, when Stephen says, I want to fly by those nets and well, I don't need to explain the cleverness of that phrase to fly <laughs> by using, but also to fly by, to pass by, to you know, sort of overcome in many ways. And yeah. Alice, um, you know, not to, uh, but, to, but to go back to that question, you don't want to be an Irish writer. And then there's always the, you know, the Irish Americanness of that actual, <laughs> you know, uh, how that how that might play in Ireland as well. So I, I guess I just wanted to think maybe as a not Irish writer, right? Uh, let's say, you know, Irish in, in brackets, um, you know, has that, has that sort of relationship to Joyce, has that been with you over your 50 years of reading? Have you sort of thought, thought of yourself in relation to him, not just as, you know, that initial encounter is, you know, I, I don't want to be, or the, I recognize these, you know, how's, how's that worked for you in many ways? Yeah, I think, I think there's, um, there comes a time, and I'm, I'm sure you've, you've experienced this, that there comes a time, um, if we're lucky, it comes early in our careers, but um, for most of us, it comes eventually um, that you recognize uh, this is my material, this is the writer I am, um, that in some ways, I, I am as a writer, I am composed by every writer who's come before me. Um, some I haven't even read, mm -hmm. but because they were um, progenitors of, of people I have read. So, so the tradition uh, shapes how I, how I shape a sentence and how I identify scene. Um, but that there's also that, and I suppose maybe this is, this is the Joyce um, flee the country and then spend your career looking back at it. <laughs> um, say, I don't want any part of that, but I'm going to write about yeah. it all the time. <laughs> you know? um, and, and I think, um, I think we all come to this. This is who we are. This is this is um, this is the thumbprint um, that that cannot be changed and um, and can only temporarily be escaped. Um, so so I think yeah. So so Joyce, um, I've made my peace with Joyce, <laughs> um, and and understand um, again that that um, some of the essential the DNA of of any writer. Um, what language means, um, where that language comes from, um, you know, to have to admit that my Catholic upbringing has shaped the way I will always shape a sentence. Mm -hmm. um, it will always be there. And I, and I see it there in Joyce, too. And we can we can use that sentence to say all kinds of things about the faith or not. 
um, but but that's there um, in in the rhythm and the musicality. And I think musicality, not to um, not to bring up a whole, new, but Joyce's musicality is probably the first thing that I realized um, is inescapable um, for me as a writer in my voice. That the appreciation of literal the literal song um, and how that shapes. Uh, the, the that inner voice with which we speak to ourselves, um, but also the the great gift of of the music of uh, written language and silent reading. Yeah, and you know we, we saw that last night in in the performance with uh, La Chidarem, uh, Mapari, um, and the kind of call it Catherine. Catherine, where are you? And um, we have a. a an expert on Joyce and music here. Yes. And so we, you know, you have a sense of, but it's interesting how you say that because you sort of segued from the Catholicism to music. And in part, because, I mean, if you, th if you think about that scene in Westland Road Church, um, you know, that is a scene that is suffused with a particular kind of sound and scent and smell and, you know, sort of a sensory scene in many ways. Right. And Mary Star of the Sea, um, yeah, yeah. just infusing that, that, background for um for Nausicaa. In, yes exactly yeah yeah, yeah the yeah. whole the whole sort of pageantry in the church and we won't mention what's going on in the beach um, <laughs> it's uh, a dirty book <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> cloacal obsession um, uh, Tope, I mean, and, you know to ask a sort of a similar very different version of a similar question yeah. um, to you as I started with Alice by by, by sort of pointing out that she'd said something about throwing up the great wall uh, against Irishness, um, I, I, I imagine, um, uh, given your Nigerian American background, that this is not actually a problem in that sense. Yeah. But but in many ways, you know, have you have you have you two grappled with Joyce um, and with the sort of size of Joyce um, uh, through your writing? And you know, also as a you know, your first published work was a short story. Yeah. Um, uh, with an you know, extraordinary turn in it. Yeah. No, that's. I think when I first encountered Joyce on the page, um, that the thing that I found most inspiring about the work was his willingness to fully um, discuss and grapple with identity. Because I think you said something really interesting and important about, uh, I think, a writer developing a voice. Whenever I talk to my students, one of, uh, voice for me is kind of, the most important thing uh, in writing it, because it really is your identity on the page and it takes a while to find your voice. Um, and I remember when I started writing, that was the one thing I was fixated on, like, what is my voice? How do I get my, how do, who am I on the page? Because every artist who is beginning, you know, copies from others, you know? So I remember some of my first stories sounded like Hemingway's stories or George Saunders stories or Edward P. Jones stories, you know, like they were just more or less facsimiles of those stories because I was careening from one writer to the next, from one style to the next in an attempt to find who I was on the page. Um, and the great thing about reading Joyce for the first time is that you have this visceral sense that he knows who he is on the page. And then, of course, you're a little jealous because it's such a distinct and interesting and identifiable and powerful voice. Um, so when I talk to my students about finding your voice, one of the things I say is that if you encounter a work of art and there's something that flutters inside of you, there is some kind of quickening or attachment that happens to the text, that this is a person who might guide you to figuring out what your voice actually is. And for me, Joyce was undoubtedly one of those people. When I read this book in particular for the first time and then went back and read Dubliners and some of his other work, I uh, recognized elements of who I aspired to become. And perhaps more important than that, I, there was a kind of spiritual resonance, if you will, not to get too hooey, you know, but for me, that was, mm -hmm. it was there. There was something internally that I sensed, a, a kind of artistic connection um, that, that became very important to me. And so for me, that was an indication that I needed to read as much Joyce as I could and, uh, and try to sort of get a sense of what it is in his work that was drawing me in. And what about his work would perhaps be reflected in the work that I would go on to produce later? You know, it's interesting because answering that question, Alice had, had talked about the material more so than the voice, but then you're talking about the sort of the spiritual elements. And, yeah. and in many ways, if you think about Portrait of the Artist, those are the two things we're grappling with in some yeah. way, right? Mm -hmm. Is, you know, the spiritual, the transcendental, almost, you know, the, um, the um, uh, sublime. 
Yeah. Um, and then the materiality of the thing, the object, and that obviously comes out in Ulysses. I don't want to um, monopolize the questions. Uh, we have world enough and time for <laughs> questions from the audience. And I think actually we might need to use that microphone this there. One. These microphones are all bashed. Somebody dropped the mic somewhere. Um, uh, or this one here, yeah. There you go. So if you have, if there are any questions from the audience for Alice or for Tope, um, uh, we would definitely. Well, I think we welcome them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so far. <laughs> Could you just please speak a little bit more about the musicality of a work? Now, now leave out the sirens chapter, but I, <laughs> I, you know, people always say that, and I um, maybe maybe I'm just musically dense. I don't know, but I. I I don't even know what that means. I mean, I know what music means when you look at a score, okay, uh, music score. But in, in the words, I don't, uh, it, it's opaque to me. So anything you say will be wonderful. Thank can, you. Can I do another bit of quoting um, <laughs> the, the scene that I was just talking about? Because I think, you know, you have to let Joyce say it because <laughs> <laughs> there's a wonderful bit Let's see if I can find it. This is in the infirmary. Um, then Brother Michael went away, and after a while, the fellow out of third grammar turned in towards the wall and fell asleep. That was the infirmary. He was sick then. Had they written home to tell his mother and father? But it would be quicker for one of the priests to go himself to tell them. Or, or he would write a letter for the priest to bring. Dear mother, I am sick. I want to go home. Please come and take me home. I am in the infirmary, your fond son, Stephen. How far away they were. There was cold sunlight outside the window. He wondered if he would die. He could die just the same on a sunny day. He might die before his mother came. Then he would have a dead, then he would have a dead mass in the chapel, like the way the fellows had told him it was when little had died. All the fellows would be at the mass dressed in black. All with sad faces, Wells too would be there, but no fellow would look at him. The rector would be there in a cope of black and gold, and there would be tall yellow candles on the altar round the cataphlic, and they would carry the coffin out of the chapel slowly, and he would be buried in the little graveyard of the community off the main avenue of limes. And Wells would be sorry then for what he had done, and the bell would toll slowly. He could hear the tolling. He said over to himself the song that Bridget had taught him. Ding dong, the castle bell, farewell my mother, bury me in the old churchyard beside my eldest brother. My coffin shall be black, six angels at my back, two to sing and two to pray and two to carry my soul away. How beautiful that was. How beautiful the words were when they said, bury me in the old churchyard. A tremor passed over his body. How sad and how beautiful. He wanted to cry quietly, but not for himself, for the words so beautiful and sad like music. The bell, the bell, farewell. Oh, farewell. That's music. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, it, 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 there's rhythm, the rhythm of any given sentence, um, of any, any collection of sentences, uh, word choice, um, all those things, and, and also infused with what, you know, I think most of us expect um, of a piece of music, beauty and sadness, <laughs> you know, um, and so beautiful and sad that it's joyful. Um, so, so that's uh, that's what I go back to when I feel like as a writer, um, I, I'm, I'm not working hard enough at my language. I'll, I'll go back and even read the boring sections of, <laughs> of, of Ulysses just to to hear that a, a certain rhythm, the heartbeat, as we as we heard last night um, at, at, at the dance, um, that that somehow that. It's not just the words, it's not just what they convey. Um, there's something else, and that's something else, for lack of a better word, I call the music.
following up on that, and given that this book uniquely has a long history of public performance of public readings everywhere, obviously, as the ambassador uh, knows in particular, um, is this a book that if someone hadn't read before, you would, and they were a little bit scared of reading it because, you know, it's, it's, it's Ulysses, right? Would you recommend that they maybe listen to it as an audio book? uniquely as opposed to lots of other books, but that this one maybe would benefit from that? Uh, it's a great question. I, you know, I think the experience I had when I went back to Ulysses a few days ago was, you know, you, you know, sometimes when you encounter something and there's a kind of, uh, there's something in the back of your mind that says, this is familiar. There's something here that you've encountered. There's something, some, um, this, this experience rhymes with something else. And as I was reading, I thought, well, this is like reading a news feed, right? Uh, like a kind of news feed on the internet or a Twitter feed or an Instagram feed or seeing a page of TikToks, right? Like, and part of that is because um, I, I think when we encounter a book or a piece of literature, we expect it to go from the beginning to the end and progress and to follow a protagonist as she or he or they do a series of things and then you know there's a climax and then the book is over and uh ulysses resists that in every single way ulysses in many ways is like it's like um he's like joyce like a, the bard of the broadsheet in a way like you know marshall McLuhan has this line about when newspapers emerge, one of the things that happened was that all of a sudden sudden you get all of these points of view and perspectives in one place and humanity has to begin to uh, sort of adapt to that, as opposed to getting one line about how to uh, interpret the world or to interpret events, you know, from God or the church or whatever. The broadsheet and invention of the kind of 18th century says, well, here's all this information, assimilate it or take it as you will. And that's really the Ulysses experience. So I would say to somebody who for the first time is encountering or wants to read the book to uh, think of the book in the same way you might your your feed or the way that you engage with the internet. Um, because I think there's, a, and that's why, and I know we're going to pivot to this point of the conversation perhaps a bit later, but I think that's one reason why Joyce's work and Ulysses in particular remains so relevant today. It's almost as if he predicts the way that we'll engage with information now, mm -hmm. you know, back then. And the, the kind of no distinction between what's happening inside and what's happening outside. The thoughts are just as real and as palpable as you know the thing he encounters as he's walking down the street, and that's becoming more of a reality for us every day. You know that kind of that the the kind of destruction, which is a harsh word, but perhaps appropriate here, of the distinction between internal and external. That is one strong feature of Ulysses. Mm -hmm. That um, that that desire, that that necessity of of taking all information in and attempting to, as it were, curate as an individual what is important for you and perhaps what isn't. That is the experience of going through the book that mm -hmm. I think in many ways echoes the modern experience. You know, I think there, there, there's another aspect, too, that when you're trying to um, convince someone or um, to introduce someone, um, to groom someone to be <laughs> a Ulysses scholar, um, <laughs> uh, you know, I have a friend who has a theory that that literacy has declined since um, school children stopped learning how to read with the Bible or Shakespeare first um, and were moved to see spot go and phonetics. Um, and, and his theory is that um, it would it was better for us when we learn to read, not looking for comprehension. Um, that children were given the Bible and learned to read the words and were assured that somewhere in the future, um, some years hence, you will understand perhaps what these words mean, but that's not what you're reading for. That's not what you're becoming literate for. And in some ways, I think um, Ulysses reminds me of that, um, that, that there is some value and it's, and it's, getting more and more difficult um, in the newsfeed age yeah. to convince people of that. There is some value of reading pure language, not looking for the meaning um, to, to persist through long pages of prose as, as you have in Ulysses um, without quite knowing what you're reading. 
um, so that some kind of comprehension may come later or may come after a number of encounters, but it's not the primary thing. It's, it's, it's sort of sending our eyes back to the language itself um, and making it new again um, and, and letting us be um, learning a, a new language, first time learners, um, so that meaning is not primary. Um, I, you know, I hear from so many book clubs that I visit that we stopped reading that book because it was too hard. Um, we didn't get, didn't get it. Um, and it's, it's maybe getting it is not, the best goal. Um, maybe being there, maybe being on the page, maybe working your way through these dense sentences is a goal in itself. In a sense, uh, Finnegan's Wake is the apotheosis of, of, <laughs> yes. of Ulysses, yeah. right? Yes. Uh, yes, you right. Know, in, in, right? In many ways, the apotheosis of that thing yeah. that you're describing is the experience, uh, the, the experience of encountering and working through words. Um, you took my last question, really, um, because it was going to be about, so I'll open again uh, to the audience, but it was going to be, yeah, is there another one? Yeah, go ahead, yeah. You had a last question. No, no, I, I was actually going to ask both of them, and I'll just you know, say um, um, about, you know, an, an idea of futurity. And in some way, you've both answered that by, I mean, there may be more, but you both answered that by thinking, you know, A, how it's still readable or becoming more readable in some ways. But then also how it constantly poses a challenge uh, and an expectation that that will be in the future revealed. There's a sort of a Christian revelation there. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, as I was thinking about your friend, I was thinking your friend would have done well in 19th century India or Ireland uh, teaching people with Shakespeare and the Bible. <laughs> yes, and, right. uh, but, you know, sure. and, and that idea of revelation. Yes. Right? Um, yeah, that there right. is, a, there is right. a, a sort of a teleology to teaching that is not that you will know it, but that at some point in the future you yes. will have known something. Yes. Yeah. Um, go, ahead, go ahead. Sure. Um, so I guess I'm interested given the theme of this panel, and also a lot of the ways that you spoke about James Joyce as a mountain to climb, as somebody to be jealous of, as, you know, a representative of an Irishness or, a, you know, Irish literary tradition, though we called that into question earlier with the possibility of a prose tradition in Ireland, as something to be resisted. And I also think about, you know, uh, like Virginia Woolf's ambivalence about Ulysses, or, you know, mm -hmm. Samuel Beckett writing to a friend, like just, you know, constantly about, these people, these people would be pleased with toilet paper if James Joyce had happened to wipe his arse with it. <laughs> you know, is it possible as a writer to be happy for James Joyce? Like, <laughs> you know, it, see, it seems like he has this tremendous achievement and, and we always, you know, he's just talked about as, you know, damn, excuse me, uh, <laughs> darn, he really did that, huh? You know, now, now he's a mountain. Now he's something we're jealous of. Now he's something we have to resist, you know? And part of that is the theme of this panel, but is, is it possible to have a real appreciation of Joyce that isn't, that is against maybe in your original sense and not against in a conflictive sense? Huh. What do you think? It's a great question. Um, you know, I, I think it's hard to encounter Joyce that way just because, you know, here's, we're celebrating a book that was published, you know, a century ago. And, and so not many writers can say that. It's, it's, it is, you know, it's, it's an incredible achievement. And I think, I, like many people who uh, read the work, read his work for the first time, knew that in so doing, I was taking on one of uh, modern literature's sort of great writers and somebody who's been proclaimed as such for, for many, many years. Um, but there is no substitute, I think, for actually reading the work. And that's when there is a kind of a relationship between reader and, and writer, in this case, across decades, across the century. And it's there where you decide as an individual whether this work is working for you mm -hmm. or not. And, and so for me, that's what I, um, I took away from it. I, there are other writers I've encountered uh, who don't necessarily, I don't, you know, there are great writers that I'm meant to respect and adore and love. And I don't necessarily have those feelings for those writers because for whatever reason, um, there wasn't that connection. And I can respect those writers intellectually and understand the, uh, their achievements, but um, there is not, I don't feel that kind of deep sense of connection that I do with Joyce. So I think uh, that, it, that that remains, look, if Joyce wasn't um, speaking to our hearts here in the 21st century, he wouldn't, he would, uh, we would no longer 
engaged with the work, there's still something happening there. It's funny, I was thinking the other day about, about his legacy. And, uh, you know, I was reading, for example, Rachel Cusk's work, the outline trilogy, you see a kind of bit of, of, of bloom in, mm -hmm. in the protagonists of those, no, of, of those novels. You know, the protagonist is somebody who's more of a receptacle for what is happening around her. She is collecting voices. She's collecting anecdote in the same way that Bloom is walking around, you know, Dublin. And it's not necessarily, I mean, it's funny, like, why are we supposed to be interested in this man who his wife is having an affair? He's walking around the city. You know, what, what's interesting about that? It's about the fact that he's also collecting voices as he walks. And so that's something, that idea, um, you know, Campbell calls uh, Bloom an everyman in that sense. He's just the person who's like anyone else who's walking around. And so there's certain ideas uh, that from, you know, sort of structural uh, ideas that persist. And also, of course, the story itself that persists, that still speaks to this age in all kinds of important ways. And I think, look, if, if there was nothing there that still resonated, I suspect that the book would begin to fall off syllabi across the country, but there's still something about his work that resonates. Yeah, and I think too that, um, of course, Ulysses is this great monument um, that, that all of us encounter in, in different ways. Um, but now that I've been reading it for 50 years, I first read it, you know, as a young, young woman and a very young writer. Um, there's a lot wrong with it. Um, you know, there are times when when Joyce is just showing off embarrassingly. You know, if you were if I, you know, if he was in my writing workshop, it'd be like, Jimmy, you know, wipe the drool off your face, get your hands out of your pants and um, let's cut this. Um, you know, so the, it's. Um, you know, yeah, it's flawed in in all kinds of ways um, that doesn't diminish it. And 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 rather than um, elicit any kind of jealousy, <laughs> um, uh, I guess the only thing is that um, Joyce doesn't have to write anymore. And I still do because I'm still <laughs> here. <laughs> um, I'm jealous of that. I wish I didn't have to write anymore. Um, uh, but but there's also the sense that we're all in this together. Yeah. You know, you made a lot of mistakes. And you know what? I make a lot of mistakes. All right. OK, I'll give you that. And yet um, look at all the moments you you know, you touch the sky, you, the moments of genius, um, it's all there, um, but it's a sloppy, sloppy work. <laughs> I mean, it should have been a lot shorter. <laughs> <laughs> On that note. <laughs> Um, your writing workshops sound quite fun. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, a little, uh, a little edgy. Um, uh, please join me in thanking two of the smartest, most nuanced, I think, um, most thoughtful readers uh, and writers at working today. So thank you so much, Alice and Tope. It's been a real pleasure. Just uh, a word from me as the showrunner. We'll take another um, very quick five minute break, uh, bathroom break. And um, there is, uh, I, I wrote down these words because I'd forgotten about them. There is an untastable apology for a cup of coffee um, <laughs> at the back. Sorry to anybody <laughs> caterers here. And uh, we will be back in five minutes. <laughs> Thanks. That was really fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. I could have sat there for a lot longer. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's different when you're up on the stage. It's supposed to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. very much. Sure. <laughs> indeed, but, indeed. But I, I really enjoyed that. I yeah. Really, I, I do mean that when I think to the most nuanced of the readers. Oh, right. well, I was thinking more. about your dad because I have no marks. I know. Not, because <laughs> this is hardcover. Yes, OK. You know, but, but these are my old, you know. Yeah, see the marginalia. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is, you know. Yeah. Dollar forty. Yeah, that's the uh, eleven pounds. <laughs> eleven. You're up. Hello. I know. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much for the invite. It was an excuse to like get back into. It. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> to get back out. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No. Yeah. Have a conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Like.
Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I'm teaching uh, in spring. I need to try to finish my book. So. Yeah. You know what? I'm uh, interviewing him six and I. The day here. So, yeah. 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 I guess there's a dinner before. Mm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. But he's separate. No. Okay. Yeah. Sure. You know what? I have Spanish criticism. Before. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, as he writes a lot of great criticism about that, uh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I read a lot of that stuff. Yeah, I had it read. I teach. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. 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 Just read that for lecture in the summer. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad it's interesting. I mean, it's ambitious. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, in that Chess, chess. Chess, chess. Chess, chess. Chess, chess. Test. 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 Yeah. 
I know, I know you all want a break. I am sympathetic to your need for a break. Uh, but there is no pleasure allowed uh, in the course of the day today, not until we get a drink of wine at, uh, at six o'clock. Uh, we're going to move on to the next panel. And um, Catherine O'Callaghan is our chair. And uh, really looking forward to it, really appreciate it. I suppose I can get my copy of Ulysses off the table there. It's like a, it's a prop. Um, uh, thanks very much. I re we, we, there is, by the way, there's a, there's a coffee break after this, like a designated coffee break. So if you're well behaved.
Okay, welcome back everybody. Um, this promises to be a wonderful session um, called Wandered Far Away Over All the Earth. And we have three speakers. So I'm going to introduce the, the three of them now and then they can introduce their own titles um, when they get to the podium. Um, so our first speaker is uh, Shinjani Chattopadhyay, who's an assistant professor of global Anglophone literatures at Berry College, Georgia. She completed her PhD in the Department of English, University of Notre Dame. She works on British and Irish modernisms and global Anglophone literatures. Her monograph in progress, Plurabilities of the City, investigates the construction of metropolitan cosmopolitanism in modernist and contemporary novels. And Shinjani is the author of several book chapters and journal articles which have been published or are forthcoming in James Joyce Quarterly, European Joyce Studies, Joyce Studies in Italy, and modernism, modernity, and print. And then next up, we will have um, Kasia Bartoszynska, who is assistant professor in the Department of Literature in English and the program of women, women's gender and sexuality studies at Ithaca College. Uh, she is the author of Estranging the Novel, Poland, Ireland, and Theories of World Literature, published um, in 2021 by John Hopkins University Press. She's also a translator, most recently, of Zygmunt Bauman's Culture and Art and Sketches in the Theory of Culture. And our third speaker today is Kieran Ward, who is a lecturer in modern and contemporary literature at the University of St. Andrews. His publications include Encyclopedia Joyce um, and James Joyce Ulysses at 100, which is co-edited with uh, Paige Miller for Textual Practice. And he was on the academic committee for the 2019 North American James Joyce Symposium in Mexico City. His monograph, Encyclopedism and Totality in Contemporary Fiction, is forthcoming with Bloomsbury Academic in 2023. Shinji. Can everybody hear me? Is this okay? All right. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, since today we are thinking about the afterlives of Ulysses on its centenary, um, in my presentation, I think about how the readings of Ulysses can change if we take into account the new developments in post-colonial and decolonial theory. And hence the title of my paper, Ulysses and theories of anti-post and decoloniality. So let's get started. James Joyce concludes his famous 1907 essay, Ireland, Island of Saints and Sages with a clarion call to action. He writes, it is well past time for Ireland to have done once and for all with failure. If she is truly capable of reviving, let her awake or let her cover up her head and lie down decently in her grave forever. If she wants to put on the plate that we have waited for so long, this time let it be whole and complete and definitive. But our advice to the Irish producers is the same as that of our fathers. Hurry up, unquote. Here, Joyce not only expresses his opposition to British colonialism, but also unequivocally states his impatience with Ireland's anti-colonial efforts. Joyce's anti-colonialism, particularly his post-colonial impulse in Ulysses, has been extensively studied by various scholars, including Emer Nolan, Enda Duffy, David Lloyd, and of course, Declan Kybert. Post-colonial readings of Ulysses make evident that the novel rejects the hegemony of British colonialism and at the same time, it critiques the insularity of anti-colonial Irish nationalism. Ulysses develops a new Irish identity that is situated in a transnational context and transcends the binary of British colonialism and exclusionary Irish nationalism. Recent scholarship by Arthi Vad and Richard Begum have shown that Ulysses employs modernist aesthetic experimentations to develop this post-colonial Irish identity. However, in my analysis, Ulysses achieves much more than modernist formal experimentations and a post-colonial Irish identity. I argue 
that Ulysses develops an epistemic deconstruction of colonial systems of knowledge. The modernist formal experiments are indeed an articulation of this epistemic deconstruction. But the ultimate achievement of the epistemic deconstruction in Ulysses is its revisioning of the idea of modernity. To analyze this epistemic deconstruction in Ulysses, we need to extend the existing theoretical framework of postcoloniality to decoloniality. Here, I follow Walter Mignolo's framework, which broadly defines decoloniality as a system of thought that displaces colonial systems of knowledge and power. The epistemic deconstruction in Ulysses begins with the way in which the novel revises the relationship between modernity and coloniality. Ulysses challenges the, how the idea of modernity is made to stand for narratives of development and progress and shows that modernity is intertwined with coloniality. In fact, coloniality is engendered by modernity. Ulysses depicts at length how Dublin has embraced technological and industrial modernity. The printing press in Airless, the trams in Wandering Rocks, and the circulation of global commodities depicted in Lestrigonians and other episodes are only a few of the abundant instances in the novel that emphasize Dublin's urban modernity. However, the novel also points out that Dublin's modernity is a direct consequence of its colonial status. One of the prominent instances where Ulysses shows modernity and coloniality as, to borrow Mignolo's phrasing, two sides of the same coin is Wandering Rocks. Wandering Rocks turns the reader's attention away from the two protagonists, Stephen and Bloom, and focuses primarily on the bustling Dublin life. As we all remember, the episode begins with Father John Conmey and concludes with the Vice Regal Cavalcade. Joy scholars have noted again and again that Wandering Rocks enfolds Dublin between a Jesuit priest and a British colonial official to signify that life in Dublin and an extension life in Ireland is confined within the constraints of the Catholic Church and the British colonial regime. Ulysses situates Dublin in the colonial matrix of power, where every minute aspect of Irish life, including human labor and the biosphere, are governed by the British colonial regime. At the same time, Ulysses also develops ways for subverting the authority of the colonial matrix of power. Mignola suggests that the colonial matrix of power can be undone by decoloniality. He defines decoloniality as, I quote, the exercise of power within the colonial matrix to undermine the mechanism that keeps it in place, requiring obeisance. Such a mechanism is epistemic, and so decolonial liberation implies epistemic disobedience, unquote. Mignolo identifies epistemic disobedience or deconstruction of the colonial power structure as the heart of decoloniality. Similar to Mignolo's ideation, Ulysses shows ways for decol decolonial epistemic deconstruction to, to subvert the British colonial matrix of power. Ulysses begins the epistemic deconstruction by distinguishing decoloniality from decolonization. Decolonization is defined as when natives of a colony put an end to the colonial regime and gain the right for self-governance, or in other words, gain independence from the colonial regime. But decolonization does not necessarily mean an end to the colonial power structure. Decolonization has often taken the form where, according to Mignolo, outward coloniality, that is, European direct control over the colonies, has merely transformed into internal colonialism, that is, native elites gaining the right of self-governance and continuing with the colonial narrative of modernity, progress, and capitalism. Such form of decolonization preserves the colonial power structure and falls short of decoloniality because it preserves exactly that which decoloniality aims to deconstruct. Ulysses anticipates the shortcoming of decolonization in Ireland, where the end of the British colonial regime will only turn in 
to internal colonial colonialism spearheaded by native Irish leaders. Ulysses suggests that prominent Irish nationalist movements of the early 20th century demand only for decolonization and not always for decoloniality. For instance, the Cyclops episode portrays the risks posed by Irish nationalist efforts and demand decolonization, but not decoloniality. In this episode, the character of the citizen, a caricature of Michael Cusack, espouses Irish nationalism and expresses strong anti-British sentiments. He bitterly declares, and I quote, to hell with the bloody brutal Sassanacs and complains, and I quote again, any civilization they have, they stole from us. And here they is British and us meaning the Irish. He also catalogs with utmost resentment, as we see on the slide, how British colonization has robbed Ireland of its natural resources and laments, I quote, what do the yellow Jones of Anglia owe us for our ruined trade and our ruined hearts, unquote. However, when he portrays his vision of a free Ireland, he replicates one of the tropes that he has criticized in British colonialism. For instance, for instance, um, as we see here, he imagines that after colonial rule ends in Ireland, Irish trade and commerce will flourish all across Europe. The citizen's vision of Irish decolonization does not displace British capitalist modernity. It only imagines a new agent, Ireland, instead of Britain, governing the capitalist economy. Later in the episode, the citizen's infamous attacks against Leopold Bloom's Jewish identity reveals the citizen's brand of decolonization only transforms British colonialism into inward forms of colonial machinations where the power structures of capitalist modernity are preserved and minorities like Bloom continue being oppressed. Such forms of decolonization have questionable potential for achieving the epistemic deconstruction of colonial ways of thinking that is essential for decoloniality. Ulysses demonstrates that decoloniality is not limited to opposing British colonialism Rather, decoloniality questions the hegemony of Western modernity. For instance, Oxen of the Sun exemplifies decolonial epistemic deconstruction. The episode parodies passages of English prose tracing, tracing its development from Latin and Anglo-Saxon up to the 19th century, including the style of Middle English prose, homi prose homilies, Elizabethan prose chronicles, and the writings of various writers like Daniel Defoe, Charles Dickens, among others. The episode famously ends with a chaosmos of a plurality of voices. Here is a representative sample from the end of the episode. Joyce, in a letter to one of his friends, the artist Frank Budgeon, described the end of the episode as a frightful jumble of pidgin English, Cockney, Irish, Bari slang, and broken doggerel. Joy scholars have previously noted that the end of the episode subverts the hegemony of colonial English and highlights Joyce's modernist style. Additionally, in my view, the end of the episode also constitutes an instance of decolonial epistemic deconstruction. Here, Joyce deconstructs the grammar, syntax, and style of bourgeois English prose and creates a new idiom dominated by proletariat voices. The new pro style is not presented as an alternative to the dominant mod modern English prose. This contrasts the subaltern studies approach where occasionally subaltern historiography is perceived as an alternative to dominant bourgeois historiography. Oxen of the Sun presents this chiasmos as the future of language. The new pro style deconstructs modern Western prose and becomes an instance of decoloniality. And this is something that Barry McRae in the morning was calling the Joyce effect, where future Irish writers would not take ownership of a high bourgeois English style. And we see the foreshadowing of that very clearly in, in the end of the Oxen episode. 
So in conclusion, reading Ulysses with the framework of decoloniality reveals how the novel performs an epistemic deconstruction of colonial modernity that transcends the scope of anti-colonialism and decolonization. However, Ulysses also suggests that decoloniality is not a homogeneous phenomenon that assumes a uniform shape for every community. Continuing the decolonial reading of the novel will show that Bloom, Stephen, Molly, and other minor characters each have their own unique relationship to decoloniality. Future Joy's scholarship will show us how the decolonial epistemic deconstruction in the novel follows different trajectories depending on the identity markers of the characters of race, class, gender, religion, and of course, nationality. This will lead to the development of new models of decoloniality. Additionally, analyzing the plurality of decolonial pathways in Ulysses will have a direct bearing on understanding modern Irish identity or Irish identity in the present. The decoloniality of Ulysses will help us analyze how the newly emerging cultural, racial, and ethnic hybridity of Celtic Tiger and post-Celtic Tiger Ireland can be delinked from the present neocolonial power structures. Thank you. Yes, I should have one or two. Yes, yes, thank you. Okay, and then what do I push to make it go to the next one? The arrow or yeah. Okay. Um hi everyone. Um my paper is called Um How to Read a Classic, Ulysses in the Ming Dynasty. Um and Alice sort of anticipated some of what I'm going to be saying at the end of um the previous panel. So hopefully we're we're well on the way. Um, because we've been talking at various moments over the course of today and yesterday about people starting to read Ulysses, stopping reading Ulysses. Um, and so this question of kind of how you read it is, is what I'm interested in. Um, so uh, at the end of his introduction to the first volume of what was eventually a five volume translation spanning nearly 3000 pages of the Ming Dynasty classic, Jinping Mei, Plum in the Golden Vase, David Roy writes, it is my conviction that if works such as Ulysses or Lolita, which were written in English in our own century, require extensive annotation in order to be properly understood, an artistically complex 16th century Chinese novel, such as Qingping Mei, must also require extensive annotation if it is to be fully appreciated. Like Ulysses and Lolita, the Jinping Mei contains thousands of unidentified allusions to and quotations from earlier works of literature. In my notes, I have striven to identify either direct earlier sources or earlier occurrences for as much of this material as possible. There are a few things that are notable in this statement. Um, one being perhaps what to me registers as a surprising defensive note, um, the need to justify the use of footnotes and the implication that the status of Ulysses or Lolita as valuable texts is unquestioned, whereas that of Jinping Mei must be established. Um, but also significant here is the idea that identifying the sources of allusions or quotations is a crucial component of appreciating the text's complexity. I began reading Jinping Mei earlier this summer and was struck right away by the resemblances between it and Ulysses, and especially between the conditions under which the texts were produced and the histories of their reception. Both emerged at a time of political turbulence um, and at moments when there was both a clear sense of a distinction between high and low culture and also an interest in art that blurred those boundaries. Both are now considered classics, but were not always uncontroversially so. Um, and both are major works of incredible aesthetic innovation. 
while neither fits comfortably into the category of realism, broad as that category may be, there is a sense that each of these novels did something fundamentally new in its way of representing the world. This is in part, though certainly not entirely, because of their representations of sex and the body. Both are works that were notorious for their eroticism, though it must be said that when the two are considered side by side, Ulysses actually seems downright chaste. <laughs> I'm not going to keep listing the resemblances between the two texts, though I do think that they're really fascinating and worthy of further attention. Um, what I want to do instead is to think briefly about what we might learn from their similarities and from their differences, particularly as regards the idea of the kind of reading that they seem to require and what sorts of expectations we have of these books and of their readers. More specifically, I want to suggest that considering them in comparison might free us to think differently about how to read Ulysses and how to encourage more people to read it. So whenever I teach Ulysses, I like to start by giving my students the first two chapters of Declan Kybird's Ulysses and Us, which have the inspiring titles, How Ulysses Didn't Change Our Lives and How It Still Might Do So. Kybert's argument is a bracing polemic, arguing that Ulysses was, quote, wrenched out of the hands of the common reader, um, squirreled away into the ivory tower by teams of specialist academics who revel in buzzwords and obscurity. But all hope is not lost, he tells us. There is still the possibility that we can reclaim the novel from the rapacious scholar brigands and reinstate a more meaningful and authentic relationship to the text. We can do so, he argues, by engaging it in a more direct and intimate way. Ulysses, he says, quote, was designed to produce readers capable of reading Ulysses. The text can teach us how to read it if only we trust and allow it to. This is a very useful and reassuring thing to tell students when they're about to start reading the novel, but I'm not entirely convinced that it's actually true. Of course, this may be because I'm one of those academic brigands myself, so my reasoning here is more than a little bit self-interested, but the fact remains that whatever skepticism readers of Ulysses may have about academics, once they hit ineluctable modality of the visible, they either stop dead or they start looking around for some help. And this is where Kybert actually has a real point and where David Roy, translator and annotator of Jinping Mei, might be slightly off the mark. Because when you reach that moment of difficulty in Proteus, what you need is not a scholarly apparatus, a journal article about Stephen and epistemology, or even the footnote that tells you that ineluctable modality of the visible is a reference to Aristotle's metaphysics, but an explanation of what on earth he's talking about. And so what you reach for is not Ulysses annotated, but Harry Blumeyer's The Bloomsday Guide, or the more recent Guide to Ulysses by Patrick Hastings, or if you really know what you're doing, you reach for Dan's book, which it's worth pointing out, has the most beautiful cover of all of them. Um, but indeed, in that moment of frustration, I might need a little more than an explanation of Aristotle. I would also benefit from a brief explanation of why Joyce is doing this to me. What is happening at this moment? And why I should admire it rather than throwing the book across the room? And the guides are just the thing for that. Um, Stephen's mind is tussling with the problem of the changing face of the world in relation to the reality behind it. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. Patrick Hastings offers even more moral support. Ah, come back, there he is. <laughs> Dense and difficult to follow, Proteus is where most first time readers of Ulysses throw in the towel. Don't despite the fact that even the most serious Joycean could spend an entire career reading deeply in this episode, you needn't get bogged down if you don't want to. As I mentioned earlier, the permission to skip over bits, right? Um, but we tend to feel some amount of guilt about turning to these guides or to perceive it as cheating. Certainly my students do. And it doesn't help that in every other class of mine, I've told them to please, for the love of God, just read the text, stop reading the spark notes, right? Just do the assigned reading. Kybert, I think, actually contributes to this problem of making them feel inadequate for wanting assistance. Just read the book, he tells us. It will show you the way. Kybert makes this argument because he wants to reclaim the book from the academic industry and give it back to everyday people. But he seems to think that the only way to do that is to leave their reader on their own with the text. 
This is where the comparison to Jinping Mei is instructive and can help us think about other possibilities. David's, David Roy's translation is laden with footnotes that, that rival those of Ulysses annotated. It's an incredible feat and a real gift to scholars of the novel, even to those who can read it in the original language. But I mostly don't look at those footnotes when I'm reading, just as I mostly don't read Ulysses with the annotations beside me. I turn to them occasionally, particularly if I'm working on something scholarly, but they usually aren't what I need when I'm reading. They answer a different kind of question from those that generally arise as I'm making my way through the book. Readers of Jinping Mei in Ming Dynasty China would not have had footnotes. What they would have had is commentary. Um, so let me explain, and I want to just briefly make clear that I am not a scholar of East Asian studies. Um, my knowledge of this, like I'm a total novice. Um, so I also wanna give credit to Professor Marm Epstein who taught me um, Jinping Mei and who taught me much of what I'm telling you. Um, so the Ming Dynasty, which lasted from 1368 to 1644, was a time of great change, one that we would tend to describe using terms like the rise of modernity, though as we know, we should also be skeptical of such terms. Um, significantly, it is not the moment when fiction is invented in China. That came much earlier, already in the 11th century. There's an idea of invented stories or imagined narratives, nor is it when printing first emerges. But it is a time when printing becomes cheaper and when commercial publishing emerges, as opposed to government publishing, and literacy rates soar. So in that sense, it is in some ways comparable to Europe at the same time. Um, fiction, however, had a relatively low cultural value. The word for it, xiao shuo, means gossip or petty talk. Scholarship, however, was very respectable. So the way to elevate fiction and mark it as worthy of attention was to package it with scholarship, commentary. Indeed, this difference in prestige is so significant that we know almost nothing about the author of Jinping Mei or of the other great classical Ming novels, but we do know quite a bit about the commentators. When I say the text was packaged with commentary, I mean it quite literally. Not only was it printed with various prefaces and introductions, but also with interlinear notes and a running block of commentary above in the eyebrow. So if you look at this image, what you'll see is that there are single columns of text, but also moments where there are double columns. Um, so those double columns are actually commentary interspersed with the text of the novel. Um, and then above in the block there, the eyebrow of the text, there's further commentary. So in this case, um, what you're seeing is the text of the novel and then in the top right corner there, um, those are glosses of some of the terms that are used um, describing um, elements of Buddhism. And then in the top, there's a kind of commentary that discusses more broadly the philosophical implications of those Buddhist terms, right? Um, it's worth pointing out that these commentators were much more hands-on than today's scholars. Um, they would actually edit the text, they would remove chapters, they would shuffle pieces around, edit out parts they thought weren't very good as they saw fit. Um, Joyce, I think, would have loved this in some ways. We can see different versions of edi uh, different editions of Ulysses as a version of this, um, but as a kind of counterfactual, it's also sort of fun to imagine what Joyce would have done as a commentator of various classic texts if he could. Um, so the commentaries in the Ming Dynasty were there to help readers understand and appreciate the text. They would provide glosses of difficult words or explanations of concepts or mini essays about things that the commentator thought were interesting or important or observations about what the text is doing. So Zhang Zhupo's commentary on Jinping Mei, for example, is full of observations about the structure of the chapters and the way elements contrast within them. He tells us to pay attention to the transitions between scenes or how people are introduced. He speculates about the function of different characters and why some get less space on the page than others. He reminds us over and over that everything in the text is there for a reason and even the seemingly irrelevant parts are doing something. This is in many ways similar to the kinds of explanation we find in the guides to Ulysses, but with one major distinction. Where the guides to Ulysses cast us in the position of the dutiful reader struggling to understand, the Ming commentaries invite a different relationship to the text. They invite us to see ourselves as its author. Zhang Zhupo tells us quite explicitly, quote, 
If you read the Jinping Mei as a work of literature by the author, you will still be deceived by it. You must read it as though it were your own work in order to not be deceived by it. And he goes on, though you should certainly read it as though it were your own work, it is even better to read it as a work that is still in its early planning stages. Only if you start out with the assumption that you will have to work out every detail for yourself in order to avoid being deceived, will you avoid being deceived. This is of course oriented towards understanding the novel. If you imagine yourself as author, you will be better at perceiving the various choices the author has made and understanding how they contribute to the meaning. But as David Rolston has argued, one of the critical functions of Ming Dynasty commentary was to invite readers to imagine themselves as authors of the text in order to encourage them to write fiction themselves. And if you couldn't write a novel, then you could at least write a commentary on one. Zhang Zhupo says, this is every bit as difficult as writing a novel. So that notches another point for the academic brigands, we might say. Um, and so my final question is, um, what, if we do, what if we were to read Ulysses in this way as well? Um, this beautiful new edition that Catherine Flynn has edited with footnotes and introductory, episode, introductory essays for each episode and this wonderfully creative layout is a step in this direction. But we could take it even further by filling up all that blank space on the side potentially with a kind of running commentary, while of course leaving some space as well for the readers to write their own commentary on the other side. In sum, what I wanna suggest is that we academics stop treating the various reader guides or maybe even spark notes as our competition or as a sign that our students or our friends are cheating and instead bring these literary miscellany into the conversation and invite a different relationship to them. One that positions readers as co-creators and collaborators. Let them read commentaries, let them write commentaries. Let the literary sphere be crowded with the chatter of competing arguments and interpretations. Let Zhang Zhupo be our new guide to Ulysses. Thanks. Uh, this oh yeah right so. Yeah, do you have it on your computer? I do have it on my computer, but I don't have a USB. Do you have a USB? Can you, can you, <laughs> you can just I, join the Zoom. I can email you a link. So, or you can it email it to me. Okay. Uh, oh, there we go. Oh, will it, will it work with the audio? Then? I think. I think it will. Oh, do you know what slide you have the audio on? Yeah. So. Um, it doesn't seem like it.
Give me the email again. Perhaps while we're waiting, we could just, I have a question ready already for <laughs> Kasia after that brilliant commentary. So I'm going to throw it out to her, which was that in the um, Catherine Flynn's new edition, if you haven't seen it, it's a massive tome. Mm -hmm. And one of the things is she has these essays in between the mm -hmm. book. Is that sort of like the commentaries, you but you're encouraging the reader to yes. also do that? Well, as you can yeah. see also um, in the picture I posted, in that case, in some, some of them, it's like the commentaries are interspersed within the text. So it really would be a kind of side by side. Yeah, I, mean, you know, I think it's hard for us to sort of imagine even how you would read it that way. If the text is layered one on top of the other, but there is something a little bit tempting about. It. But we could try and see. You know? Yeah, I mean, um, she's interspersing it because she has she's broken up Ulysses itself. So mm -hmm. each of the introductory essays mm -hmm. are in between the episodes, and we've the nineteen twenty two edition, and then she's added all the what she thinks are the correct corrections right. on the edges, and then the most useful footnotes gathering from all those um, books that you, you have you. But then, so this would be also, I think what happens is that we feel um, sort of empowered to add footnotes that explain terms or add context. Yeah. But the idea of a footnote that would say like, pay attention to this scene, this is a really important character, or notice what this ha what happens here, that would be something that, different. Yeah, right? yeah. And I wonder, that, that might change our reading experience in kind of fundamental ways. Yeah. Absolutely. And it, it, I also was thinking of Alice McDermott's points earlier, thinking of the, the silent reader who actually is sort of performing the text in their mind mm -hmm. and how much as we're reading, I mean, this is going to cause you'd need to nearly have an orchestral ability in your mind if you're reading and you have the footnotes and you have the side notes and your own notes. But um, so I don't know if that's quite possible, but somehow we're being asked to sound even more in our minds than we already um, have been. Anyone want to ask a question so far? We might as well get a few done. Yes, please. Do you have a mic maybe? I, I just want to comment on what you were just talking about. If you move it to the digital version, I have it on Kindle. Uh, I mean, everything you kind of talked about it you, like, it's easy to imagine it looking like the chinese version right on kindle i don't think there's a limit there uh you uh i was solo snow we published a book two years ago on on our, our irish book day which is all digital because you could have short stories that had music in them you have explanations there's dance and i when i read the when i got the kindle version I was thinking it immediately, you, you know, you can use Kindle on a word that goes to the Kindle source, but let's say you had more scholarly commentary. I think there's real, you know, the next wave of that publication digitally could right. do a lot of things you're talking about. Well, and yeah. the possibility to do like hyperlinks, right? So you could yeah. kind of follow them if you wanted to, but also keep reading the text. They're basically yeah. there if you use it, but right now you're limited to the Wikipedia or something, but they could have, Right. hyperlinked to what was there which it doesn't right. do at the moment yeah but it also i think it does require you know as a starting point that we would sort of accept the idea that it would be worthwhile yes. to I, read I, the text that's the only way to stop him telling us what to think of it as we're reading which i think we're still sort of averse to right we're like no no you know i don't, I don't want to know what you know so and so thinks or i want that somewhere else in an essay at the end rather than like what if it's right there alongside the text yeah. um so I'm Excellent. guessing Barry as a novelist might. <laughs> Those kind of commentaries, you know, like in classical texts, right. only are a very useful, oh, sorry, are very useful insights into um, the time that the commentaries were written. Um, right. pre precisely because modes of interpretation and assumptions change uh, so quickly, whereas the text doesn't. So you'd need lots of these editions, which of course is good news for us. Um, right. We'd have to right. keep doing it. I think are we ready to? I can jump in. Yeah. Jump in. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Super. Uh, sorry about that, and thank you for your patience, and thanks for the IT uh, support as well. 
Um, all right, uh, good afternoon. Uh, and a quick word of thanks to Colleen and Mary for inviting me to this super event. I've been having a great time. I'm sure you all have as well. Uh, so today I'm gonna speak uh, more about a specific example or case study of Ulysses in the world than about any kind of great theory of, of Ulysses. Um, although this example has occasioned for me some reflections on the methods of choice studies, uh, and I'll use those to frame uh, what's effectively going to be a close reading. Um, what I'm discussing today is drawn from an article I wrote for the journal Textual Practice Academic Brigands uh, that focused on the critical responsibilities and possibilities of reading Joyce's transcultural reception and influence in a cli climate in which Joyce's status in literary studies is arguably hypercanonical. Uh, and in that article, I take Sam Selvin's 1956 novel, the Lonely Londoners as a key example of a novel engaged with Joyce's afterlife. And what I was really trying to think about in that article were ways of registering and studying Joyce's afterlives across world literature. Uh, you know, if we're to stake a claim for Joyce's continued relevance in his transcultural ubiquity, which I think we should, um, uh, but that, that which is also to say his importance to literature is often introduced to academic study under the institutional signs of post-colonialism, world literature, area studies, then what steps can be taken to ensure that the interaction between Joyce and such world lit such literatures is not a one-sided interaction? How do we read Ulysses in the world when Ulysses itself is such an overdetermined text that carries such enormous cachet? Not just Ulysses, all of, all of Joyce really. And how can Joyce studies ensure that world literatures go on to inform new perspectives on, on the big man himself. So these are some of the questions that animated my work on Selvin's engagement with Joyce, especially because to my mind, The Lonely Londoners is particularly useful in addressing them. Um, it's Joycean engagement is not uh, particularly straightforward. I'd, not, I'd say it's also not especially flattering to Joyce, which is interesting in itself. So for those of you who don't know The Lonely Londoners, it's an extremely important text of Caribbean and Black British literatures. It's much beloved in the UK. Uh, it's increasingly widely taught at high school level. Uh, it's one of the first novels written entirely in a Caribbean dialect. It's actually the second, as far as I'm aware, after uh, V.S. Reed's New Day was the first one. Uh, and it concerns the trials and tribulations of a group of recent Caribbean migrants uh, in London, Black Caribbean migrants. Uh, and one African uh, character as well. So there's a passage about two thirds of the way through The Lonely Londoners that bears a conspicuous resemblance to Penelope. And it looks like that. Uh, it's typically referred to as summer. And as you can see, it's Joycean quality is obvious in its form alone. It's one single unpunctuated paragraph. It immediately recalls the form of Penelope. Summer, I would say, echoes Penelope at the level of content too. In Penelope, Molly recalls past erotic encounters and fantasizes new ones. In Summer, we get a description of the protagonist, Moses, and his friends liming in Hyde Park, cruising for women, negotiating the complexities of erotic desire as racialized subjects in the imperial center. Now, much to my surprise, Joyce scholars hadn't, haven't really touched the Selvin uh, example very much. That was weird for me to find. I think that we find Ulysses in one of the foundational novels of the Black British and Anglophone Caribbean canons is surely extremely notable. But I want to propose that for Joyce studies and modernist studies more broadly, the Joyce Selvin connection is more complicated than the case of a heretofore unrecognized illusion or underestimated influence or at least it should be more complicated than that because studying Joyce's global afterlives can raise really thorny questions about what we do when we read for Joycean allusions and when we attribute Joycean influence, particularly to writers who, like Selvin, have been important in the development and institutionalization of minoritized literary fields. Claims of Joycean engagement aren't neutral. They loop uh, that text into Joyce's cultural capital for good or ill. And as Mark Wolliger says, no one wants Joyce the god of modernism to become Joyce the patron saint of the colonized. So in the absence of many uh, Joycean approaches to Selvan, I found myself thinking particularly of Srinivas Aravamadan's classic reading of G. V. Desani, uh, his Joycean engagement in All About H. Hatir. 
Aravamadan writes uh, that um, Desani, who was often read as imitative of Joyce, ought rather to be seen as affiliative to him. For Aravamadan, Hatia bears a relationship of creative affiliation to Ulysses. And I want to propose that something that makes Selvin's Joycean engagement really notable to Joyce studies is that it's the inverse of that relationship, one of creative disaffiliation. And in that creative disaffiliation, we have one model for studying Ulysses' afterlives without tangling with the pitfalls of hypercanonicity. So, as I mentioned, summer is Selvin's most conspicuous engagement with Ulysses and the Lonely Londoners, but I'd actually argue that Selvin's use of Joyce is foreshadowed earlier in the novel in a subtle and uh, instructive reference to Molly Bloom's famous last words. I'm going to talk about the word yes again, as we've been, as we were at the start of the day. Um, Selvin frames his later invocation of Penelope in a conversation between the characters Tolroy and Tanti uh, about the broken down marriage of um, two other characters, Agnes and Lewis. Lewis, after, quote, putting such a beating on Agnes that she left him for good, has been asking Tolroy and the rest of his male friends if he can help him find where Agnes is staying. And Tanti refuses to, to tell Tolroy, explaining that Agnes plans to have Lewis charged with assault. Bring him up for assault. Yes, I advise her. That's the only way to stop him, the way he getting on. And she say yes? Yes, she say yes. So you just wait and see. So Tolroy's, uh, Tanti's reported, yes, she say yes, clearly resembles, and therefore I alludes to, I would say, Molly's, yes, I say yes. Yes, I said yes. But this yes carries a resonance different to that of Molly's acceptance of Bloom's proposal. The collective yes of Agnes and Tanti transforms Molly's affirmative into a direct challenge to the masculinity of Lewis and the boys. Not I will yes, but this combative yes, so you just wait and see. As Moses has warned Lewis, women in this country have rights over here. It's as if the, the yes of Agnes and Tanti signals participation in this new sexual economy. Not exactly Molly's yes of mutual dependence and desire, but a yes that nevertheless asserts, like Molly, an expressive agency beyond the understanding of the male protagonists. In Selvin's interrogation of the loneliness of his Londoners, the operations of sexuality and desire are at the fore. And in this, Penelope, before we even reach summer, is linked to this new sexual economy created by migration and urbanity. And it's less surprising in that light that Selvin should choose to make his most sexually explicit episode one that resembles Penelope so clearly. And so here are, here are some lines uh, from near the end of summer. All these things happen in the blazing summer under the trees and in the park on the grass with the daffodils and tulips in full bloom and a sky blue. Oh, it does really be beautiful. Then to hear the birds whistling and see the green leaves come back on the trees. And in the night, the world turn upside down and everybody hustling. That is life. That is London. In the rhythm of these lines with their accumulating conjunctions, attention to nature, the choice of the word bloom, Selvin nods to Penelope, deepening the section's formal connection with specific details. Um, but just, and just like the final moments of Penelope, the end of summer figures this rapt and libidinous nostalgia. While Molly conflates memories of Gibraltar, Gibraltar and Poldy's proposal, Selvin's narrator recalls the exceptional state of the London summer, when nature comes back to life after all those cold, wet months. But summer doesn't end in the same orgasmic affirmation as Penelope. Selvin strikes a decidedly flatter and more ambivalent tone. Oh Lord, Galahad say when the sweetness of summer get in him, he say he would never leave the old Britain as long as he live. And Moses sigh a long sigh like a man who lived life and see nothing at all in it and who frighten as the years go by, wondering what it is all about. So while the character of Galahad, who's a new arrival in London, is still swept up by the magic of the London summer, Moses, who's been around for a few, looks at his friend and finds in the prospect of yet another summer this existential dread. So in summer, then, Selvin makes a series of allusions, allusions to Joyce, only to then diverge from him. Summer doesn't revoice Joyce, it disidentifies Moses from Molly. And between the, the revoicing of Molly's yes by Agnes and Tanti and, the, and this, this disidentification of Moses from Molly in summer, 
Selvin's use of Penelope seems to ask us to take Penelope as a foil for something in the lives of the boys, as if Penelope is meant to signal something that contributes to or participates in Moses' feeling of loneliness and futility. So when Moses sighs his long sigh in the face of Galahad's excitement at the memory and prospect of the London summer, he's feeling, as Kate Holden puts it, that, quote, the, Lon the wild element of the city's sex life is not so much the freedom offered by London as the racialized and racialized sexual fantasies animating British life. As Holden persuasively argues, the London summer isn't the ex exceptional carnivalesque state it seems and that the, the boys want it to be, although Selvin appears to frame his characters as triumphantly conquering the city through its women, summer actually provides a highly stratified picture of the operations of sexuality and desire in London. The encounters Selvin represents are determined entirely by socioeconomic status and race. First, the women are, uh, of summer are sex workers and migrant domestic workers, but then, then Selvin moves on to focus at greater length on the rich English themselves, particularly those who look to Moses and the boys for more transgressive activities. In each of these encounters, the apparent sexual freedom of the summer looks more like the freedom of wealthy white English people to fetishize the poor and the racialized. So as Selvin writes, The cruder you are, the more the girls like you. You can't put on any English accent for them or play la -di da or tell them that you're studying medicine in Oxford or try to be polite and civilized. They don't want that sort of thing at all. They want you to live up to the films and stories they hear about black people living primitive in the jungles of the world. So it's in this light that Selvin's use of Joyce starts to look especially suggestive, I think. In Penelope, one of Molly's most conspicuous fantasies hinges explicitly on the transgression of interraciality. And this is from the RTE players, the best, best uh, audiobook version of Ulysses, I think. Sometimes, by the Lord God, I was thinking, would I go round by the quays there some dark evening where nobody'd know me and pick up a sailor off the sea that'll be hot on for it and not care a pin whose I was, only do it off up in a gate somewhere. Or oh, one of those wild-looking gypsies in Rathfarnham had their camp pitched near the Bloomfield Laundry to try and steal our things if they could. I only set mine there a few times for the name, Model Laundry, sending me back over and over some old one's old stockings. That blackguard-looking fellow with the fine eyes, peeling a switch, attack me in the dark and ride me up against the wall without a word. Or a murderer. Anybody. So the erotic potential of wild-looking gypsies is contingent on Molly's understanding of them as racialized others, complete with primitive criminal tendencies. And in this moment, Molly does indeed figure as bound up in the racialized sexual fantasies animating British life. Since Summer focuses at such length on white sexual transgression, I contend that Selvin draws on Penelope and the risque reputation of Ulysses by extension as a marker of the white woman's sexual transgression. When Selvin disidentifies Moses from Molly, Molly stands in for an idea of the liberated white woman whose sexual liberation depends upon race as a site of fetish. And I'm aware, by the way, that Molly's uh, race is not quite as simple as white woman, uh, but since she doesn't experience um, race in a way akin to characters who are more clearly racialized, like Bloom or Sissy Caffrey, I think it's fair for Selvin to identify her with whiteness, right, rightly or wrongly. Um, Moreover, when Selvin has Agnes and Tanti appropriate Molly's yes, he intimates that the rights Caribbean women are seizing may equally be premised on a fundamentally racist conception of the Caribbean man. And again, another caveat, I'm, I'm in no way excusing Selvin's unambiguous misogyny and misogynoir throughout the novel. I'm happy to talk about that later. Um, all of this is to say, not to say, of course, that Selvin's disidentification of Moses from Molly means that Moses stands outside of this dynamic, Notwithstanding the impossibility of doing so, his behavior throughout summer and the book as a whole demonstrates that for all his sighing and ambivalence, he's more often than not happy to take part in London's sexual economy. It is to say that in Selvin's use of Joyce, he invites his readers to understand Penelope, its style and content in terms of whiteness, not the formal firstness that shaped Ulysses' early canonization. In summer itself, Selvin's Calypsonian aesthetic subsumes the Joycean one, subverting it by casting it as a form that ultimately excludes and alienates Moses and the boys. 
And the very final vignette of summer, um, immediately preceding Moses' long sigh from earlier, makes this clear. So we hear of a Jamaican who was once picked up by, quote, a woman in Chelsea in a smart flat with all sorts of surrealistic paintings on the wall. The poor fella bewildered and asking questions to improve himself because he set up look like the world of art, but the number not interested in passing on any knowledge. She only interested in wanting, and in the heat of the emotion, she called the Jamaican a black bastard, though she didn't mean it as an insult, but as a compliment under the circumstances. So beyond simple confirmation of the diagnosis of blackness as a site of fetish, this story forces the reader to consider that the world of art and access to it may not necessarily be free of the politics of the exclusionary status quo, may not necessarily be aesthetically autonomous, and may in fact depend upon the denigration of the black subject and for its integrity. Given Ulysses' reputation as high modernism, I'm minded to take this vignette as a hint that we should read the section's appropriated Joycean form as a cipher for that same world of art. And moreover, that it leads to the Jamaican man giving the woman a thump recalls the circumstances that lead to the combative yes of Agnes and Tanti, as if the behavior of the woman in Chelsea is equally implicated in the new forms of agency Caribbean women exercise in London. Appropriating Penelope for the novel's ballads, Joyce's canonical firstness is recast as whiteness aesthetic of fetishism, one end of the continuum of anti-Black racism. Ulysses, artfully appropriated and subverted by Selvin's distinctive Calypsonian aesthetic, becomes little more than the function of the racialized sexual economy of Britain. And so by way of a very quick conclusion, if the goal of the study of Joyce's global afterlives should be mutually transformative dialogue, the case of the Lonely Londoners is exemplary of both the potential and the difficulty of that study. Selvin draws on Joyce's canonization through firstness, and casts that formal experimentalism as a factor in the alienation and isolation of his characters, which is to say that he requires his readers to understand Joyce both in terms of his canonicity or greatness and his difference or particularity. And as the example of The Lonely Londoners demonstrates, reading with an eye for creative disaffiliation may provide one method towards a study of Ulysses in the world that sidesteps the problems of hypercanonicity by making legible the distinctive aesthetic qualities of minoritized literatures. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kieran. Um, we've five minutes maybe to just make sure we have enough time for a, a, a short break for any other questions. Yes, I, I, can, I can ask a question, perhaps, actually, of Kieran, which is, um, it's really striking to me, and maybe this is a kind of anachronistic observation or projecting from current debates, but it's really striking to me that the, the yes, she says yes, is about calling the police. Um, and I wonder if you have thoughts on that, or if that, if you would say that is an anachronistic reading, you know, that's bringing in contemporary... No, no, I, I don't think it is at all. I think it's, um, I think it's uh, an... It's part of what I think we should identify in Selvin's novel as uh, simply misogyny. Actually, he's he's much more interested in um, he's not he's not really interested in seriously engaging with and platforming women's voices and associating women with the black women with the police in that way. That with that carceral imagination is not not very uh, not very. It's not on. It's not mm -hmm. cool. Mm -hmm. uh, when I teach the Lonely Londoners, actually, I think and it's, it's really important to teach it alongside something else. Uh, particularly um, Jean Reese's uh, short story, Let Them Call It Jazz, which is um, spectacularly good at doing the opposite of what um, Selvin does in that calling mm -hmm. the police mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. Thank you. I'll just do a quick question to Shinchini that I was wondering about. Um, do you see Bloom as a hopeful figure within the framework? Does he interrupt the sense that the rest of the citizens are moving towards a new Ireland that will just be a sort of repetition under Irish rule? D does he interrupt that for you? Yeah, certainly. I, I do think that Bloom represents a certain version of decoloniality because 
especially in the Cyclops episode when um, the citizen is is talking about his nationalism, Bloom tries to put in his voice and he tries to disagree with the citizen, but his voice is drowned out by by the other patrons of the pub. But Bloom certainly does represent um, a decolonial, uh, the, the decoloniality, and and we see that in Cersei when he's thinking of the new Jerusalem and. It has its problems, but he is still thinking of restructuring the capitalist economy. He's still thinking of a different version of modernity. So, so yeah, definitely. Hi, um, I'm interested in the tension that emerged with uh, two, both of the talks. Uh, two of the talks about. On one hand, we have. Oxen and Ulysses generally as an example of uh, decolonial epistemic deconstruction, you called it. On the other hand, we have its status as a like hyper canon work, you know, kind of and a hyper, a hyper canon within English literature, you know, so like it's there seems to be a tension there. And I'm wondering what is the value of it offering this kind of deconstruction if it can still be taken up and then serve later as you know a symbol or a cudgel or a mothership hovering over later writers work you know preventing them from engaging in the same kind of deconstruction or needing to be deconstructed itself um, i mean <clears throat> i think i think the answer to that question is it does it does both and um, there are lots of books in the world, and Ulysses doesn't have to be, <laughs> doesn't have to be the only one. That's, that sounds flippant. Um, it's not meant to be. Uh, I, I think Ulysses is exactly the way Shinjini characterized it. I think its reputation is another thing that's beyond the control of, the, and that's, that's partly what Selvan is in, engaging with. Um, I, he's an interesting reader of Penelope, but I don't think he's a particularly interested one. Um, it's not he's not engaging with it in the same way that other writers like like Desani, I would say, uh, are engaging with it in a much more rigorous uh, way. Yeah, I, I agree with Karen that Ulysses itself, it's trying to reconstruct or, or dismantle the existing canon, but the book itself does not have a lot of control over its future reception. That's the work of future joy scholars. So I guess it, it depends on how the other writers are responding to Ulysses in, in the future and how the canonical status is developing from that. Thank you so much. Um, could you please join me in thanking our three wonderful people? Don't go anywhere except to get a, get a cup of coffee. We are coming back to, I think we're traveling to Russia and um, gosh, I don't have my, um, Those things can be true. we're going to Russia, South America and to an apocalyptic future uh, in the next panel. And then there will be a Nostos. There will be a homecoming with, uh, with John McCourt's keynote talk. So um, stay with us. We'll take, I think we can manage eight minutes. We've done amazingly well so far. So we can manage eight or 10 minutes. Oh, it was a great panel. Yeah, super. <laughs> Thank you. It's basically the same. I also, I have in the red Lonely Londoners. Now I want to put you the audio. Thank you.
Barry. <laughs> I see a lot of talking going on there in the back. And not a whole lot of not a whole lot of academic work at all. After lunch, yeah, because I had some things to do this morning. So I uh, I think I st I started the day by saying that Mary has been heroic, and I don't understand how she's still standing. I'm going to extend that to all of you. Uh, uh, it has been a long day, and the last two panels, I'm very excited about them. Our panel, and then a lecture. I'm very excited about them. I'm not going to take up any more time. If you're watching us on the live stream, thank you for being there. We are running miraculously only 10 minutes behind time, uh, better than a German train these days. Um, and uh, and we are about to take start off with our uh, nominally 3.45 p.m. panel. I'm going to hand over to my neighbor, colleague, friend, Jessica Berman uh, from the University of Maryland in, in Baltimore County, who's going to chair this panel. Thanks, Jessica. So glad to be here. Sorry I wasn't here for the entire day, but that means I've got, I'm still standing. So <laughs> um, our first speaker for this panel is Malcolm Sen. He's an associate professor at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and directs the environmental humanities specialization offered by the Department of English there. His research focuses on questions of sovereignty, migration and race as they emerge in climate change discourse his literary archive spans global Anglophone, Indian, and Irish literatures. He's the co-editor of Postcolonial Studies and Challenges of the New Millennium, 2016, the editor of The History of Irish Literature and the Environment, 2022, congratulations, <laughs> and Race in Irish Literature and Culture um, to be published in 2023, busy person. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and introduce the other speakers as well so I can get out of the way. Um, our second speaker will be Jose Verga, who is assistant professor of Russian on the, Bryn, uh, the, the Myra T. Cooley Lectureship in Russian Studies at Bryn Mawr College, where he teaches all eras of Russian culture and specializes in prose of the 20th and 21st centuries with an emphasis on experimental works. His first book, All Future Plunges to the Past, James Joyce and Russian Literature, 2021, examines the reception of Joyce's fiction among Russian writers from the 1920s to the present day. And bear with me, our third speaker is Michelle Clayton, who is Associate Professor of Hispanic Studies and Comparative Literature at Brown University. She specializes in modern and contemporary Latin American literature, the historical avant-garde and interdisciplinary aesthetic practices and has published articles on these topics in journals such as La Revista de Estudios Hispanicos, Modernism, Modernity, Modernist Culture, and Dance Research Journal. Her first book, Poetry in Pieces, focused on the Peruvian po poet Cesar Vallejo, who's who, uh, also celebrating a centenary this year, and she is currently finishing a book in, on the role of dance as image and practice in international avant-garde, tentatively titled Articulations, Scenes of the Modern. So welcome, Malcolm. Thank you, everybody. It's three, uh, it's exactly four o'clock, so I'm gonna try and make this into an uplifting talk, as my <laughs> title slide suggests. What comes after the post-colonial Joyce, the scientific Joyce, and the cartographical Joyce? What braids together Joyce in philosophy, Joyce in history, and Joyce in modernism? How does the contemporary reader, whether white or colorful, approach the, quote, cricket weather, the heavenly weather of the Ulysses? As the Amazon burns to a cinder, Pakistan suffocates under perilous waters, and the ice melt from the Arctic takes on catastrophic forms. Leopold Bloom ponders in Ulysses, heat wave won't last, always passing the stream of life. Nonetheless, it is the seemingly predetermined course of human history's unceasing longevity that ruptures in the Anthropocene. History is no longer a shout in the street, 
as refreshingly anti-colonialist and life-affirming as that might have appeared in Joyce's time. History coagulates today as carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It floods over our doorsteps as rising oceanic waters. It thickens the air, which prophecy breathes. Surely Joyce's stream of life is now ridiculously and alarmingly nothing more than a litany of silent endings and predicted extinctions. History as a civilizational hiccup. What does an environmental Joyce look like? Although Joyce intended to write in Dubliners, as he noted, the moral history of my country, such a history could be etched over a materially focused, ecologically nuanced topography by the time he wrote Ulysses. Here, he revises the colonial map to represent, we might say, a cartography of the oppressed. But a further point of interest propels this book broadly focused on varieties of colonial anxiety. What Michael Seidel calls Joyce's epic geography in his novel points not only to Joyce's correlation between topography and history, but also proclaims an equation between weather and character. A geographical determinism that extends to encompass a correspondence between climate and politics in, in Ulysses. Seidel notes, in Ulysses, Joyce works with a climactically displaced hero. If the Semitic bloom has a difficult time of it in Ireland, a Northwestern nation, he also has his difficulties with the Mediterranean sun culture, the climate in which the prototypical Odysseus sails. Bloom himself declares in Eumaeus, I for one certainly believe climate accounts for character. There are also other examples of this correlation in Ulysses. Pondering about the Orient, Bloom thinks of the Sinhalese lobbing about in the sun, too hot to quarrel, influence of the climate. Seidel masterfully analyzes the directional values assigned to each of the cardinal points in Ulysses. Such values stridently invoke the political rather than the geographical. Bloom, for example, is both Semitic and Irish. His climatological displacement is, is, is an active conversation, I think, with his political displacement. Such a trajectory from maps to topography, from climate to politics, especially resonates with the contemporary moment of compounding crises. These crises all converge on now what we increasingly identify not as climate change, but rather more correctly as climate collapse. It's the thing that we don't like talking about. The time to bemoan the death of nature, however, is over. That was never a viable political position, really. Nature, like the planet, does not need saving after all. Humans and the non-human world on which they wholly depend do. Ulysses poses, I think, such questions of sustainability that are often difficult to ask, but the ones that need asking urgently. Bio Okomolafe, an author, scholar, and the director of the Emergence Network writes, I'm quite confident that even as the oceans boil and the hurricanes beat violently against our once safe shores and the air sweats with the heat of impending doom and our fists protest the denial of climate justice, that there is a path to take that has nothing to do with victory or defeat, a place we do not yet know the coordinates to, a question we do not yet know how to ask. And he kind of goes on, the point of the departed arrow is not merely to pierce the bullseye and carry the trophy. The point of the arrow is to sing the wind and remake the world in the brevity of flight. There are things we must do, sayings we must say, thoughts we must think that look nothing like the images of success that have so thoroughly possessed our visions of justice. He suggests that this is the decade of the fugitive demanding of us fugitive methods of reading, thinking, and being, a method that corresponds to the carceral present to provide modes of escape. To be clear, Ulysses or reading Ulysses does not solve the climate crisis. Joyce is not Gandalf. 
But he did choose a story of exile to think through his historical moment. He points this out clearly in his book. If you want to know what are the events which cast their shadow over the hell of the time of King Lear, Othello, Hamlet, Troilus, and Cressida, look to see when and how the shadow lifts. What softens the heart of a man shipwrecked in storms dire, tried like another Ulysses, Pericles, Prince of Tyre? The exile is to modernism what the refugee is to climate fiction which is also at the same time to acknowledge that there, this is an uncomfortable analogy for the consequences of the present traveler are exponentially dire. The Guardian reported just last month on the 18th of August to be precise, that a great upheaval is coming. Climate driven movement of people is adding to a massive migration already underway to the world cities. The number of migrants has doubled globally over the past decade, and the issue of what to do about rapidly increasing populations of displaced people will only become greater and more urgent. To survive climate breakdown will require a planned and deliberate migration of a kind humanity has never before undertaken. The fugitive method corresponds to the decades of unhomings that the 21st century heralds. From today's perspective, the discursivity between climate and politics or between climate and displacement may appear precocious in Joycean texts. After all, these were written well before CO2 emissions from the past threatened all futures. Nonetheless, European climate science was well underway with the findings of the Swedish Nobel Prize winning chemist, Sovante August Arrhenius, by the time Joyce wrote Ulysses. Such correspondences between Joyce's world of nature and the world of culture should also not be surprising, given that his intellectual formation occurs in the thick of empire. To inherit a legacy of colonization is to be acutely aware of empire's ecological fallout, to be aware that empire's transgressions of territory pale in comparison to its transgressions of ecological limits. To be colonized, I think, as thinkers as distant as Mahatma Gandhi and Franz Fanon evidenced in their manifestos was to be made aware of the fact that there is no politics of land or a representation of land, which also does not also simultaneously engage with the politics of earth. And I think Joyce is very attuned to that. What I'm proposing today is not so much a thesis, but rather a call for a renewed vigilance towards Joyce's conception of home, homeland, homeliness from the precipice or from the fugitive method. Ulysses as a book about the big picture. Joyce's equation of home, I have long argued, transcends the conceptually limiting fiction of the nation state. In such a post-status scenario, it is the ecology of life aimed as a politics for life that is being mapped in the Joycean canon rather than a city or the world. The hemispheric pull of the Joycean address is perhaps articulated earliest in a portrait of the artist as a young man. When Stephen Dedalus, as we all know, geolocates his coordinates thus, class of elements, Clongoswood College, Salins, County Kildare, Ireland, Europe, the world, the universe. However, Ulysses is a text that both microscopically investigates the bacterial underworld, such as in Hades, and then telescopes out into planetary and interplanetary dimensions. Pauline Parsons has cogently argued that in Ulysses, the scale of enquiry into, uh, goes into astronomical illusions, suggesting that they function not simply as a guide to reading practices, nor as a metaphor for structure or character relations, but also as a marker for the overlooked planetary ambitions of the novel and its gesture towards the larger ge geographical context in which it operates. Ulysses, he writes, pays attention to the traces of the planet always present but often invisible and intangible, even in the most local and the most narrowly geographically defined places. To this, I will add Joyce's planetary commentary in Ulysses complicates four interrelated but distinct categories, that of the world, the earth, the globe, and the planet. And I'm going to offer short examples of these. In the dream world of Circe, two of these concepts are in conversation. The peers say, 
I do become your liege man of life and limb to earthly worship. Bloom holds up his right hand on which sparkles the Kohinoor diamond. His paltry nays, immediate silence, wireless intercontinental continental and interplanetary transmitters are set for reception of message. Here, earthly refers to the corporeal attempts at communing with, with the metaphysical, whereas the word interplanetary suggests a universe scoping scale that points both towards the origins of the stars and connects such origins to a geological and technological moment in the history of humans. Interestingly, it is the extractive regime of empire symbolized here by a quintessential product of extraction, the Kohinoor diamond, one of the largest diamonds in the world that adorns the crown uh, the, uh, of the British queen that allows such interplanetary correspondence. So it's kind of coagulated time is what diamond is, and it's also coagulated carbon. Mined in the Kullur mine in India, the diamond represents the compaction of the sedimented layers of geological time. It is befitting conduit to commune with the past, which is, of course, what interplanetary travel or space photography allows. In Eumaeus, the word globe is specifically linked to empire's oceanic modes of transmission. Tired, seemingly, he seized, his questioner perceiving that he has not likely to get a great deal of change out of such a wily old customer, fell to wool gathering on the enormous dimensions of the water about the globe. Suffice it to say that as a casual glance at the map revealed, it covered fully three fourths of it, and he fully realized accordingly what is meant to rule the waves. The globe as a spherical representation of a geoid earth not only misrepresents the geographical dimensions of the planet, but such a panoptic ordering disciplines, I think, the unruly nature of the planet and calls for an imperial ordering of it. The globe sits at the feet of Greco-Roman kings and queens. Its place is in the colonial schoolroom from which originates an earth encompassing globalization and ends in the neoliberalism of the contemporary moment. The globe of globalization, as Gayatri Spivak has noted tellingly, sits in our computer screens today, epitomizing the financialization of life. No one can live there. In uh, Scylla and Charybdis, we read, people do not know how dangerous love songs can be. The auric egg of Russell warned occultly. The movements which work revolutions in the world are born out of the dreams and visions in a peasant's heart on a on the hillside. For them, the earth is not an exploitable ground, but the living mother. The love song of globalization ends in the destruction of the earth. We ride super fast into a future completely dip dependent on a fossilized past. It is digging of another kind as that performed by the humble peasant that engages the telluric materiality, the granular soil of earth. Here, the earth is not a zone of extraction, but seeding, suggestive of an ecology of life with which the human is in intrinsic communication. Another two minutes and I'm done. The latitudinal and longitudinal aspirations of empire, a cartography of at least 500 years in the making, reveals its true malignancy in the Anthropocene. A renewed interest in Joyce's environmental ethic, or whatever we wish to call it, has to engage with these alternatives to what has sometimes simplistically been called eco-joyce. There is no time to mourn nature. Like Joyce's character, the Anthropocene teaches us that coming events cast their shadows before. Andreas Mam notes that with global warming, we can never really be in the heat of the present but are trapped in the heat of an ongoing past, the result of countless acts of combustions stretching from the 19th century. To read Joyce from the anachronistic perspective of the Anthropocene using the fugitive method is to encounter numerous coincidences between text and material life. Now that's a coincidence we might say, but soon proclaim, now that's a coincidence second time. It is not surprising that Joyce's texts, especially open to a future response, are finding their proper place in a body of environmental scholarship. A number of these planetary motifs and illusions, I would say, are more elaborately and carefully theorized in Finnegan's Wake. 
post-dating the publication of Ulysses, the very first pictures of the Earth's surface that were able to discern the curvature of the planet were taken from the Explorer 2 balloon, which ascended 13.7 miles in 1935. It made headlines across the world. And like Einstein's theories of relativity, which were proven by the 1922 solar ex eclipse expeditions, Joyce would have been influenced by this discovery as he wrote The Wake. The arc of Joyce's planetarity, his conditioning of the Earth itself as home uh, in Ulysses further bends and bleeds into the space-time of the wake. So my call today is not a call towards noticing the expansive horizon of Joyce's description of Earth and earthliness, not Joyce and nature, but something more like Joyce and ecology. And I think these kind of critical framings are the ones that sustain us into an uncertain future. And I'm going to stop there. Thank you. Are you the dung heap? I am not a dung heap, but <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Do you have audio? No. Thank you. Um, I'll want to stay on time. So just a really quick thank you to organizers, to everyone here and online, um, everyone who made this possible today. Um, unlike Malcolm, um, I think what I'll share begins uplifting and will end in the Russian tradition, not particularly <laughs> uplifting. Uh, so I don't know. <laughs> um, Encapsulating 100 years of the Russian Joyce uh, and some thoughts on his future in 15 minutes is, let's say, ambitious. I think there are some other words I could use, but I'll, I'll say ambitious here. Uh, so what I'd like to do today is offer uh, some broad strokes. Um, how and when Joyce entered the Russian cultural sphere, what he has meant and continues to mean to Russian uh, or Russophone readers by zooming in on some critical junctures. The question, of course, isn't just how Joyce was read in Russia, but also how we frame that story. Um, and I'll begin my remarks with two pairs of statements uh, that bookend the first Russian Joycean century. Uh, Karl Radek, head of the International Information Bureau of the Soviet Central Committee, infamously led a, a rabid attack on Joyce, uh, which began in the early 30s and characterized much of Joyce criticism for the next several decades. A heap of dung teeming with worms, photographed with a cinema apparatus through a microscope, he announced. That's Joyce. By 1934, Joyce had become for many an emblem of decadence, formalism, uh, and naturalism, the complete antithesis of Soviet art. Still, some recognized Joyce's genius at the time. Boris Poplavsky, a young emigre poet, delivered a 1930 uh, lecture that was then published in the Paris-based journal Chisla. Um, he proclaimed his profound admiration for Joyce in no uncertain terms. Everything taken together creates an absolute stunning document, something so real, so alive, so diverse, and so truthful that it seems to us that if it were necessary to send to Mars or God knows where, a single sample of earthly life or facing the destruction of European civilization to preserve a single book for posterity in order to provide through the ages and across space an inkling of our fallen civilization, perhaps it would be best to leave precisely Joyce's Ulysses. It's the world's greatest book blurb, the one we all dream about. Uh, statements such as those of Radek and Poplavsky reveal the complexity of the contradictory positions Joyce has occupied in Russian culture uh, since the mid 1920s. Their views stand at maximalist extremes, reflecting the wide range of emotions and strong opinions Joyce's texts elicited and still elicit from readers of different artistic and ideological camps. Case in point, 
uh, Victor Pilievin's 2004 novel, The Sacred Book of the Werewolf, in which two centuries old shapeshifters, Ahuli, if you're Russian, you get that joke, uh, and Alexander Sieri discuss literature. When Joyce is mentioned, the latter flares up. Joyce, he asked, drawing closer. The one who wrote Ulysses? I tried to read it, boring stuff. Frankly, I simply don't understand why such books are necessary. What do you mean? Look, no one reads it, Ulysses. Three people read it, and then they live off of it their whole lives. They write articles, go to conferences, but no one else made it through. <laughs> As my students would say, yeah, shots fired. Uh, without necessarily equating his character's words with his own, Pilevin suggests what many, as we've heard, uh, extending back to the 1930s have purported. More of a figurehead for modernism than a widely read author, Joyce symbolizes a dead end, an exaggerated uh, stale literature. But naturally, one may read Joyce differently. Mikhail Shishkin's relationship with his Irish predecessor is much more positive. Uh, in a 2005 interview, for example, he contrasts the Western traditions, uh, what he calls love of the word, which for him is exemplified by Joyce's text, with the Russian tradition's love of humanity, embodied by Nikolai Gogol's short story, The Overcoat. He says that he wishes to go, uh, so, excuse me, to direct Russian literature to, toward a combination of the two trends, the result being an art that's at once uh, technically proficient and thoroughly humanist. Joyce thus uh, becomes a fulcrum in these debates over the correct path for Russian letters. Lean one way and you become a new modernist, lean the other and you decry Joyce's innovations as false. But how did writers access him in the intervening years? We can, of course, take a look at the translation history for a sense of this contact. The first known Russian publication of Joyce is uh, Zhitomirsky's limited 1925 rendition of several fragments from Ulysses. Um, and as we can see from this non-comprehensive selection, this is just kind of uh, some highlights and curiosities of the Russian translation history. Uh, the, the Russian Joyce is defined by two main periods of intense translation, the late 20s, early 30s, and the late 80s, early 90s, with more published sense. Um, not included, didn't include it here, but uh, a full Finnegan's Wake was published in 2021, at the very end of 2021. Uh, by Andrei Renier. The translations are significant, but so is how Joyce was incorporated into Russian literature itself. And reading intertextually, intertextually necessarily involves recognizing literary history, one prerequisite for which is a working assumption that history can be recounted uh, and interpreted in a coherent manner, build a story out of it. So for instance, I've looked at how a number of writers with their own historical baggage were fascinated by Joyce's Shakespeare theory in Ulysses, the idea that the self-made artist uh, can become father to himself, in the case of Stephen, uh, if they create lasting art and elect literary forefathers to supplant the biological. Each Russian writer's reading of Joyce, in this group at least, in other words, speaks not only to their understanding of his work, but also to their efforts to situate themselves within shifting legacies. And this concept is vital to Joyce's fiction um, and numerous Russian writers have eagerly turned to this theme in his work to um, define themselves in their, in their art. But the writers and historians' craft is also essentially dependent on their worldviews, the story building. We might then imagine what a polyphonic approach to a history that's not yet concluded can yield, especially if applied to more recent materials in the Russian Joyce story. In this reading, we see likenesses across differences, Joyce as a once or continuing heroic figure, the uniqueness of individual writers and the simultaneous community among them. This exercise invites further questions. How has Joyce come to be read in the last 30 years, for instance? What does he represent to the latest generation of writers, critics, and readers? How do they conceive of his influence, that naughty word, now that uh, he's been reincorporated into the canon? And to do this, I interviewed a number of uh, authors to get a sense of how they relate to Joyce today. Uh, here are a few of their responses. First, uh, here, how writers encountered Joyce. A couple, Marina Stepnova and Anna Glazova, spoke to me of the physical response Joyce elicited in, in them, the kind of power, magical power 
um, that his words held over them after such a long drought in the Soviet era when you couldn't read uh, these works. Ivan Sokolov, who's of a younger generation, suggested that even by his time, uh, Joyce was commonplace, something that you would pick up on your parents' bookshelf, potentially. Another key theme in our conversations were the connections between Russian literature and Joyce. Um, some view him as a foreign continuation of the local tradition, as it were. Alexei Selnikov, for instance, told me, in some way, Joyce affirmed the right of the Russian classics, Dostoevsky and Tolstoy, to write verbosely, long-windedly, with a strong focus on details, leaving the plot somewhere to the side of the, uh, of the whole enormous narrative. Um, also, Dmitry Bukov, one of Russia's most well-known writers and critics, now in emigration and exile, found something more experimental in Joyce's art, even if its origins come from Tolstoy. He said, for me, Joyce is the founder of total realism, which touches on all aspects of being from the religious to the physiological. He's Tolstoy's main successor. We also note how these writers view the connection between Joyce's work and the Soviet experience in various ways. Uh, so for example, in the first quotation, Sergei Selovyov's Golden Fleece Odyssey comparison, in which he suggests that the kind of tele teleological view, the kind of mythological view of, um, of history of time, of the future of the Soviet Union was somehow close to um, the mythology of Ulysses and Homer, that people were living under this kind of delusion of achieving this in the future. Um, and Zinovi Sinek, another emigre writer, uh, who lives in London, um, focuses on the in-betweenness of Ulysses and Soviet life, the struggle to understand one's divided self in society, um, something that Stephen, that Bloom experienced in, in Dublin, um, and that uh, Zenik felt as someone living in, in uh, Soviet Moscow. Likewise, they're divided on the question of whether encountering your predecessors in this way is really any different than how we read literature on any given day. Uh, Stepnova, as you see here, like others, recognizes the disorder of the influx of new old writers, all these writers that had been uh, censored, restricted, suppressed during the Soviet era, coming back in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, and this kind of uh, a sense of chaotic lineage is that, that lingers to this day for some writers. Um, while uh, others like Solovyov see it as no different than. Uh, reading Homer, right? Homer wrote a long time ago, but we read him now anyway. Uh, and Salnikov suggests the universal themes of Joyce's work matter more than the logistics of when Russian writers actually managed to pick him, pick him up, his books. It's clear, of course, that the, the story of Joyce in Russia remains in motion despite the canonization. Whether it's due to the legacy of his heavily politicized reception, his own extensive self-mythologization, or some harder to find factor, he stays a controversial figure. He's innovative yet old fashioned. He's alien to individual authors yet immensely relevant to all. Uh, he deserves close attention, but no one apparently reads him. Behind all these frictions though, lies the near universal recognition of Joyce's significance, particularly with regard to the liberating nature of his art, the openness it generates in language and life and experience. Um, and this freedom has taken various forms, but undergirding many of them is the hope to combat a historical narrative that aims to restrict the artist's identity. And these are the writers that I like, focused on in my research, but uh, men out of time, writers such as Yuri Alyesha in the 20s, uh, saw in Joyce's work a solution to their precarious state as individualist artists in the newly formed Soviet Union. Meanwhile, emigres such as Poplovsky and Vladimir Nabokov sought to recover the past that the 1917 revolution uh, had taken from them by translating Joyce's aesthetics into their own context. And Nabokov even offered to translate Ulysses in the early 30s, which is to me one of the greatest literary what ifs that would have changed so much. Um, then post Stalinist writers such as Andrei Bitov opted to disengage from the war with the past, seeing the futility of doing so, while even later writers, Sasha Sokolov, foremost among them, um, excuse me. Uh, finally broke through and accessed Joyce as a stylistic influence. For writers in the post-Soviet era, turning to Joyce means reconnecting with the tradition that it had been, re sorry, means reconnecting with a tradition uh, they had been separated from officially for so long, from modernism. Oops. Okay. 
Uh, this literary zone of contact fuels the novels of the Russian Joycians. In Joyce, they could breathe the liberating air that Shishkin uh, speaks of. That was necessary to capture a tradition in desperate need of estrangement. But this transformation cuts both ways. Strong writers, as Harold Bloom says, says in his controversial Western canon, have the wit to transform their forerunners into composite and therefore partly imaginary beings. Indeed, Joyce became a remarkably plastic symbol uh, for Russian writers who viewed him as a crucial element in their escape from oppressive histories. Fluctuating political, cultural, and personal realities would dictate exactly how they read Joyce, literally and figuratively, uh, yet they found in, their, in his writings the means to beget their own lineage through the work. His work in progress continues even on Russian literary soil. And I was going to end there, but thinking about the future of Ulysses in uh, the Russophone world for the symposium and, and the questions we were uh, tasked with, <laughs> um, or that were mentioned at least, my mind drifted beyond Russia's borders. And an even more recent uh, text, uh, a bit of a text came to mind, a portion of which I'd like to uh, share with you all. It's not this, I'll, I'll show you in a second, but it's a letter from a Ukrainian uh, teenager who read the Russian Ulysses along with hundreds, um, led by a very popular, as you can see here, uh, Russian book YouTuber, Armin Zaharyan, uh, who's uh, an astute reader and critic of uh, not just Joyce, but uh, many other authors. And he has over 150,000 subscribers on YouTube. Um, you know, Russian speakers who really like to read, watch videos about books, if you can imagine. Um, and last year in the lead up to Bloomsday, last, last Bloomsday, uh, Zaharyan produced an episode on his channel about each episode of Ulysses. So 18 and then plus a little bit extra. Um, and this June, uh, he published uh, the letter that I'm going to share with you, part of it. Uh, on his social media several months into Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Um, so I offer these, these the following words, the first three paragraphs of, these of this letter um, as a coda, while we reflect on Joyce, our love for Ulysses, um, their place in the world, both now and in the future, as we think about monuments, as we think about preservation, as we think about what we do uh, when we and when Ulysses are confronted with not love, but hate. Hello, Armin. I'm Ruslana from Severodonetsk, a now disappearing city. I'm almost 16, and a year ago, on June 16th, I finished reading Ulysses. You were present at this moment, but of course you don't remember it. But I remember this moment. At that time, I was keeping a diary about my reading of Ulysses in my now burned down room in my Ithaca. My Ithaca burned down too. I remember how I fell in love with Dublin, even though I wasn't there. How I learned to analyze books, how I learned to see details. I listened to the murmur of the Black Sea that day, a sun-drenched veranda and tea on the wooden table. How many books have been read on the shore of this very sea? Thinking about my upcoming trip to Kiev, I wanted to wander around the courtyards of Kiev as Bloom wandered the streets of Dublin. And it was a beautiful summer, a year before the war. I brought books and drawings from Kiev and thought that they would preserve my love for the city and for life. But apparently, the only thing in which a person can keep precious memories and love is their heart. Any physical form disappears much too quickly. Thank you. Okay, thanks everybody. Um, I am going to also just issue a huge thank you to everybody here who's been uh, here throughout. It's been an amazing experience and I can't quite believe we're almost at an end of it. Um, so my paper is found in translation, recent Latin American Ulysses. Um, I should say I first read Ulysses as a Latin Americanist, uh, despite having grown up in Dublin, in fact, up the road from the Martello Tower in Sandy Cove, it wasn't actually until I got to graduate school to study Latin American literature that I realized that in order to engage with all of these Argentinian writers that I wanted to read, I re needed to read the book that they were all reading and engaging with, which, which was itself Ulysses. Um, so these days I regularly teach a course that pairs Ulysses with a Latin American novel, and I'll talk more about this in a few minutes. 
But I wanted to begin by zooming in on a moment in the novel that my attention always snags on precisely because I am a Latin Americanist. And it's a moment that's very little touched on in criticism. Um, it's a moment in Eumaeus in chapter 16, when a tired Leopold Bloom and a drunken Stephen Dedalus are gathered in a cab stand late at night, listening to yarns being woven by the sailor D.B. Murphy. In the course of his tale, Murphy alludes to a variety of shocking sights he has seen on his travels, none of which he claims came close to what he encountered in Latin America. And I've seen man eaters in Peru that eats corpses and the livers of horses. Look here, here they are, a friend of mine sent me. He fumbled out a picture postcard from his inside pocket, which seemed to be in its way, a species of repository and pushed it along the table. The printed matter on it stated, Chosa de Indios, Beni Bolivia. All focused their attention at the scene exhibited, a group of savage women in striped loincloths, squatted, blinking, suckling, frowning, sleeping, amid a swarm of infants, there must have been quite a score of them, outside some primitive shanties of Osier. Now, there's an evident problem here with brandishing a postcard as evidence, right? And that's a central plot point in other parts of the book. But Bloom's and the reader's attention is caught here by a different conundrum, the contradiction between what is described and what the postcard shows which is something closer to this. It's not an exact match, but many of these were, were in circulation uh, at the time between the narrative stereotype of the Latin American cannibal and the visual cliche of indigenous women suckling their infants, two interchangeable particles of geopolitical prejudice floating around the colonial unconscious of modernity. But there's also a blatant mismatch in terms of location. The caption explicitly declares that the postcard depicts not Peru, but its neighbor, Bolivia. And what's more, the location that's specified, Beni, which is in the northeastern highlands, is much further inland than we might expect a sailor to have ventured. And this becomes even more suspicious once we realize that Bolivia was, by 1904, definitively a landlocked country, beyond the reach of even the most intrepid sailor. True to his nature, though, Bloom still wants to give the sailor the benefit of the doubt. So he surreptitiously turns the postcard over. Whoops. Sorry, turns the postcard over to check the addressee. Mr. Bloom, without evincing surprise, unostentatiously turned over the card to peruse the partially obliterated address and postmark. It ran as follows. Tarjeta postal, Señor A. Boudin, Galleria Becking, Santiago, Chile. There was no message, evidently, as he took particular notice. Now, the recipient named here, Señor A. Boudin, is a mysterious melange. The name of his gallery, Becke, morphologically looks Italian, but it corresponds to no particular language. His last name, Boudin, is a French sausage, and like many a sausage, it is of potentially dubious contents. <laughs> Nor does Boudin sound like a plausible pseudonym for the craggy Irish sailor, D.B. Murphy, who certainly does not have the air of a former arts gallery owner in Santiago, although we should say that his pocket repertoire, right, uh, his pocket archive does mark him as a collector of sorts. And the lack of message seems to suggest that this object is precisely unreadable, lacking even the ambiguity encoded in the novel's more famous postcard, UP Up. Indeed, the only evident meaning that we can derive from the postcard and from its appearance in the novel is that Latin America at the turn of the century was an indistinct bundle of fragments that could stand in for one another like the visual and the textual stereotype without anybody noticing. Yet, as so often happens in Ulysses, if we look more carefully at what's being invoked in this tiny episode, it appears that Joyce is cooking up this suspicious sausage out of some quite specific and still resonant historical events. The sailor was indeed unlikely to have visited landlocked Bolivia in the years immediately preceding 1904, but his travels might have dated back to the 1870s when Bolivia still had control over a coastal area rich with mineral resources, guano for fertilizer and nitrate for explosives, both of which had experienced a mid 19th century boom on an international market that was geared toward the expansion of both agriculture and national armaments. Bolivia didn't lose its coastal province to Chile until after 1883 in the War of the Pacific. So here you see Bolivia being pushed back from the coast and the land divided between Peru and Chile. Um, it didn't lose the coastal province to Chile until after uh, the War of the Pacific uh, came to a kind of an end in 1883, uh, a war that was fought over those resources, pitting Bolivia and, and Peru against Chile and by proxy Britain. But the loss, it turns out, and this was actually news to me, was not actually decreed as permanent until 1904, the year in which the sailor tells his tale. So in other words, buried beneath the surface of the narrative, 
lurking in a tall tale camouflaged by stereotypes is a geopolitical sympathy, an encoded lament for a distant country's sudden lack of access to the sea, which we can imagine is amplified by a bloom who dreams constantly of waterways. Now, having seen how Ulysses envisions Latin America, I'm going to flip the image over and talk about three instances very quickly in which Latin America imagines Ulysses. There are so many uh, examples of novelistic reworkings of the novel, and I'll show just some of them here. I, no. Um, uh, that one critic suggests that we speak not of the boom of Latin American literature, but the bloom of Latin American literature. Um, but I want to talk briefly here about three cases that specifically involve translation, that that's the kind of route I've picked out uh, here to map the kind of travelings of Ulysses, and indeed errors and accidents of translation where mistakes end up forging unlikely routes home. And my first example is Roberto Bolaño's 1998 novel Los Detectives Salvajes, which is brilliantly translated into English by Natasha Wimmer in 2008 as The Savage Detectives. Uh, critics have barely registered the ways in which this novel is routed through Ulysses, and that's partly due to a misdirection by Bolaño himself. He referred to it as his Huckleberry Finn, a roman fleuve that carries its characters down a metaphorical Mississippi between the two banks of its opening and closing sections. But when I made the somewhat intuitive decision to teach it alongside Ulysses, its debts to Joyce rose to the surface in ways that were both expected and very unexpected. Uh, divided into three parts, so again, like, Joy, uh, like Ulysses, the first part offers a portrait of the artist as a young man. The second part follows two characters who are named uh, Arturo Bellano, who's kind of a uh, pseudonym for Bolaño himself, and then the very clearly named uh, Ulysses Lima. Um, as they're glimpsed by others traveling uh, over the course of 20 years. And the third part offers what seems to be a homecoming on a quest to find a disappeared female poet known as Cesaria Tinajero, who is a Penelope slash Molly Bloom character who 50 years earlier had turned her back on her male avant-garde colleagues. Now, Bologna uses the structure of Ulysses to think about the setting and the possible circulation of aesthetic experiments. In the long middle section with its journeying monologues, it carries us through artistic, political, existential quests, which connect dots of hope and despair, increasingly despair, across a broad Western horizon, but also across the times of modernity. Written in the 1990s, the novel rescues a little known poetry community from the 1970s, who were themselves trying to replay poetic experiments from the 1920s. So in other words, the sense of crisis and transition on the national front that's enacted in Joyce's novel through the interplay of various generations, so between Stephen and Bloom and Molly and uh, Old Mother Grogan and all of the characters in the National Library, uh, in Bolaño's text becomes an investigation of Mexican modernity, which is not just Mexican and it's not just modernity, but is enmeshed in an entire century of quests and crises across the continent, uh, the country, the continent, and the West. Now, as if the structural resonances were insufficient, particles of Ulysses are sprinkled through Bologna's text in really interesting ways. Joyce's sirens morph into the barmaids of the opening section. Joyce's citizen resurrects in the shape of the violent anti-Semite Heimito Kunst. And Maria Font, who's one of the many female artists who have gone largely unnoticed in the novel, is an unimpressed Penelope slash Molly. She acidly dismisses the stories that Ulysses, Ulysses Lima brings back from his travels as having, quote, too much literature in the telling, right? So as if Ulysses Lima were actually D.B. Murphy. Um, the most surprising connection, however, turns up in a long conversation between Lima, Belano, and a fictional 1920s poet, Amadeo Salvatierra. Uh, the boys, as Amadeo calls the, the duo Lima and Belano from his aged vantage point, are reciting a list of bands they enjoy listening to. Proletarian involution, snorts Amadeo. Who are they when they're at home? For a Bologna reader, there's nothing striking about this question. It's stitched into the narrative as just one more sign of the generational gulf separating the historical from the neo-avant-garde. For the Joycean, however, the phrase might as well be given its own billboard. A throwaway which has every bit as much meaning as any throwaway in Joyce. The phrase here multiplies the reference of what might be the central question of Ulysses, Molly's who's he when he's at home. And it throws into question the very idea of home in a work that will fling its protagonists across the globe and that will itself find homes in so many different languages and reading contexts. Even more interesting perhaps is the fact that this parallel is entirely an accident of translation. The original Spanish reads, involución proletaria y eso como se come. So literally, how are you supposed to eat that? 
Or, as we might put it with considerably less flair than Natasha Wimmer, what's that all about? So inverting the assumption that translation impoverishes the original, this, uh, this one actually uh, adds an elusive dimension, allowing us to posit the idea of a meaning not lost, but found in translation. With this, I wanna to segue to the question of how Ulysses the novel found its way into Spanish in 1945 through the unlikeliest of routes. Plans were afoot for a translation by a team of writers, Borges among them, all speakers of excellent English and professionally familiar with the world of modernist literature. But all of a sudden, news arrived that a translation had just been published by one J. Sala Subirat, an insurance agent who is little known to the Buenos Aires literary elite. The author of a couple of minor novels and of the 1944 volume, um, Theory and Practice of Life Insurance, Salas was the self-taught child of Catalan immigrants. He left school at the age of 11 to work in a series of menial jobs, and he spent his spare time reading cheaply published classics while teaching himself both shorthand and several languages. So he got to the point of uh, good reading rather than speaking knowledge in English, Italian, and French. In the 1920s, he founded an academy of stenography and foreign languages. He worked for a time as a translator for a Soviet company doing business across Latin America, and he began to train as an insurance salesman doing some writing of his own on the side. And in the late 1930s, in a move that seems both extraordinary and inevitable, this bloom-like figure found his way to Ulysses. As his biographer Lucas Pedersen reports, and this, the biography itself, is desperately in need of a translation. It's an amazing book. Uh, Salas was immediately drawn to what he took to be an epic of the common man, a man indeed remarkably like himself. But unsure that he was fully understanding it, he decided to grapple with it by translating it, reading partly for Zen's and partly for the plot. So taking what was probably a pirate version of the 1940 Modern Library edition of Ulysses, Salas literally broke it into chunks that he could carry with him on the train to and from work, tackling the translation amid the hubbub of his commute, the polyglot sounds of Buenos Aires' immigrant explosion. Now, given the circumstances of its production, its author's lack of professional training, his unfamiliarity with the demotic speech of Dublin, not to mention the inherent difficulties of the text, it's no surprise that the translation should be riddled with errors. But among Latin American Spanish speakers, there's still enormous affection for this version as the lens and the voice through which readers and writers throughout the continent came to know Ulysses. As Argentinian novelist Juan José Sayer noted, a generation of writers learned to work with the quote, living matter of speech through the model of Salas' struggle with Joyce. Bound up with this evidently is a politics of language. And here I mean not uh, global hierarchies of English and Spanish, but a conflict that's internal to Spanish itself. So as Pedersen emphasizes, contrary to the ideal of an Argentinian language that was being worked out in writing by Borges and others in the same years, this was an upstart translation uh, that was being produced by the child of working class immigrants. We might almost call it a proletarian involution. Uh, it was a class that was in the process of finding its own place and voice in tension, not only with the cosmopolitan leaning Buenos Aires cultural elite, but with Spanish as a colonial language. And for this reason, as Carlos Gamedro and Joyce Scholar notes, Salas Subirat's version continues to be preferable to later translations by Spanish authors who have shown no qualms about peninsularizing Joyce's English, which to a Latin American ear is tantamount to a linguistic reconquest. As Gamedro argues, despite and often in its very flaws, Salas Subirat's version embodies the tension between the language of the metropolis and that of the colony, which is, of course, at the heart of Joyce's Ulysses. And this is something that Shinjini was talking to us about earlier on. Um, and now just a very quick closing um, section. Um, errors in translation can also lay bare the ways in which a text teaches us as readers to make meaning. In a fascinating essay in his yet to be translated book, El Ultimo Lector, or The Last Reader, it's been translated into many different languages, as you see here, but still not into English. Argentinian novelist Ricardo Piglia examines what Salas Subirat's mistakes reveal about the way that Ulysses works. As Piglia teases out, Salas, the translator, himself becomes a modern day Odysseus. He quests his way through the novel, trying to make sense of the signs he encounters, forging a navigable path for himself and for future readers, even as he encounters moments that clearly block sense. And one of those we will all remember from our first time reading Ulysses. What is that potato doing in Bloom's pockets? <laughs> as Pilia details, it appears four times in the novel. And as he painstakingly and quite hilariously unpacks, Salas lunges at the question from all possible angles. 
The first time it appears is in Bloom's pocket as he sets out in a mini odyssey to procure breakfast items. Closing the door softly, he notes, potato I have. Salas wonders over this, and judging the overall tenor of the passage, he decides that it must be an Irish idiom for stupidity. He casts about for a Spanish equivalent, and he finds one in an adjacent vegetable. Soy un zanahoria, I am a carrot. The next time the potato appears, it is more resolutely itself and blooms pocket as he pats himself down in a panic during a close encounter with Blaze's Boylan. But Salas has already chosen his vegetable, and so trusting in the fact that this item has no greater meaning, he renders it once again as a carrot. He entirely misses the potato's third appearance because his English isn't colloquial enough to spot it in the spud that appears in the hospital scene of chapter 14. He therefore glides serenely over this unfamiliar particle in the translation. And by the time it makes its fourth appearance in the nightmare encounters of Circe, Salas can no longer avoid confronting it head on. And therefore, he finally agrees to restore it to full potatoness. Now, for Salas, the potato is a potato when not also a carrot. For Pilia, it is a quintessentially Irish product, although as a Latin Americanist, I feel also compelled to point out that it is, in fact, Peruvian in origin. Um, but an Irish product that also carries the wounds of colonial imperial trauma. Um, for Bloom, it is a base, a transnational practice, a superstition that's inherited from his mother, spud against the rheumatiz. So this humblest and most nourishing of particles, I want to suggest here in closing, speaks quietly and eloquently of Ulysses, sorry, Ulysses' many ways of being in the world. Thanks very much. Thank you all for a really wonderful panel and so much, uh, so many places it's pointing to who's got questions. Hi, so um, notwithstanding the insane challenge of translating works from um, a guy who's writing with a lifetime of linguistic knowledge, uh, what are the challenges, and this is a question for all of you, um, and uh, I don't know, maybe consequences of uh, translating works to other countries with their own distinct political landscapes coming from, you know, these novels with their own kind of, um, I suppose, like nationalist Irish tradition. I guess I was stalling. Can you repeat it one more time? Clarify. Sure. What What are like the challenges and consequences, um, or maybe even like perceptions of of readers um, in other countries looking at a work which is kind sure. of steeped in in its own kind of political landscape and in the Irish nationalist like sentiment that kind of goes into uh, Joyce's writing. Sure. Yeah. Um, I guess what comes to mind is another uh, concrete <laughs> example of someone that I s spoke with. Um, so there's a, a reading group in based in Moscow. They're all, as far as I understand, based in Moscow. It's called the Territory of Slow Reading. Um, so it's a Ulysses reading group uh, that was meeting on Zoom before Zoom became a thing. Uh, and just going through Ulysses. Um, and when I was in Moscow in summer 2019, I, I met with them also on Zoom, even though we were all in Moscow. And um, it was wandering rocks. But I think, you know, a form of this question came up um, when I asked them why they read Joyce at all to begin with. Um, and for them, what they shared anyway was, and I think this was echoed by the, the writers, the, professional writers I, I spoke to as well, that it's, they don't seem to pay much attention to that. Um, I also asked all of these, uh, all of them about connections between Ireland and uh, Russia and their histories and politics and so forth. Um, and what they emphasize at least, and I'll offer their words at least, is that uh, it's more 
about the universal themes. Um, most of them didn't know much about Irish history necessarily, the details anyway. Um, so for them, it was more about how this is a book about uh, a person's daily struggles, daily successes, what they can uh, manage to do in 24 hours. Um, and how it opens up for them, I guess, in a way, political or social possibilities that they didn't feel possible in Russia. So the example in Wandering Rocks was, or when we were discussing that episode anyway, was uh, sexuality and money, that this is discussed differently in Russia, according to them, um, than Joyce manages to do in Ulysses. And it opens up and frees them and gives them the language for, um, for these subjects. This is, um, sorry, it's a great question. Just to, uh, I think there are a number of different ways of answering that, right? Because it also depends what you mean by translation or, or how we would interpret the question of translation. You could even almost think of Joyce as himself translating Ulysses in the late stages, right? As he's going through the proofs and he's changing things. And I think the same thing happens with Sala Subidat, who starts translating for himself just to understand what's going on. And then at some point is asked to produce a publishable, pub, sorry, publishable version. So about eight chapters in, starts kind of playing around stylistically, right? So he starts to kind of forge himself as a writer at this point, and then goes back over. And he produced, there were several responses by prominent writers, including Borges, to his translation. Um, he went back then and produced a second version um, of it, which is much more experimental uh, and then he was working on a third and in another just unbelievable, you know, kind of episode in his trajectory, the plane that he was in, uh, to, he was on his way to Venezuela to give a, a lecture on insurance sales. Um, the plane crashed um, and they landed in water. Everything was fine, but the manuscript was lost. So we don't know what that third version of it looks like. But in terms of obviously this is it, it can be a question of language and i think that for the way that the translation is read by writers that's really interesting because it's read as a question of the politics of language right rather than actually just looking at the linguistic choices that are made themselves but i think what's drawn so many writers to um ulysses in, in different parts of latin america from the 1960s onwards uh is thinking about aesthetic experiment against the background of political upheaval, right? Um, so there were versions, there were books that came out in the 1940s that really kind of, you know, um, almost mechanically translated over the structure, like the characters, the form went back to the Odyssey. In the aftermath of the Cuban Revolution, though, there starts to be a different articulation of aesthetics and politics that the experimentalism of Ulysses seems to respond to really well. And that then takes different forms, um, in the 60s and 70s, and then again in the kind of 2000s, as a later generation begins to look back over the earlier generation. So again, we're back to this question of, it's what Benjamin says about Baudelaire, right? That to understand Baudelaire, you need to be familiar with the history of readings of Baudelaire, including Proust's reading of Baudelaire, right? So to get a sense of what Ulysses has, has meant to all these people, we need to look at these successive histories of reading and see how it's been used at different times. We're getting cut off. Right? Oh, we're getting cut off. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I didn't know what that meant. I thought that the word is good. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, I think I think we've reached the end of our hour. So please join me in thanking the panel. Yeah, you too. Uh, with, with your indulgence, I think we'll move straight without a break into uh, John's keynote. Uh, I want to make sure that we have enough time for John. Thanks, everybody. I'm sorry, Kasia. <laughs> it was you. It was just you. Yeah. Um, thank you, Jacob. And I'm going to hand over to um, Barry McRae, who has already been introduced, uh, and he will introduce John. <laughs> I was counting on How do I move my slides on? And yeah, it's like here. Oh, it's here. Okay. Yeah. It's a, uh, yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's so, great. That good. Yeah. That's yeah. great. And then wherever this is. All right. Worry about that. It's fine. Yeah. And all right. Yeah. Yeah. I need to get you right off the start. So I'm prepared to fall asleep.
Welcome to our keynote, um, everybody, to end and, and the evening. Um, I, it's my happy job to introduce John McCourt. Uh, John is from Dublin, who he had his, has had his academic career in Italy, where he has really tried every single level of the Italian academic system, from a uh, language instructor in the University of Trieste through uh, various promotions to the University of Roma Tre to uh, a chair in the University of Mascherata, which is one of Europe's oldest universities, specializing in the humanities and social sciences. And John, it seems to me, was barely there a wet week when his colleagues decided to elect him Rettore, which is something between provost and president, a university president. Um, so it makes John one of the key Irish people in Italy um, in many ways, uh, which is happy news for the Joyce world, because John, for a long time, as you all know, has been a pillar of the Joyce world. Actually, not just a pillar, but something more productive than that. He founded the Trieste uh, Summer School, Joyce Summer School, which has always promoted new voices and different voices, as well as very established ones. And uh, the whole Joyce world seems to at some point have passed through that. But especially in John's work, in his publications, he has changed possibly more than anybody else in the past uh, 30 years, what we know and think about Joyce and his works. Uh, starting with his book about Joyce in Trieste, he gives us a portrait really of, I'm just paraphrasing Molly's um, uh, phrase that Michelle used there, um, who the writer is when he's not at home. In fact, if you put together John's work on Joyce in, in this with, oh, am I gone there? Am I back? Um, uh, with his work on Trollope, he also models to us um, a very particular and important idea of what happens to writers when they're abroad. So John overturned the idea that Joyce, when he was on the continent, held inside himself an impermeable Irishness that was not interested in what's happening outside. Um, but with Trollope, that whole work is expanded. So after Who's He When He's Not at Home, John's new book is really, um, uh, it's a portrait of Ireland a, a, it's not only a portrait of Joyce and the reception of Joyce, but it's also a portrait of Ireland in the last hundred plus years and all the different ways in which Irish culture and institutions have changed. Um, this book, which is about the reception of Joyce, the treatment of Joyce in Ireland, um, I suppose it's about who's he at home when he's not at home. And I hope Joyce is, John is going to talk to us um, about some of uh, that work today. So please welcome him. Thank you, Barry. The sound is okay? Yeah. So thank you for that very generous introduction. It's, um, it's thanks for the invitation, Colin. It's wonderful to be here. Um, and yeah, I'm going to talk about who's he when he's at home. I'm going to talk about the changing status of Ulysses in Ireland. I'm very aware that I stand between you and a drink. Um, and that we're all tired, so I will try and go fairly quickly and um, keep it fairly lively. I have a few comments I just kind of want to make off the cuff before I get into my into my slides. Um, hopefully, I can see what I what I have scribbled down. And part of it's just reflecting on some of the many fascinating papers that we've heard today. It's really been a wonderful day um, of presentations, um, which I think has been hugely enriching of our knowledge of Ulysses in the world. And as Barry said, um, my task is to bring Joyce home, which is really what I tried to do in the book Consuming Joyce that came out in February and a copy of which I forgot to bring to show off here in Georgetown. So sorry about that. Um, it would be an understatement to say that the reception of Ulysses in Ireland was ever easy or straightforward or that it is easy or straightforward even today. But what I would stress is that it has been present in Ireland since its early publication. Um, uh, since its early publication in serial form um, and in, ex in extract form, if we like, its fame or even its early infamy in advance of its publication as a book in 1922 
enormously affected how it was read, or better, how it was not read in the early decades of the Irish state, um, and indeed how it was commented upon. Joyce's persona as well, or his personality, the cult of the author, um, also threatened to overwhelm the reception of his Ulysses uh, in Ireland. And we should also remember, of course, that Ulysses, Joyce's timing was terrible. The publication of it clashed with the Irish Civil War, so it was a miracle that it got read at all in 1922. Joyce also, it's worth remembering, had done little or nothing to endear himself to the very people who might have become his Irish reviewers in the early period. Um, he had called Yeats, for example, a good boy and a fine poet, but too proud in his clothes and too fond of the aesthetic. And as for the rest of them, Irish stew. And um, so he, he was not terribly complimentary about his fellow, gener his, the generation of writers that might have taken up his, his cause in Dublin. At the same time, many of his early champions, such as Ezra Pound or Valérie Larbeau, essentially uh, sought to deny Joyce's Irishness or the Irishness of his text, Ulysses. And then on the Irish side of the coin, a critic, a nationalist critic like Daniel Corkery, would also, in a sense, deny Joyce's Irishness and dismiss him as an expatriate who had forfeited the right to write about Ireland, uh, a bird that had flown the nest and was now fouling, um, looking back and fouling the nest that he had flown. So it would take until the 1980s, really, for Irish critics to begin to come to terms with Joyce in any serious way. Um, and indeed, the first book by an Irish academic uh, working in an Irish institution about Joyce didn't appear until 1996, which is a very surprising uh, date, if you think about that. So uh, Joyce, the gestation of Joyce studies in Ireland was extremely slow. For the most part, down through the century, Irish critics were part-time, they were amateur, and instead of doing the hard work, they preferred to write reviews in the Irish Times on a Saturday where they picked tolls in American criticism of Joyce, which very often fell down on some of the historical details of the Irish context of Joyce's works. Um, so I think many Irish critics who dismissed Joyce were also, however, deeply aware of the, the vast and profound way uh, or profound web, I, sorry, of Irish connections in the text, which they insisted that they alone really could identify or unravel, but none of them were actually willing to do that on identifying or unraveling in their work. Much easier to take pot shots at well-meaning but misguided American critics. The what of the text was presumed to be almost entirely exclusively Irish. To some extent, the how of the text, which was, of course, where so many people got lost, was often dismissed as the, the French or the foreign part, the continental part of Joyce's Ulysses. So there was, I think, from very early on, a kind of a tension between the Irish, the national, and the European or the international Joyce. Um, and yet, as we have come to see, to speak of an international Joyce, as Ezra Pound did and as, 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 as Elman did, and, and indeed many of that generation, was to fail to see the very precise sources from which Ulysses was born and which it alluded to. Of course, the Irish source is very central, but as many speakers have pointed out today, this was a book that was born and written in several U European cities, in Trieste, in Zurich, in Paris. Um, and these elements um, form an important substrate, if we like, to the Irish elements in the book. Another one that we might just mention on the way is, Nor is Norway, Norwegian. When, as Joyce wrote to Lucia when she was in Ireland, he says, you think you are in Ireland, but you are also in Norway. There are no the Norwegians found at the town of Wicklow. And uh, he likes to, to go down and, and always confuse the idea of some kind of pure Ireland, as one of our speakers said earlier, referring to the, the Ireland of Saints and Sages essay in 1907. Joyce was always rendering the familiar, uh, the familiar Irishness of his text, if you like, unfamiliar. And um, yeah, that's, that's very much what his writing 
was was about. Now, I did want to comment. Um, I mean, it was an extraordinary experience last night to go to the theatre and to see um, Liz Roach's um, dance, um, the Solus Nua. Um, I had got three hours of sleep and I'd done a nine hour flight. I'd spent two hours in immigration. Um, I had eaten on the plane, but had really not had very much food. And I fell asleep repeatedly during the dance. Now, that is not to um, do down what we saw last night, which was wonderful. Uh, but I also woke up several times. And <laughs> I, I particularly woke up in the Circe part. And I think I came as close to feeling like Stephen Dedalus in Circe as I ever have done during that show last night. It was a rare inaction of the irreverence, of the chaos, of the challenge, of the hallucinatory, of the visceral, of the apocalyptic, the wildly unrestrained nature of that chapter of Ulysses, which, yes, is Irish, but is also so much more. Um, so that was an extraordinary, I thought, take on Joyce's novel, and one that I would like to think Joyce himself would have hugely appreciated, because I think sometimes the mistake is to be too reverent to Joyce. Instead, what, 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 what we saw last night was creative people feeling utterly free to interpret Joyce in their, own, in their own way, just as Joyce himself had run riot with Homer's original and shown absolutely no reverence. I think it's important that we, we, can, we can identify how so many writers in Ireland today are reacting to Joyce in that way. They are literally reveling in his, in his wake where earlier generations suffered under his shadow. So I think there's been a huge change um, when we think about that. I think at the same time, we have to be careful about thinking um, that oversimplifying the idea that we are somehow today living in the Ireland that Joyce would have wanted, or the Ireland that Leopold Bloom might have wanted, or to think that those two things are the same. There's a huge difference. Bloom is a character in Joyce's novel, some of whose ideas are exemplary, but he's not Joyce's mouthpiece or his political spokesman um, any, any more than the, the, the citizen is or isn't. He's another fictional character, and just as we take the citizen to be treated with irony, I think Bloom, too, at times, we have to treat with irony. Um, he's, he's a wonderful character, of course, I'm not denying that, but I think we have to, we have to, we have to, um, have to be careful um, in, in, in over-identifying in that sense. I think Joyce today would find lots to criticize uh, in Ireland. I think his book still provides us with a way to critique Ireland, and not only Ireland, the modern world, the world we live in. A book which I think is about justice, is about home, is about exile, um, is about displacement, which was written at a time of war and pandemic, and which speaks extraordinarily in an extraordinarily relevant way to our own, to our own life and to our own lives. Um, so, yeah, the question was posed this morning, what would Joyce think about this gathering and the, the hundreds of gatherings that have taken place this year to celebrate the centenary of Ulysses? I think Joyce, the publicist, who was acutely aware of Ulysses as a product, would be only too delighted to see us all gathering in his name. I think he would like that. Gathering in his name in an almost religious manner, as some kind of secular saint who was to be venerated. I think he would be laughing all the way to the bank and um, enjoying all of that. Joyce, the writer, I think, on the other hand, would perhaps hate every minute of it and fear that he was being turned into some kind of literary leprechaun that people were celebrating without reading. Um, so I think there's a balance there. Joyce, I think, would like us to still read his works because they challenge us today. And I think we have to reinstate that challenge. And I think that's, that's what critics do. That's why we're still here talking about Joyce today. Of course, he's also hugely entertaining and nobody would ever take that away. And Bloomsday is great fun in Dublin or, or, or in, in Calcutta or wherever you decide to celebrate it. I say Calcutta because there was the first Bloomsday in Jadvapur University this summer. Joyce has traveled truly around the globe. So we need to keep those things in mind. Um, so I think he would, as I say, be both glad and perhaps worried about it. I think you'd be glad we're still focusing on the difficulty of the text. And I was glad to say many, hear many people talking about the difficulty and not, you know, saying it's all an easy, an easy read. Um, I really liked that idea about 
kind of instead of just getting the meaning, just living in the text. I think it was Alice was talking about that. Thought that was a lovely, a lovely idea. Um, and sometimes just having to accept that we don't necessarily get all the meaning. And I think, you know, what was accessible 100 years ago to a Joyce reader um, today, so much of it is, is so distant to us. I mean, I teach Joyce in, in I teach Ulysses in Italy, where I often find myself having to explain to Italians what the mass is. Um, I mean, that's now what's difficult. One of the many elements of what's difficult, whereas, you know, uh, 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago, that was so much part of what the reader could bring to the text. And today that's so far away from them. But the focus on the word, I think, is also important um, that we that we heard from various speakers uh, today. Um, the idea that Joyce's texts don't just yield any kind of immediate meaning. Um, and I was thinking about Pori Collum, the Irish poet and critic and the, one of the great champions of Joyce in in the United States and indeed in Ireland. Um, and he writes somewhere about against, if you like, words which expire upon use. And words that expire upon use just seems to me to sum up the whole Twitter age um, that, that we're living in. Um, and, in. And require, he says, no revisitation. He calls these destitute words as against value-making words, uh, which are, he says, real words must, which must fly like pigeons in flight and make a shadow on the grass. That's how they work, slowly making a shadow on the grass. And he compares that to the immediate words, which are like corn popping. And he's no interest in the corn popping words. Joyce, he says, is, in, is interested in those words, which make their meaning slowly and over time. Um, now, what has also emerged listening today is, is that there, Joyce is still deeply relevant and can be made deeply relevant to our times. And that's largely because of the great work that's done by by critics, many of whom are in this room, who are making Joyce relevant to a new generation. And as I listened to some of the younger scholars in the room, it was it was extraordinary to see Joyce's relevance changing for a new for a new generation, a different agenda, perhaps to the one that I might have had 30 years ago or 40 years ago when I started to try and read Joyce. The whole idea of reading Joyce in terms of the the uh, colonialism, the decolonial decolonial, why can't I say that word? Decoloniality um, that uh, Shinjini was talking about and her way of reading Joyce in terms of race, class, gender, nationality and identity, which is different to how we were reading them in those terms even 10 years ago. So it's a constant, it's constantly in flux what Ulysses might mean. Now, the worrying thing is I haven't got to my slides yet and I've already been talking for, for a while. Um, this can go on as long or as little. This is a whistle stop tour, really, of 100 years of Ulysses in Ireland. When Ulysses was finally published in book form in 1922, Joyce's name was already very much maligned in Ireland, where he enjoyed what Father George O'Neill, one of his former Jesuit teachers at, of English at Clongoswood College, where he, of course, had been educated, referred to as his regrettable celebrity. Um, Early Irish Joyce criticism was generally adverse, but reasonably satisfied that Joyce's books, although afflicted with a shameful mania, were, as the Catholic Irish Monthly put it, but little read by sane folk. And hence, there was never any real need to ban our, our, uh, Ulysses in Ireland. It was never banned in the country, although many think it was, because nobody... Firstly, most people couldn't afford the early editions, and secondly, they wouldn't want it anyway. So there really was no great problem. Joyce himself would complain, the copies of Ulysses which I presented to certain of my fellow countrymen and countrywomen were either unacknowledged or locked up or given away or lent or stolen or sold, and it seems in all cases unread. Now, this is typically melodramatic and rather unfair and actually not true. Um, most of the copies that were bought of those early first editions were prized. They cost a lot of money. And the ones that Joyce had um, sent around um, were, were at least partially read. I mean, they weren't read from beginning to end. But then a lot of people in here have been admitting that it's been a struggle to read Joyce from beginning to end, despite all the help that we have today. Yeats's copy, for example, in the National Library, many of the, of the pages are not cut. So he, he skimmed through it, but preferred to put himself to sleep reading a Trollope novel than Ulysses. 
He did, actually. Um, so when Ulysses came out, 1922, Joyce might well have thought this could be the start of something big, to quote uh, himself and Tom Matthews from the, um, I think this was in In Dublin magazine uh, about 20 years ago. Um, but he was left, here's another of these early uh, cartoons, wondering, is there one who understands me? Because in Ireland, he was certainly struggling to find one who understood him. This was Joyce's fate in the early years in Ireland. Uh, the early reviews, as I say, were negative. This is Charles Duff, who wrote a book called Joyce, the Plain Reader, and who was actually a supporter of Joyce's. But he, still supporting him, would talk about his considered blasphemies, apt to horrify any plain reader who has at least respect for Latin Christianity. The good, the good Roman Catholic who reads him requires disinfection afterwards. If, the Joyce, if Joyce's darts are not to leave septic, lacerations. This explains the rough manner in which Joyce's works are handled by some critics who are conscientious Roman Catholics. It also explains why they are regarded as abominations by the Irish Free State Government. I find it interesting the way he puts on a hierarchy first the Catholic Church and then the Irish Free State in some ways as, a, as an emanation of that same Catholic um, uh, governing kind of mindset, if you like, Charles Duff. Um, but equally, on the other side of the religious divide, James Douglas and the Sunday Express, which was a unionist newspaper, would write the most of Ulysses is the most infamously obscene book in ancient or modern literature, no less. The obscenity of Rabelais is innocent compared with its leprous and scarborous horrors. All the secret sewers of vice are canalized in its flood of unimaginable thoughts and images and pornographic words. And its unclean lunacies larded with appalling and revolting blasphemies and so on and so forth. I quote these because they are very representative um, and we could spend hours and hours reading more to give you the, uh, the sense of how the sane folk of Ireland were never going to get near this text. And there is evidence of um, priests visiting Irish houses. I have heard this from various people who would see a Joyce text in the, on the bookshelf and just remove it and um, probably throw it in the fire in his own house, I suppose. Um, Shane Leslie, who, of course, was a convert to Catholicism, um, a writer himself. Um, I, this is a letter I found in the Irish College in Rome, which hadn't been uh, published. It's published now. Um, writing to the, um, the Monsignor, who was the, the Rettore of the Irish College in Rome. Uh, he says, the, the other is the appalling product of James Joyce of Clongo's, a terribly blasphemous, sexually perverted account of himself and friends during 24 hours in Dublin. It takes, he takes 720 pages to describe them and calls the whole, the whole Ulysses. I have come to the conclusion the man is diabolically possessed. But alas, what a waste of Irish humour and insight and fierce power of... Thank you, writing. I can see myself where writing is. The sad thing is that the French press and some English intellectuals have hailed Ulysses as Ireland's return into European literature. Having Irish letters deeply at heart, I have never felt more grieved to see so splendid and horrible a book to which no scribe could add the cum gloria de August Honora Neheran. And this is Shane Leslie. And this immediately points to a problem. Joyce's success abroad did not necessarily pave the way for his success at home. Quite the opposite. It, 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 it riled a lot of Irish critics um, who felt that the, particularly the French, were overestimating Ulysses and were um, failing to see what damage it did to, to Ireland itself because it was seen as an untrue depiction of what Irish society was supposed to be like. Um, at the same time, someone like Leslie could describe Ulysses as both as both splendid and horrible in the same breath. So he could see the power of the writing, um, but, but also be horrified um, by it. And precisely because of the power of the writing, he was so horrified. There were, however, and it's important to say, a number of very positive reviews written immediately after the publication of Ulysses um, by a number of people. I, I, I name most of them here by... Um, I don't need to go through the list. P.S. O'Hegarty, Leventhal, Emer O'Duffy, Marion Porrick Collum, John Eglinton and Ernest Boyd. And they went to enormous uh, lengths to publish their reviews of Ulysses. This is Porrick and Mary Collum 
who of course spent who Colum initially had been kind of a rival of Joyce's in Dublin. He was a he was a poet and a playwright uh, who fell out with Yeats and moved to the United States and um, did a lot of work here trying on behalf of the whole revolutionary movement in Ireland um, in in the states. Um, but also was a tireless promoter of Joyce's work, as was Molly Collum or Mary Collum, one of our best critics, really, um, in those early years of the Irish state, um, and a figure who is re-emerging at the moment in, in work being done by various critics, including uh, Margaret Kelleher. Um, Con Leventhal, who, of course, had taken back his job at, 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 at um, Trinity, wrote a very useful guide to, to, to Ulysses, a long article, um, and concluded that no discerning mind can deny genius to Mr. Joyce. His work will persist in spite of efforts to suppress it. This was 1922. But he did say Ulysses is essentially a book for the male. It is impossible for a woman to stomach the egregious grossness. So um, it was clearly to be left. Now, Ernest Boyd is another very interesting character who um, was part of the Irish literary revival also as a critic, but also moved to the States and worked in New York, um, wrote um, for prominent newspapers in New York. Um, and it was he who took up arms, if you like, against Valerie Larbeau, who had described Joyce um, um, in, as being a continental writer, as being a European writer, and Boyd wanted to pull him back into the Irish stream. Larbeau saw Joyce as the beginning of something new in Ireland, whereas Boyd saw him as the culmination of maybe what Yeats had started. So they were, I think Joyce was pulling both their, he was pulling both their strings. And uh, this debate went on for at least 10 years. And I think Joyce probably got a kick out of watching them on the one hand, describe him as an Irish writer, on the other, as a European writer. Um, he stresses Joyce as a profoundly Irish genius in the possession of a prematurely cosmopolitan reputation. So it's essentially the same point as we made earlier. Uh, the unkind fate which has always overtaken writers isolated from the conditions from which they are apart and presented to the world without any perspective. The fact is, no Irish writer is more Irish than Joyce. None shows more unmistakably the imprint of his race and traditions. Well, yes, of course, he's an extremely Irish writer, um, but he's also a lot more. But this was Boyd's um, ar argument, and he made it repeatedly in literally, I'd say, a dozen articles. He kept making the same point over and over again. P.S. O'Hegarty, who had taken part in the 1916 Rising and um, worked in the Irish Post Office, um, wrote a review in, in which he, in, the, in, a, in a newspaper called The Separatists, so there's no doubting where its political um, allegiance was. Um, he, just, he says Mr. Joyce has taken the English language and has used it as it was never before used and used it triumphantly. And I find it interesting that he's writing this in, in 1922, right in the middle of the Civil War. And all this use, uh, it's almost um, the language of war, military, that he's using here in describing it in this, in this newspaper. He has masked it and maneuvered it as one masses men at army maneuvers and does it successfully. He has taken the old staid old decorous staid mold of English prose, broken it up completely and remolded it into a thing which is continental rather than English. So I think we see in these early reviews um, the, 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 the germ, the seed of criticism that would really flourish from the 1980s on when we began to get the post-colonial Joyce and the, the Irish Joyce. Um, what I'm saying is that these early Irish critics, I think, saw Joyce's revenge on the English language, which of course became a theme, is still a theme today. I'm, I'm quoting on uh, Andrew Gibson, the title of Andrew Gibson's book about uh, his take on, on Ulysses. Uh, Joyce, the revenge of the Irishman, no, who had said, of course, that writing in, in the English language was the most ingenious torture ever invented. Um, that's, that's what he said as, 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 a, as a writer. Um, and I think Joyce said that after years living in the continent where he had learned so continental languages and the kind of freedom in terms of syntax and word order that was possible in a language that wasn't English, which insists on its subject verb object in a very military kind of a kind of a manner. So Joyce, of course, would push the English language to the limit. 
um, and push readers to the limit, and particularly early readers who tried to come to terms with this attention to language. He has put into Ulysses not a story merely, but an epoch. And this, this word, an epoch, or an epic, which is another one that's often used in early Irish criticism. The idea of, of Ulysses as the, the epic of the Irish nation, if you like. Um, and I think that's an important thing to keep in mind as well. 1922, the year in which the Irish, in which Ireland is founded, and um, we kind of get an alternative Ireland presented in, in Ulysses and that other text. It's as if he's giving voice to the body of Ireland itself. The comedy and the tragedy of many lives and of the people of his own generation. I make the assertion after reading this that Joyce loves Ireland, especially Dublin, not in any wrap the green flag sense, but Ireland is all through him and in him and of him, which almost sounds like a prayer through him, with him, in him, um, at, the end, in the end of the, uh, at the end of the Mass. So this kind of language of Catholicism and of nationalism that's being used here, the idea of patriotism, an alternative kind of patriotism. And this reading of Joyce during the Civil War, I think, is extremely unusual and brave, really, on the part of, of O'Hegarty. Emer O'Duffy, who, like Joyce, went to Belvedere College um, and was disenchanted following um, the, the 1916 Rising with what it had failed to achieve, if you like, um, he described Ulysses as the epic of modern Ireland and asks what love of country means at a time when the country was tearing itself apart in civil war. True patriotism in Ireland, he says, was not the province of the gunman or the political theorist, but of the common man, the tram conductor, the milkman and the fireman who carry on their work while the bullets are flying round them, are better patriots than the men who are firing the rifles and braver men too when everything is considered. So again, I think this was quite an unusual take, quite a brave take in the Ireland of the time. Again, it was a plea for, if you like, what Ulysses is so full of, the, the dignity of the quotidian of daily life um, over the, um, the, the kind of war that was going on at the time, which was threatening to sweep away um, the quotidian life that people were uh, also attempting to live. Joyce's is a love of country that excels that of the common man and receives even less recognition. Joyce's is his Beatrice, whom he loves without hope and without return, though he is a great artist, perhaps the greatest artist in prose now living. So here he's openly comparing Joyce to Dante and what Dante did for, for Italy. Ultimately, Joyce perhaps is going to do for Ireland. So again, seeing Joyce in a hugely... Um, positive terms. It is time, he concludes, for Ireland to realise that in James Joyce she has produced a great artist, perhaps the greatest artist living, as I say, and that in Ulysses Joyce has produced a very great work. This is a review again from 1922 in the Irish uh, Review. So I suppose the received wisdom is that Ulysses was never read, never got positive reviews, and I think it's important to point to these, even though there, are, there aren't that many. However, they are very significant. And um, another very positive take on Ulysses at this time was Mary Collum, um, the, 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 um, the Confessions of James Joyce is how she describes. This came out in, in July, so very shortly after the publication of the book itself. Um, she talks about how Joyce believes in the autobiographical in art. Ulysses is one of the most racial, one of the most Catholic books ever written. And this, of course, is another theme that pervades Irish criticism, Joyce's relationship with Catholicism and the insistence that even if he wasn't a believer, his book is profoundly um, coloured and shaped by um, his absorption in and his, his learning in Catholicism. Indeed, Joyce would have been able to run rings around most of his even clerical critics uh, in terms of his knowledge of Catholicism and, the philo and Catholic philosophy. She talks about the importance of Catholicism and, a point, and about how difficult it would be to read Ulysses if he didn't know Dublin and certain conspicuous Dubliners. And this, again, is a theme in Irish criticism of Joyce, that you had to know Dublin in order to read Ulysses. And somebody who wasn't brought up in that background could never have any hope of getting Ulysses. So this was a very exclusive kind of way of imagining Joyce, and I, I, I would like to say a very unhelpful way of getting to know Joyce, because obviously 
his book, although very particularly rooted, particularly rooted in Dublin, speaks to a lot more than that. She also describes it as an encyclopedia, as an epic of Dublin. He describes um, Joyce um, as giving unique expression to the effects of English occupation and uh, the effects of this absorption in Roman Catholicism. Um, she also says that Ulysses, I'm just going to skip on here because I don't want to go on for too long, that from half this halfway chapter to the end, um, and the halfway chapter she takes exception to is basically um, Circe. She loses interest there. She feels lost from there on. Um, and she also takes exception to Oxen of the Sun, which she thinks is too clever by half. And she wouldn't be alone in thinking that, I suspect. Um, to the last chapter where she says the revelation of the mind of Marion Bloom in the last section would doubtless interest the laboratory. But to normal people, it would seem an exhibition of the mind of a female gorilla who has been corrupted by contact with humans. She is not impressed with Molly Bloom. Um, but this comes after a very lengthy, this is a long review and very positive take on the novel. And she would come back again to, to Ulysses many times, which she would describe as a satire in all literature, a page in his country's history um, and an impression on his own life. As to the idea of obscenity, she says, why attempt to absolve him? It is obscene, bawdy, corrupt, but it is doubtful that obscenity in literature ever really corrupted anybody. So she decides that's not such a big problem. So the 20s were, had these kind of reviews, these kind of brave reviews, which stuck their neck out to defend Joyce, while the majority feeling, well, the majority reaction was simply to ignore him. Um, people had more to worry about. Uh, 1932 saw the, the uh, huge Eucharistic Congress take place in Dublin, where I think half a million people gathered um, for that religious outpouring of faith. Um, and the, the state was was forming itself and becoming much narrower, if that was possible, in its in its views of anything that was different and fell outside of that kind of Catholic mindset. Censorship was very much a reality. Um, and Joyce's name was increasingly not spoken very loudly. Now, Ernest Blythe, who was um, in the government as vice president of the executive council, spoke at the Booksellers Congress in Dublin in 1930. And he acknowledged Joyce's importance. He said, this country has given birth to many eminent writers, some of whom, unfortunately, have shaken the dust of the city off their feet. In other words, they've left. But I believe that, if, that all of them have a great deal of affection for Dublin. James Joyce has left Dublin. I do not know whether he will come back or not. But anyone who reads his books will see that he is showing a great deal of interest in his native city, which is a lovely way of saying absolutely nothing of course, and not taking a position. But Blythe was condemned for these words, which were interpreted as being in praise of Joyce. The Waterford News and Star, for example, uh, took issue with this exhibition of tenderness for that past master in pornography. Ernest Blythe clearly would have been better um, advised to say nothing at all. In 1936, T.S. Eliot was invited to UCD, to University College Dublin, by Roland Book Savage, Burke Savage, who was a young Jesuit scholastic and head of the Literary Society um, in UCD at the time. It's a kind of an extraordinary visit because he essentially invited T.S. Eliot to respond to his own lecture on Irish literature. And the newspaper um, reports on this are, are quite amazing because Burke Savage talks about the irrelevance of all of Anglo-Irish literature, um, that Joyce could have been Ireland's writer if he hadn't been so blasphemous, but sadly he messed it up. Um, and um, T.S. Eliot re remembered this event. He says, I did speak of Joyce, and of course in his praise. So far as I can remember, the great part of the audience remained in silence. But there was a considerable demonstration of applause from a group of young people at the back of the room who were evidently well pleased that the name of Joyce should be mentioned and his work openly preferred on such an occasion. Now, I think among these young people was Flann O'Brien, Donna McDonough, and several other of what would become Joyce's key supporters in Ireland in mid-century in the 1950s, who had gone and had listened to um, 
to 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 Elliot defending, if you like, Joyce, the novelist James Hanley, um, who was of Irish family but lived in in Britain. Um, his his early novels were heavily influenced by Joyce. He wrote to Elliot to say that he had listened on the wireless. Need I say how thrilled I was when you spoke of James Joyce, as you did, and the the the, the entire event was broadcast on on at Lone, which was the Irish national broadcaster at the time, especially after Father Savage's speech. Though I am myself Irish, having a Cork mother and Dublin father, I would not care to live in that country ever again. And though I owe something to Catholicism for stimulating my imagination. I am all against the clerical conception of literary ethics. It was so splendid to hear Joyce championed in his own country and by one not Irish. And clearly it was very unusual in the 19, late 1930s to hear Joyce being championed in this way. I, during this lecture, Eliot described Joyce as the most Irish and in a sense, the most Catholic writer in English of his generation, um, which, which I think is, has some truth in it. Now we're approaching Joyce's death and Joyce had predicted that when I am dead, they will raise a monument to me. He had written in a letter. Well, he would have to wait a while before a monument would actually be raised uh, to him um, in Dublin. I think it would be 1982. When he died, the Irish Rosary writes, we never found occasion to write about James Joyce when he was alive. And we feel no inclination to write about him now that he is dead. And they proceeded to write several pages about him. He was condemned for his bartering of an intellectual pearl of great price for the husks of intellectual sin. His having fouled the nest, which was his native city, through his blasphemy and obscenity, and his failure to be re reconciled to Christ on his deathbed. So they weren't pleased. His Jesuit educators, and yes, we are in a Jesuit college, but um, the Belvederian, which was the annual of his, of his college, always published an obituary of, of famous graduates, we, we call them that, or past pupils who, who passed on. Um, they didn't write a thing about Joyce. His younger brother, Charles, who was a prominent member of the Legion of Mary, did get an obituary, and Joyce was mentioned in the obituary as having been a brother of Charles. Uh, that was the only mention that he got um, in that particular publication. Um, among Irish writers, uh, and maybe Frank O'Connor speaks for many. He and the bell wrote in James Joyce's postmortem. He begins it by saying, I think I almost said, thank God, when Joyce died. This is how he opens his appreciation of Joyce. And you might say, what was his problem? O'Connor, like many of the writers of his generation, felt, I think, somewhat suffocated by Joyce. Joyce had covered everything and he felt very little space. They also felt increasingly irritated by Finnegan's Wake, which was, was seen as being impenetrable, which was being published in, had been published throughout the 30s in short extracts, which cost extravagant amounts of money, and which they felt was unreadable. Um, and I think we shouldn't underestimate in the 30s the kind of a retrospective effect of Finnegan's Wake on the reception of the earlier works. Everything was read through this cloud that was Finnegan's Wake, and which was, let's be honest, not the simplest uh, of works to interpret um, then or even now, but particularly then. So um, O'Connor spoke for many when he would begin in this way. On the other hand, a writer like Elizabeth Bowen, herself something of an outsider, would write some beautiful tributes to Joyce, and I think understood and had a kind of an empathy for the difficulties that Joyce lived through his exile and his attempting to, to write throughout his life about Ireland. Michal MacLeamore, the great man of theatre in Dublin, openly mourned Joyce's passing and said, Ireland has lost another great son, perhaps the most significant and exciting figure now writing in English. Um, Ireland, um, and, and he, he again writes about Joyce's effect of um, bringing Irish literature back into Europe, which is, of course, what Valérie Lebeau had said, Joyce was a genius. It would be well that his own people should salute him before they are forced to their feet by the rest of Europe. But of course, that kind of forcing was never going to work. But MacLeamore, this was MacLeamore's view on Joyce's death. Uh, Irish officialdom really didn't know how to react to Joyce's death. Frank Cremens, an Irish diplomat working in Bern at the embassy, 
told the Department of Foreign Affairs in Dublin, where Eamon de Valera was minister, and he was also Taoiseach, of Joyce's passing. The department secretary, Joe Walsh, responded, please wire details about Joyce's death. If possible, find out if he died a Catholic. Express sympathy with Mrs. Joyce and explain inability to attend funeral. So there was no official Irish presence at his funeral. It should be said that Joyce had excellent relations with several Irish diplomats in Europe um, in the previous 10 years who had, I think, supported him and who read his works and were proud to own his works. The government was somewhat more um, conservative than many of the uh, ambassadors that were working in Europe already at this. They weren't yet ambassadors, but the, the diplomats who were working um, at this time um, in various uh, European cities like, like Bern. Of course, this left the way open for the British to send its representative to Joyce's funeral where Lord, D Lord Derwent, who made a beautiful speech, actually, at the funeral. Um, but, of course, it was an occasion missed um, for, for Ireland, in the sense, to claim Joyce, just as, as Dan was saying earlier today, that De Valera had passed up on the opportunity to meet Joyce um, in the 30s. They, they passed up on an opportunity here. And as late as 1966, I think it was, um, the Irish ambassador in, in Zurich wrote home and said, there's a production coming up of Hugh Leonard's play, uh, Stephen D, based on, um, based obviously on the portrait of the artist as a young man. Um, we've been approached, and maybe what what should we do? Can we can we attend? Uh, and again, from Dublin, the reaction was very negative, and the ambassador kept insisting and said, "Well, if we don't go, you know who will go? The British Council and the British will be there." At which point. Um, Irish officialdom in the 60s um, gave the ambassador permission to take part in this event. They were also worried when um, in Zurich, Fritz N was getting a statue put up of Joyce. We've been approached by her Zen, it said, and it's a good idea, but we're worried he might ask for money. Um, <laughs> and uh, this didn't appeal either. Um, but again, um, yeah, so some of these letters back are, are, very, are very interesting. Very, how am I doing for time, Bert? I've buckets of time. Yeah, because we're only in 1940 and uh, <laughs> I don't want to wear people out too much. Okay, so the middle decades, there was no academic interest in Joyce in Ireland. Uh, he had several literary supporters like Flann O'Brien, who were both worshipped Joyce and felt extremely threatened by Joyce. So they had this ambivalent attitude towards him. Um, Flann O'Brien would regularly write as Miles um, McGopoline in the Irish Times about Joyce, often very funny, often taking uh, pot shots at foreign critics of Joyce who didn't get it right. If I hear the word Joyce again, I will surely froth at the gob was one of his quotes, one of many quotes. Um, this is a picture of Anthony Cronin and um, Patrick Kavanagh in, I think, um, at a Joyce event um, in the 50s. So 1954 would see the 50th um, anniversary of 1904. Um, and that was celebrated um, with the first Bloomsday in Dublin, famously with Flann O'Brien and Patrick Kavanagh and Anthony Cronin on what was a drunken pub crawl, really, through Dublin. But in a way, they were sticking their necks out by openly celebrating Dub Joyce in those years in the country. Um, the Irish Times had an editorial in which it took no position whatsoever. It said, Joyce may be the most famous writer in the world in 50 years' time, or we may have forgotten him. We'd have to wait and see. It clearly wasn't clear which way it was going to go. So we jump now to 1962, the, the founding of the Joyce Tower Society. Um, the Joyce Tower out in Sandy Cove, where, of course, the opening chapter of Ulysses takes place, um, turned out to be a very important and significant event. Um, Michael Scott, the architect, and a group of private donors, including John Houston, um, basically funded this. And there was an official opening. And Sylvia Beach came along and some of Joyce's sisters, Gogarty, Maria Jolas, and the Minister for Justice, Charlie Hawhey, the British ambassador. And now in the 60s, it was becoming um, OK. It was becoming a thing to do to begin to celebrate Joyce. And the tower became a kind of a focal point for these kinds of celebrations. However, um, the tower was never 
it was it was relying on private funding. It was running a shoestring. There was very little in it to actually go and visit, and it just opened for a couple of months each summer. Um, and by 1968, the tower had closed down again. This is an article from the uh, Sunday Independent in June of 68. All was barred, all was shuttered in the tower in Sandy Cove. And nobody, not one human, sweltering in the bright, warm evening sun gave a damn. For them, James Joyce was dead and buried, and the anniversary of Bloomsday, just a few hours away, meant nothing. The same couldn't care less attitude was apparent in Davy Burns. Willie O'Farrell of Sally Noggin summed it up, I'm not interested. There was some nice choice language in the book, but the film, from what I've heard, is better. The film came out, of course, in 1967, and that too um, was banned in Ireland, unlike the book. Um, so what I'm trying to say, what was happening in the 60s was a kind of a, an on-off relationship with Ulysses um, and with Joyce himself. Um, this was the decade of demolition Ireland. This is an advertisement from one of the Irish newspapers. All Georgian houses must go. Who are we to make such sweeping statements? We are very happy to conduct our business from a Georgian house. However, all buildings eventually grow old and become a danger to life and limb. For expert demolition work, consult us, Demolition Ireland, 22 Lower Bagot Street. And the, a victim of Demolition Ireland would be this building that you see here, which is, of course, 7 Eccles Street, um, which was uh, torn down. This is a, a picture of it um, with Anthony Burgess inside shortly before it was pulled down um, um, in 1967, just before the first International James Joyce Symposium. The great tragedy, one of the great tragedies, I think, of, of Joyce's Dublin is that we lost 7 Eccles Street, the most important address, arguably, in, in Irish and one of the most important addresses in world literature. Um, Burgess was there to make a documentary, um, and this, was, this picture was taken of him um, in what remained before it was torn down of 7 Eccles Street. It certainly wasn't in good condition. Um, so all that would remain, of course, famously, was the door, which is today in the Joyce Centre in North Great George Street. It spent a time in the, in the, Bailey, the, Bailey, in the Bailey's pub in Dublin. So 67 sees uh, Eccles Street being torn down and also sees the beginning of, the, in a way, the arrival of academic Joyce to Ireland with the 67 Symposium. A uh, very small event, which was mostly mocked in the press. The, the symposers, as they call them, um, uh, were, were being slagged off all the time. And it, it, did, it did produce a book um, edited by um, Morris Harmon, who used to teach in UCD, um, which was called, rather quaintly, The Celtic Master. And it was five essays, all by Irish critics, whereas the entire foreign brigade, which were hugely dominant at the event, didn't appear at all. Um, maybe one of the first significant books was Tom Garvin's Disunited Kingdom. And I'm now into the 70s. We're getting there. Uh, came out in 1977. And he was a great supporter of Joyce. But in a way, he embodied, um, I think, this strangely ambivalent attitude so many Irish critics of the time had for Joyce. They recognized his importance, but they were deeply Catholic and deeply disturbed by what they felt was his anti-Catholicism. Um, uh, Anthony Cronin wrote a review of this book, in which he says, it seems odd that the most remarkable thing about this first book on Joyce should be the, to all appearances, lifelong hostility it exhibits towards its subject. And this is true. And I, I talked to Fritz Zen, the great critic um, from Zurich about Garvin, and he, he absolutely confirms that Garvin, one of Joyce's great proponents in Ireland, also hated the man. Um, and there's this remarkable um, contradiction. Um, Garvin is at positive pains to show that Joyce was not only a misguided writer who merely indulged his own association mania, but in some ways a very unpleasant one as well. 1982. Again, this date was identified this morning by Dan, I think, as the key date. I was still in school in 1982. I was in Belvedere. And that was when I met Joyce for the first time. And he was not on the curriculum at school at that point. He still really isn't on the curriculum in school in Ireland. But we had a young Jesuit, if such a thing exists, a young Jesuit, a young Jesuit called Bruce Bradley, who had us read a portrait of the artist in, uh, in religion class, 
we read A Portrait of the Artist and we read Thomas Merton's Seven Story Mountain. And we discussed the kind of spiritual issues, the same ground being covered by both writers in some way. And this was a way to get Joyce in and to get us thinking about him. I would say, I know, in fact, I know that the older Jesuits hugely disapproved of this course, which was seen as being dangerous. Um, and it was interesting, uh, Bradley that year published his book, James Joyce's School Days, which I think was a huge made it made quite an impression in terms of reclaiming Joyce for the Jesuits and also making him somehow legitimate to talk about him. Um, and it didn't do Bradley any harm. He, he went on to become headmaster of the school and indeed of Clongos afterwards. So that was a sign of how things were beginning to change. 1982 began with a big row in Dublin Corporation as to how they were going to celebrate Joyce. It was a quick time of great economic difficulty and there was a lot of opposition that too much money shouldn't be thrown at him. But it, it was seen that Trieste, for example, was going to have a huge Joyce Festa. And um, if Trieste was going to do it, then maybe we risked Dublin's thunder would be stolen by a European, the European cities that Joyce was associated with. So these are just two pictures taken from 1982, in which we now see the Alexis Fitzgerald, the Lord Mayor of Dublin of the time with Fritz N. Um, uh, and here we see David Norris, who would be, of course, one of the, the key players in making Joyce popular in Ireland, wearing his hat. And on the right-hand side, Gus Martin from UCD, who, of course, would found the, the Joyce Summer School back in 1987, I think it was. And that, that would play a big role in, in introducing people into Joyce studies. They were naming their, they were, that was the inauguration of the James Joyce Bridge. So the 80s statues begin to appear. Joyce begins to become respectable. It's easy now to buy Ulysses in Dublin, whereas up to the 60s, it was hard to buy a copy of the book. If you bought it in 1962, um, there was only one or two bookshops where you could get it, and it would be carefully covered in a brown paper bag so nobody could see what you were carrying out of the bookshop. Um, that, those days were long gone at this point. Um, one of the many proposals to put in the, in the 80s was to put Bloom on top of a restored version of Nelson's Pillar. And we talked about Nelson's Pillar earlier today. Uh, would presumably to have become Bloom's Pillar. And Declan Kybert was among those to object to this modish proposal and said that Bloom would be mortally embarrassed by the publicity. As to Joyce, such a self-iconoclast would not wish to be embalmed or mummified in a statue. And I just stuck this, this in today because um, I think we were talking about how we commemorate Joyce. And if you commemorate him and turn him into something that's part of official culture, do you actually deprive him of his, his cutting edge power. Um, Joyce himself was all too aware that people are, when people are commemorated on statues, it often happens when they've lost their power to threaten or indeed to disturb. Um, this is one of the many statues of Joyce in Dublin. The Dublin City Business Association, in, again in the late 80s, was arguing in favor of street art um, in public places, not political art, not art, not. Put not politicians, not patriots, but um, the statues of James Joyce, the ladies with the shopping bags, the girl swinging from a lamppost, and Molly Malone. So these are all thrown in together. All of these statues um, were a significant departure away from revolutionary political and religious images to reflect a more people-friendly, peaceful democracy. This is the argument put forward by this political party in favor of a statue for James Joyce, that he would be, if we put him up, he'd be harmless, and um, he, it would be uncontroversial. So this is Mary Fitzgibbon's statue, which of course became known as the prick with the stick in Dublin. Excuse my vulgarity, but um, I suppose this also gives an idea of um, the Irish capacity to take down someone like Joyce and put him in his place. Um, famously, Ken Monaghan, Joyce's nephew, was at the unveiling of this statue and it was 1990 when Ireland played in Italia 90 in the football. And our football manager was Jack Charlton at the time. And Ken recalled being pushed out of the way by some man who thought it was a statue of Jack Charlton and was very annoyed when he realized that it was only James fucking Joyce. Um, and this was the, the quote that was that was used. Um, so there was also there were many other statues, lots more went on in the 1980s, in the 1990s, and then the state really made some huge investments around, around 2000 and 2004, 2006, 
when it brought back, um, brought back, they were never there in the first place, when it brought important Joyce and Finnegan's Wake manuscripts to the National Library, um, an investment of some £16 million. Pounds, um, and in a sense, um, created one of the more, more important Joyce archives in the world. And it was it, these these the return the, the these manuscripts were brought to Ireland as though they were being in some way returned to Ireland, and it always involved a minister. And ironically, the minister was Sheila de Valera for one of these consignments. She accompanied the manuscripts over and was met by the Taoiseach, and it was all extremely formal, um, and created, if you like, the context for 1904 for 2004, the centenary of of Ulysses. We have lots of Ulysses centenaries, as you can see, but this was the centenary of 1904 when Ulysses is set. Um, and that was a huge, Bloomsday became Bloom's Summer, and it was a massive event. Um, and that's when the whole Bloomsday thing really began, I think, to, to grow and become a festival, kind of, um, which, which, which covered the city. I mean, there was a Bloomsday breakfast in 1904, O'Connell Street was closed, and I think 5,000 Bloomsday breakfasts were sold. Um, or served to to Joycians and and people began to wear the costumes that you still see them wearing today in Dublin and it has become a public festa um, and it's it's great fun I'm not criticizing it but um, at all um, and you 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 do I was there for Bloomsday this year and I went for lunch on my own just to get away from it all uh, to Neary's which is one of my favorite pubs in Dublin but six people came in and all in in Edwardian costume. And they were all retired and they all sat down and they talked about Joyce and they all admitted they'd never read a word of Ulysses, but they were having a great day out. And what harm? I mean, it's it's harmless fun. Um, so this is Bloomsday 100, which we've now reached. And uh, I think Joyce Joyce's place in Ireland um, is, if you like, for the moment anyway, it's secure. He's good for business. Irish academia has made huge steps, huge strides in actually becoming central to what we know about Joyce and how we read Joyce today. There are countless books now by Irish academics, not only limiting themselves, thank God, to Irish Joyce, to Irish history, but to talking about Joyce and other issues. So I think we've matured with Joyce and in our way to take him on. And I think that's something to be very positive about. Um, this is the other side of it. This is the kind of festival side of it. This is Arison Uchtaran, where our president lives and holds a Bloomsday party every summer. And again, we see people in costume, some famous actors and singers and performers there. Again, um, the, the president uses Bloomsday as a day to celebrate Irish culture, Irish writers, Irish theater. Um, and um, Joyce, in a way, is the, is the umbrella under which today's writers operate. And I think that's also in some way true. Um, if Joyce was seen by many as a somewhat stifling presence, in mid-century. I think today's writers are extremely at home writing in his wake rather than in his shadow. I don't think there is any anxiety left, you know, to go back to that terminology of the anxiety of influence. Um, somebody else used the term the ecstasy of influence. So the joy simply opens space in which writers can write. They don't have to consciously uh, imitate him or take him on, but he has made, Ulysses is such an open book Finnegan's Wake is such an open book that there is no topic that an Irish writer can't write about. Joyce has, you know, paved the way uh, for them to do so. I think, uh, particularly in Irish poetry, there's a huge debt to Joyce in some of the younger in some of the younger poets, um, but also in the novel itself. It's the question is which Joyce, of course, is it the Joyce of Dubliners and a portrait, to which I think an earlier generation responded. This generation, I think, responds much more openly. And uh, to to work like Finnegan's Wake. I mean, Emer McBride is an example of that. She she admits that very openly. She's no issues with that. And why not? It doesn't mean she doesn't set her own agenda. She rewrites, perhaps Joyce, or she writes her own version. Um, Paula Meehan, um, recently she's come out with uh, Joyce work, which which gives us her version, if you like, of of Dublin, which is clearly not his, and yet his is there in the background to all of that. At the same time we need to keep the balance right, that it's Joyce, there is an Irish Joyce, but that that Joyce exists within a much broader world. He is a writer that doesn't belong to us or to us alone. Uh, he's a writer that belongs to the world. Hence, 
I think it was good that the calls that we had um, in, in advance of this year to have him reinterred in Ireland, to take him away from Zurich and to bring him home. I'm glad that that didn't gain much traction because we don't need to bring him home. He's already everywhere. Um, and he's very happy in Zurich. And he's lying there with his wife. And it's a beautiful setting. And he's also a writer from Zurich, as he's a writer from Trieste, as he's a writer from Paris and, and from so, in, so many other places. He belongs to Europe. He belongs to the world, if you like. Um, and I think as we close this conference that we will continue to, to read him. And I just want to quote what he says as a young man about Ibsen. Um, he says of Ibsen when he's setting out, Ibsen has been the greatest influence on the present generation. In fact, you can say that he formed it to a great extent. His ideas have become part of our lives, even though we may not be aware of it. And if we just stick in Joyce there instead of, instead of Ibsen, we somehow get a sense of what Joyce might mean for us today. Um, he has formed us to a great extent. I do think Ulysses contains a kind of a prophetic idea of, of an Ireland that might be possible. Now, we're not there. We're a long way from being there. We shouldn't be complacent about it, but I think it does give a kind of a blueprint or a vision for an Ireland that we might have. Um, and I think even those who haven't read him have been read by him and have, have, have somehow read him through osmosis. Those people who were out having their lunch that day, in some way they had read Joyce um, and they were acknowledging his importance and they were having fun on his behalf. Joyce also said it's very difficult to believe that Ibsen will go stale. He will renew himself for every generation. His problems will be seen from a new angle as time goes on. And again, this was Joyce in conversation with Jacques Mercanton. Um, I think this is true of Joyce himself. Um, Joyce, I don't believe, will go stale. I think there's still plenty there um, that we can mine. And I think as new critics approach him in, in different ways, um, we'll see things we don't see today. So we're not finished with Joyce. We're not in any sense um, in danger of his work going stale. He will renew himself for, for every generation. And I suppose that's how I would, that's how I would see it. We've done a lot um, to, to make him at home in Ireland, but he still has a lot to say, not only about the Ireland of 1904 or 1922, but he's equally relevant if, if, we, if we want him to be to the Ireland that, that we live in or that we belong to uh, today. But we have to make sure we don't, as I said earlier, you know, deprive him by, by making him a commodity and by making him the kind of the secular St. Patrick that we deprive him of his rad the radicalness of his writing. I think that's important. And that's up to us critics, in a sense, to do. Um, and um, there's a lot of work to continue to be done in that, in that sense. So I think I'll close here because I can see the drinks have arrived and um, I don't know about you, but I'm thirsty. So thank you very much. Okay, so before um, we go and um, uh, approach this very enticing zone uh, of the room, uh, just on behalf of um, myself and the rest of the participants here, I would like to thank um, Colleen and Mary uh, for what has been an extraordinary uh, experience that I know must have taken an awful lot of work. So well done.